And here we go. We have lift off. Propulsion continues to be normal. Our CPA chamber pressure looks good. Following up. everybody welcome back to yet another nsf launch broadcast this one's a little bit special though we're coming to you live from the kennedy space center for the latest spacex slash nasa crew flight to the iss it's crew 7 which will be launching fingers crossed in just over four and a half hours time it's getting pretty late on the space coast it's pretty early here in europe and also uh, a nice uh, warm morning to everyone tuning in from asia uh, my name is Ryan Cater and I'll go around the horn quickly here. Joining me in the studio, uh, we have EJ. How you doing, EJ? I'm great, Ryan. How are you? Oh, <laughs> it's an early start, but I'm doing okay myself. And uh, uh, starting dust down uh, for some commentary, uh, Cape Side, uh, on site. We uh, have Lon Simon. How are you doing, Lon? Doing great. It's a beautiful night here. I am uh, being chilled by the turning basin looking at rockets. It can't be better than this. <laughs> Sounds awesome. As always, if you are just joining us for the first time and you are unaware, if you uh, have a question for us, uh, or we'll, we'll try and get to as many questions as we can over the next uh, four hours or so, uh, make sure when you put your question in chat, tag us at NASA Spaceflight. That way it can get filtered into our queue here, uh, and then we can queue them up and then try and answer them uh, to the best of our abilities. Uh, we've also had a, a an awesome amount of support uh, through memberships coming in over the last few hours in the lead up to this stream, which I'll get to in a moment. But EJ, first, I'm going to toss it to you. Um, could you give us a little overview of what we're expecting to see in just uh, under now, uh, four and a half hours time? Okay, so, I mean, you can see Falcon 9 sitting there on 39A. It's not fueled and there's nobody aboard right now. Basically, over the next four hours, you're we're going to see the... For, uh, well, actually, it's three astronauts and one cosmonaut basically get ready at the Neil A. Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building. And then from there, we'll watch them take some really nice Tesla Model Xs all the way down Kennedy Parkway, past the VAB, to Pad 39A. And then we'll watch, we'll see to watch them ingress and do everything that they need to do to get ready for a launch. I think the launch is, Ryan, I think we're at uh, 327 27 a.m. So we're a little ways out now, but. We're uh we're here for the duration, huh? That's the official uh, uh countdown clock that's on on the press site there from uh, from NASA themselves, uh, which currently shows just under four hours and twenty minutes to go. And this is back to I believe this is one of the bots uh, pointing currently at LC thirty nine A. And uh, according to the previous timeline, uh, the, the crew should already be handed over to SpaceX, so they should be safely in SpaceX's hands as they get ready for uh, the, uh, the the rollout, <laughs> as it were, to uh, 39A, all, all four people uh, uh, on track to fly on Crew 7. Mm. Uh, but as I said, I'm going to hit some of the support real quick. And uh, uh, firstly, we have uh, uh, WZ57 for coming a red team member. Thanks very much for that. Uh, we also have uh, uh, the the DBD02 coming a pad wrap member, uh, uh, Graham I believe becoming a launch director member, and uh, uh, David Lee becoming a launch director as well. That's one of the highest tiers that there is. That's greatly appreciated. That's a really uh, a really cool amount of support there, monthly support. Thank you very much for that. 
and uh, video tick. Uh, thanks for becoming a pad rat member. Nurks, thanks for becoming a pad rat member as well. And uh, just as we get underway here, John has gifted a red team membership as well. Thank you very much for that. I'm not sure if we've got any uh, official weather data yet, uh, but Lon, how's the weather looking like so far? Have we had any bad weather or is it generally looking clear? It is perfectly clear. Last night was very similar actually to tonight, so I don't think weather is going to be a problem, at least at ground level. We'll have to see how these upper winds are behaving, but it uh, looks pretty good so far and we're not hearing any, any chatter around here that anything is awry, so uh, I'm hoping we're in good shape. We certainly had a lot of chatter last night when uh, they help the clock and then, of course, scrub the mission. So hopefully tonight is a full go all the way. Don't say the S word, man. Yes. Oh, <laughs> come on, Lon. Oh, you're killing me over here. But uh, actually, Ryan, the conditions are 90, 95% favorable. That's per SpaceX official. So uh, it should be looking good. good. That, yep. Yeah, very good chance that the weather will be in pointing, in the, pointing mm -hmm. the correct way uh, come launch. Uh, I'm going to hit this question now uh, from uh, River Dave Kenny. Uh, EJ, I'll throw this one to you, asking, sure. will the booster perform an RTLS landing? Well, I had to check uh, before this, but I do believe this is the first NASA crewed mission to return to launch site or RTLS oh. a booster. The boosters, this booster, I think it's uh, 10181. It's his first flight is scheduled to do a return to launch site and land at LZ-1. This is the first time it's ever been done with a NASA mission with crew on it. We've had prior crew missions, the Axiom-2 mission, which was a commercial flight. They are TLS the booster. Uh, I think that was, was a little, little bit ago. And then before that, we've had uncrewed dragons with return to launch sites. But this is the first crewed NASA mission to land a booster back at a launch site. It's pretty cool. Hopefully you get some, Lon's going to see some good stuff out there tonight, hopefully. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I was out here for the uh, Falcon Heavy, the Aerosat, back in 2019. That was uh, one of the, the last missions I covered before Artemis. And it's amazing because not only do you get that sonic boom, but you get the reverberation of that sonic boom off the VAB with that, that metallic clanking sound. So it's, uh, it's quite an experience seeing those, those boosters come back down. The, uh, the world-famous VAB squeal is something to keep your ears prickled for. Um, that's certainly a very unique sound that you don't really hear anywhere else. Just the, all, all of the physics things lining up perfectly to make that happen. It's just very cool. And uh, really thanks cool. to Daniel uh, for gifting five Red Team memberships. As always, if you received one of them uh, picked randomly by YouTube, make sure, to, make sure to give Daniel a little thank you in chat. That's very, very kind of them. Uh, uh, there's a question here, which I'm going to grab quickly. And uh, similar, or uh, it is related to uh, to International Space Station cargo ops. Uh, uh, Outdoors man show asking when will Cygnus fly on a Falcon Nine, uh, and uh, uh, also when will uh, uh, I believe that's meant to be when will Starliner fly Crew One? Uh, Lon, do we know when uh, Cygnus will first be flying on a Falcon Nine? I think it's soon. You know, I don't have the immediate answer to that question. Um, I, I do know a little bit more about. Starliner just said they did push things back a bit, so there's no definitive date here. I have been asking around um, to see if we can get any more information about when we can expect a, another flight, but uh, nothing that I've been able to get yet. So uh, maybe some of the others on the call can help with that one. Yeah, the um, the NG20 mission is scheduled for December. So that's a, a Northrop Grumman Cygnus capsule launching on a Falcon 9. That's, uh, it should be, yeah, it should be December 2023. Yep, that's when it's currently scheduled. Uh, and EJ, uh, there's mm -hmm. a, a question here from uh, uh, Whitney and John Cook asking, what is the history of this Dragon capsule? Uh, could you give oh. us a quick uh, uh, a run through of, uh, I believe this is uh, uh, Endurance, I believe. Yes, sir. Yeah, this is uh, Dragon Endurance. This is its third flight. Uh, let me just get this up here. We'll tell you what other flights it went on. It flew Crew 3, Crew 5, and now Crew 7. All all odd numbers there. The first flight was in May of 2022. And then hopefully, you know, we see some good news tonight and Endurance gets back up in the air. And, well, lack thereof after that, but in the air for a second. In the air for a brief moment passing through into space. And I believe we just saw a helicopter go in the back of the shot there past the, mm -hmm. past the pad. Uh, yep. uh, I, I wonder whether that was... Um, 
one of the Ranger helicopters or NASA helicopters. Uh, unfortunately, one of the things about this uh, these night launches is that uh, you can't see. And uh, I've already seen many, many, many comments and questions in chat from people being like, oh, why does it have to be at three o'clock in the morning? Why does it have to be so early? Why is... Uh, 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 Where's this one? Uh, Jay Martin saying, can someone please explain to me why NASA always launches astronauts way past midnight and has stopped launching astronauts during the daytime? And uh, Lon, because of the way that the ISS orbits, they don't really have a choice when to launch, do they? You got you to gotta launch at the time in which you can catch up to the space station. And it's also an instantaneous launch window, so you don't have a lot of flexibility. You remember with Artemis, we had some things happen that pushed things back. We still had a very wide window in which we could launch in. Uh, these are very, very precise, and it's just the nature of where the space station is at this time of the month that uh, requires things to go this early. It, it is a half hour earlier than yesterday would have been, so that's a that's a bit of a bonus, right? So it uh, it does change, uh, but tonight is a late night for all of us here. Sounds good. Yeah, it's um the time upon upon launch will be it will be okay for us in Europe. It will probably also be. <laughs> Um, a more reasonable time of the afternoon in Asia, um, but it's certainly not the most reasonable time of day Cape side. <laughs> yeah, and there's that helicopter coming back again at the back of the shop. So it actually flew up. right right over my head a few minutes ago. I think it's one of the NASA security uh, um, helicopters. That's NASA 425. It's uh, they're just flying around the pad. That's one of NASA's uh, helicopters down at Kennedy Space Center. It's an it's an Airbus EC135. Little little tiny helicopter that they use to fly around and kind of survey the the, the rocket before operations commence. They used to be Hueys. Hueys, Hueys. I, I'm personally, I like the Hueys, you know, but they <laughs> NASA swapped them out in 2020 with the EC-135. It's not a bad helicopter. Uh, let's go for this question uh, here from uh, Kieran asking, do we know what the special license plates say just yet? Uh, I believe our good friend, uh, good photographer friend, uh, John Krause, uh, uh, snap. Uh, figured it out. Uh, yeah, Snap figured it out uh, or, or got a picture of it, got a snap of it rather, <laughs> and put it onto Twitter <laughs> earlier on. Uh, EJ, what, what, are, what, are the, uh, what are the license plates for this mission? I don't know what all of them say, but I'm pretty sure one says... Bye. As many, in many e's bye. on the end. Yep, with a lot of e's. As in, we're going to space. Get in. We're going to space tonight. Yeah. <laughs> and we should be seeing them roll by here in a little while. So I, I believe they're rolling around uh, midnight or so to head out to the pad. So we'll have um, from our vantage point here. We are right right along the road here, so we should be able to see them drive out. I don't know if we'll be able to see with my aging eyes. I, I'm sure I can't see that far, but um, so the younger. <laughs> Some of the younger folks here might be able to help me out um, to see what those plates say. Uh, Sorry, is joining us in a few minutes, so he'll be able to uh, see those plates as they uh, they come on by. But there's, you know, for, even though it, it's going to be a while before launch, there are, there are a lot of milestones, right? We have we have the crew uh, heading out to the to the pad. We're going to have the crew exiting the, uh, the the place where they're getting ready for the mission. Here, we're going to have fueling. There's there's a lot, a lot to see actually at one of these missions. So um, stay tuned. It's going to be fun, and we're all hanging out, right? Oh yeah. Uh, EJ, you just you touched on it a, a little while ago, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, there's another question in here, similar to what's the history of the capsule? Uh, what is the history of this booster? I believe it's a B1081. 1081. It's brand new. It's a brand new Falcon 9 Block 5. This is its first flight. I mean, if you guys look center, dead center on the screen there, it's it's clean. That's too clean. It almost looks wrong. So used to seeing <laughs> the study boosters. That looks weird to me, man. At least it's called landing gags. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah I, I can see it shiny, shining from here. <laughs> it's uh, probably one of the, the cleanest uh, entire stacks we've seen in a while because obviously there's no reused fairing here. We've got the dragon on the top. It's nice and clean. They clean those up real nice after the mission. So um, it's uh, definitely a clean-looking rocket, but it won't be by the time it uh, hits hits the uh, SL the landing guard zone here. So it'll uh, it'll get a little sooty on its way down, and then it'll be seasoned. As long as there's no. WM vac on here. I'm happy. <laughs> Can't deal with that thing, man. They have been taking uh, bets in the chat about the, the, uh, the stubby appearance. I have not Please. seen one yet on one of my. <laughs> Please no. <laughs> and you know, one other thing I wanted to point out here, um, it 
this is I've been coming down here for many years, but this is the first time I've seen so many rockets on the pad. So we have right now, of course, at uh, 39A, we have the uh, the Dragon and, and Falcon that are going up tonight. But we also have the uh, the uh, Atlas V that rolled out earlier today with the mm-hmm. secret NRO mission on it. And then over on the other SpaceX pad, um, we have another Falcon 9 with the Starlink payload. They're all vertical, and they're all within my field of view right now. There's a lot of activity going on down here. You're all going to be busy this week. <laughs> Lon, isn't the mobile launcher for SLS, I mean, I'll be not with SLS on it, but the mobile launcher is out at 39B for testing after the Ar- Artemis 1 upgrades. It is. And actually, last night, they had it lit up so bright, it was like almost taking some of the attention away from the Crew 7 mission, I think, because everyone was looking over at that. Um, but yeah, it's up there right now. It's uh, a little dimmer tonight. They just have some of the, uh, the sodium lights on it tonight, so it's not as... Yeah. Uh, not as bright, but uh, yeah, it's it's quite a scene out here. It's it's amazing, especially during the day when you look at all the activity going on at 39A with that Starship uh, tower going up, and um, it's exciting. I think for those of us who um, have waited for this level of activity to arrive, it's here. I mean, I think it's all something we wanted to see with the space shuttle, but you know, we'll take this too. This is this is good. This is fine. I'll take this. Absolutely, uh, and I will too. I'll- I'm going to hit this. Uh, I'm going to bit of support here quickly. JD Brown uh, uh, with the uh, ten dollars. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, essentially asking, how's the progress going so far with the Slick Forty Crew Tower expansion? Uh, if you want to know, go watch the latest Cape Flyover <laughs> that released earlier in the week. And um, we've got some uh, uh, the uh, our eyes in the sky. We had uh, Max, Julia, and uh, uh, Brandon up in the helicopter taking some photos, and uh, we've we've seen the sections, the tower sections for Slick Forty, and uh, you can uh, see all of the things and all the details in that. So if you just go back to the channel page, scroll down a few videos, it'll be right there. And uh, Luna Clark has become a Pad Rat member. Thank you very much for that. Uh, hmm. Whitney and John Cook have got another great question here. I'm not sure if it's easy to... EJ, I'm not sure if you could whip up a very quick answer off the top of your head because you have to do some thinking. Uh, they're asking how many humans have flown on a Dragon capsule. Uh, well, I don't know we if have... you can go back and quickly see how many how many Crew Dragon flights there have been and then times it by four. Well, let's think about this. So this is the seventh crew flight. So if we, if we include this one, seven times four, 28. You have two Axiom missions with four people aboard. That's another... That's another eight. So we got 36. You have DM2. That's another two. So 38. And then Inspiration 4 on top of that. So Dragon's flown over 40 people. It's 40, 40. Oh my gosh, it's 42 people. No. Uh, uh, let's no. just say it's 42 people by the end of tonight. We haven't yeah, reached okay. 42 yet. <laughs> all right. This has all, right. all got to go right. to plan. That's fair. And uh, TW Space asking, uh, I'm at the Cape at the Hyatt Hotel. I know where that is. Uh, will I be able to see it land and hear it across the river? Uh, Absolutely. Lon, uh, Lon how, how are you? <laughs> it's fine, EJ. We're all excited. It's fine. Uh, oh, I'm Lon, Jordan, man. Let's do this. <laughs> Lon, how's the, how's the visibility looking? Uh, oh, it's uh, looking great. Yeah, it's a little, it's a little hazy just from the humidity, but I, I think you're, yeah, you're not gonna have any problem seeing this tonight, especially if you're in the immediate area. And NASA issued a, a, a press release uh, to warn residents about a very late, or early, if you will, uh, sonic boom that will be heard all throughout this area as it comes back down. So yeah, it's gonna be. Uh, if you were able to stay up and you're around the Cape Canaveral area, you're gonna have a great view tonight. And. Uh, uh... November 939er, November, November, asking, uh, from my knowledge of orbital mechanics, there should be two chances to get into the same orbit, going northbound and going southbound. EJ, how come SpaceX and NASA with the shuttle, how come they never take the southern trajectory? Why do they always launch to the north to the ISS? It's, uh, if I recall correctly, it's 51.6 degrees. So why don't yep. they ever just launch to the south? Well... I mean, you could get at it from the south, but I, I believe the recovery zones and uh, with the abort contingencies for the Dragon capsule, it's better to launch up the northeast coast because you're always going to be basically close to the coastline. Uh, I know during the shuttle missions, that's what they did. You know, the, the ISS is 51 degrees inclined, which means if you're at the Cape, which is, I mean, Pad 39A is about 28 degrees north latitude, you would launch on a northeast trajectory. You basically skirt up the entire east coast of the United States. There's more opportunities for 
you know, if something goes wrong, there's more opportunities for recovery out there. You have more chances of, you know, being close to a coastline so you could get somebody out there quick. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not like you aren't afforded that if you launched on a southeast trajectory. But I do believe, and I could be pulling this one out of my tail, I do believe that that southern trajectory with a dragon capsule, you have to go around the Bahamas and around some of the um, islands that are down there. Uh, and I think that actually ends up costing you more Delta V than just launching straight northeast. We could be pulling that leg. one out. Yeah, we see the we see the dog leg uh, for the uh, the Starlink flights that go to the south through the southern yep. corridor, and you you see the, the there's a in the in the in the overall scheme of things it might not seem oh there's just a little curve on the flight plan but the way that ro rockets work if you have to have like any curve on your flight plan you're 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 wasting energy so yep. it's just in order for the most efficient flight plan possible and also um the recovery con contingencies that EJ mentioned it, you know mm -hmm. going going up going up the north it's it's the most efficient flight path uh flight path flight path uh from it's early. It's early. It's early in the morning Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm the, run yep. okay, go, go ahead. On, I was just one more thing on orbital mechanics before, before we go to the next thing. Um, yeah, the, that North, the North latitude, I mean, KSC and Florida being up in the Northern hemisphere, I above the equator. If you're launching, if launching on the Northeast trajectory, it, it, I was I just kind of sitting there staring at the wall a second ago. Uh, yeah, if you're launching that way, you're, it, it is, it is way more fuel efficient. Like, if you were 28 degrees south latitude, the southeast trajectory would be favorable. But because we're in the northern hemisphere and Florida's in the northern hemisphere, I mean, I'll be kind of close to the equator, but because in the northern hemisphere, getting to a 51 degree inclined orbit is actually, it, it, that's more favorable. It's actually costs you less delta V doing that because you're already, you're already up north. Might as well go that way. Polaris Aerospace. Um... I'm going to take a guess that that isn't the official Polaris account. But anyway, thanks for the super chat asking a booster RTLS. And um, yeah, we have an, a booster RTLS with this crew flight. Uh, yep. uh, so that's something to look forward to. Uh, Brian is asking, do we know what the zero G indicator is yet? And Lon, that's kind of something we won't figure out until Dragon is on its way to the ISS, I don't think. Yeah, I, don't, I haven't heard. And they typically keep that kind of secret until, it, until they get in orbit. So we'll have to see... Uh... See who, what they've picked this time. Another thing to look forward good. to. Yeah, and uh, EJ, we have an, uh, many questions about the trajectory. Uh, but just to uh, reiterate, what uh, what is the trajectory of tonight's launch? It so it's a north. It's called the northeast trajectory out of the Cape. The ISS is in a fifty one point six degree inclined orbit. So if you don't speak nerd, what that means is the ISS orbit is kind of tilted, but it's tilted relative to the Earth's equator. So if you like looked at a map, you draw a line through like a isometric map of the world, right? The equator would be right in the center going left to right. Uh, the ISS's orbit, when it passes over the equator, makes an angle of 51.6 degrees. So that favors a northeast trajectory out of the Cape. You, if it's a clear night, anybody that's on the east, eastern seaboard of the U.S. should be able to see this thing go. As long as there's no clouds. Yeah, if it's clear. If it's clear, I don't know. It's been raining a lot actually i mean where i'm up in the northeast part of the u.s you, i sometimes can see these dragons fly by i can basically see right when the second stage shuts off they usually shut it off right around where i am okay where are you located uh i'm on cape cod i'm at the other cape <laughs> okay because I'm, I'm usually in connecticut so we you know, we can see the uh, the launches from wallops in connecticut quite quite frequently in fact on our last uh wallops yeah. launch here on NAS, uh, nsf we uh, were able to Tune in right into my uh, my dad's backyard. <laughs> we got some oh, great footage of that. So that's cool. Maybe I'll have to head down one night for a, for a SpaceX one and see if I can see it. Cheers, man. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Brian is asking, uh, how long is the trip to the ISS? Now, uh, EJ, uh, we've seen it with Soyuz and uh, Progress before. Uh, the Russians are really good at knocking down this time, as we see uh, 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 yep. a feed from inside the, the, the checkout facility here with there the four astronauts. Um, how long does it take Dragon with these four people aboard to get to the ISS? It's certainly longer than the Russians do it. Well, the Russians got it dialed in, first and foremost. They got it dialed into a three-hour transfer. The reason why most mostly is because Soyuz is a tried and tested system. It is a great launch vehicle. It just does what you need it to do, gets the ISS, comes home. 
I mean, there's been a little things here and there lately, but it, they got it dialed into a three hour transfer because of the maturity of the vehicle. Now, something now that's not to say that Dragon isn't an excellent vehicle as well, but I mean, it, it is obviously is right. But it is a lot newer. It's a newer vehicle and a quick transfer trajectory like that takes, you know, you, you, you really want to make sure you're on your game when you're, I mean, it's hard enough to send these, you know, send these four folks up into space and then get them to the station and then do a long duration stay with a capsule. It, you know, what's the rush? Just let's make sure that we get the capsule working correctly. And then maybe we can focus on transfer burns later. But the other thing is that, you know, Ross Cosmos favors, favors those quick transfer windows, but NASA, I think NASA likes to play it safe with SpaceX, obviously providing their service for them. I think NASA likes to play it safe with this. And also the other thing is that you got to take into account the orbital mechanics. There is, you know, Florida being 27 degrees or 28 degrees north means that if you launch due east out of Florida, you're getting into a 28 degree inclined orbit. The ISS is at 51 degrees inclined. Remember that inclination is when the orbit, if it's tilted, when it crosses the equator, what angle does it make, right? So long story short, Florida, there's less opportunities there's less opportunities from Florida to have the ISS directly over your head and have Florida be directly in the path of that 51.6 degree inclined orbit. So it te you tend to have a longer transfer going out of the Cape than you do from Baikonur, for instance. Baikonur is fair bit ways more north. And if it's a fair bit ways more north, then you, you really have more opportunities to get to the ISS because, the, you know, the ISS is always going to fly over Baikonur pretty much almost at any time. But the other thing is that, you know, you could wait a day and do a three hour transfer. Or you could do a 24 hour transfer. But I think NASA likes to err on the side of caution with this stuff. Just be sure. Be absolutely sure. You don't want to mess up. And that's also why we had a, had a uh, S word last night, because some things were just not right and they didn't want to take the risk. Yep. There's no there's no need to roll the dice. There's no need to get there quick. I mean, getting there quick is cool. That's that's really neat, but you really don't need to do that. This crew is going to be up there for six months. You, they can wait 20, 20 hours, 24 hours to get there. That's not that big of a deal, considering your stay, right? Right. Yeah. I have a pilot friend of mine who says one of the riskiest things ever is, is catching get there-itis. So, and I would imagine yep. uh, aviation is one thing, space flight's another. <laughs> and you can wait a day, you wait a day. In space, in space flight, that's called go fever, and it's not yeah. something that's advised with uh, souls on board. Not a good idea. Absolutely, we were, and, and of course, uh, going on. I said, you know, just, just, I think, um, you know, it's all about risk mitigation, and, and NASA is very. I think when you look at it, maybe, some, maybe one of you on the call might want to be able to talk about this. You know, how, how is a, a, a crewed flight on? Are on Falcon 9 different than some of these non-crewed missions, which are most of what they, they launch. I, I, I'm sure there's a review with NASA that they go through, but are there any other considerations that SpaceX has to look at here for Falcon 9 versus or Falcon 9 with a crew versus Falcon 9 with a Starlink pack? I think the Starlink missions are much less risk adverse. On that's really the truth of it. Starlink satellites are replaceable. People are not. It's that simple. And uh, speaking of the people, what we've been looking at for the last few minutes is uh, uh, one of NASA's fiber feeds coming out of the, uh, what is it, EJ's? The Neil Armstrong Launch Operations facility. and Checkout. Op thank you very much. Operations and Checkout facility. Thanks very much. And yes, um, all four crew members are in there. You can see, uh, uh, very helpful, the, the, the angle switch. Uh, the two on the left there, and you can also see the two on the right. I can't specifically identify them. I'm going to guess the bottom left and um, is uh, Konstantin Borisov uh, with uh, Jasmine uh, uh, McBelly in the in the top right of this picture, and um, the other the other two uh, crewmates uh, uh, for uh, Satoshi Furukawa and um, Andreas Mergson uh, are yep. uh, going to be behind this camera angle that we have here. Um, so. <laughs> NASA is switching between these a bit quickly for me to talk about them, but yeah. as the crew roll out, we'll talk about them in more detail um, as they as they move towards the pad. We have a very international crew this evening, slash oh, yeah. morning, slash afternoon, wherever you're watching from. Uh, we have a crew from the US, Denmark, Japan, and Russia all on board 
uh, this crew dragon, or soon to be on board rather, this crew dragon spacecraft heading towards the ISS. And um, I believe, uh, oh, I think I still think it's the other the other angle. So we still can't, we still don't have an angle of um, uh, Satoshi and uh, Andreas, but uh, fingers crossed we'll get them soon. Mm -hmm. uh, River Dave Kenny is asking, and um, actually I may hold that until we get uh, the, the the pad cam back. We're, we'll stick with the crew for a little while. Um, so uh, I'll reiterate it again. Uh, if you have a question for us, tag us in chat at NASA Spaceflight. Um, I'm going to try bunch these together uh, so we can uh, answer the most relevant questions uh, uh, at the at the most relevant points during the countdown, uh, which we are now approaching T minus three hours and fifty minutes to go. And um, here's a crew question: James asking EJ, I'll toss this to you. Do we know where the crew keeps their belongings, like clothes? Uh, when they're in ONC, ONC is basically now they have head. It's basically like a hotel room for us. It's a hotel for, for astronauts. That's where they're going to keep their belongings for the time being. I mean, when, when dragon recovery happens, they might fly all the way to, you know, sometimes they fly directly back to Houston. So you really don't take much with you other than your flight suit, uh, here. But if you're talking about like on the capsule, they have basically space lockers. That's that's uh, it's a really easy way to say it. it's basically a space locker it's also i think they velcro pretty much everything once they get to the iss so nothing goes flying oh, yeah. because unlike here on earth you can't you can't put you you can't put your stuff in your in your in your in your space locker and expect it to still be there when you return it may have floated off and um well, we're seeing here uh, uh yep. andreas and uh, uh desmond mcbelly i believe uh, yep. as we approach the uh, T minus three minute, uh, three hour and 50 minute mark. Um, in the bottom right there, that looks like, um, I don't specifically think it's a life support system, but it looks like one of them retro, like uh, oxygen tank pipe pumpy things that they had on the Apollo missions that they used to carry along with, uh, carry alongside them uh, down the, down the gantry. Um, yep. Looks like, uh, I'm not sure if it's hooked in yet, but I think they pump fresh air, EJ, if I'm correct. That's basically a portable air conditioner. It's HVAC for the suits. Right now, while they're sitting in the seats, they're doing leak. They're doing suit leak checks, making sure that the suit pressurizes, making sure that everything works, making sure there's no pinhole leaks or anything like that. When the astronauts and cosmonauts do end up rolling out here, they they do have HVAC. You, the suit has a vent on it that you plug an HVAC system in to keep you cool. It's it's a little it's a little muggy in Florida. Full spacesuit <laughs> probably is a little uncomfortable. Yeah, and speaking of uh, it being muggy in Florida, Lon, um, for all the people that have been joining us over the last few minutes, how's the weather looking? The weather's looking great here, and today, of course, it's this time of year in Florida is just always hot and humid, um, but the uh, skies are clear. I can see stars overhead, and not too much haze here. The weather is go. I think we're looking at still 95%, at least at the last time I checked, so uh, weather is not going to be a problem, I don't think, uh, as things are rolling along here. And we're getting a nice breeze where, where we usually sit for uh, these launches, especially when we have a return to landing site event like we'll have tonight. Uh, we sit kind of at the edge of the turning basin, which is where a lot of the, the, the big fuel tanks come in here for uh, assembling now Artemis, formerly uh, where they would do the uh, shuttle tanks. And so we've got a nice breeze coming off of that turning basin, too. So it's uh, very, very pleasant out here. The only uh, problems are mosquitoes. And the alligators are out there, but they're they're kind of sticking to their their part of the uh, <laughs> the, the uh, water here. So so far, they haven't come up to visit me yet. Resident KSC security. That's what the alligators yes. do. And um, as Gon was talking there, I believe it looked as if uh, um, Jasmine's suit uh, depressurized um, because it seemed c kind of like a helmet just kind of sunk down a little bit. Uh, EJ, I think that might have been the uh, the. Uh, the uh, suit test uh, concluding with the depressurization yep. of the suit there because um, the helmet then uh, swiftly opened there to get um, the uh, the air circulation going again. That was pretty cool to see. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It, actually, that shot that we have right on the screen, that's Andreas, I believe. You could see the, the umbilical on his suit. by It's underneath his right hand. Uh, that umbilical, they're, they're using that to test the leaks now. But these, these are flight suits. That's important to understand. They're flight suits. They're not something that you could 
go outside of the spacecraft with. This is these suits are there, and the reason why they're doing leak checks is in case of cabin depress. It's basically a beefed up version of that the oxygen mask that comes down on an airplane if you have a depressurization event. Uh, hopefully, that would never happen to anyone. Wouldn't wish that on anybody. That doesn't sound like fun. But the astronauts have the spacesuits in case of a depress event, so they they have to make sure that these spacesuits are good. But these spacesuits don't have any life support systems. That umbilical that it, you could see coming out of Andreas's right side right there, that umbilical is there to tap into Dragon's onboard environmental control and life support systems, the Eclis for short. That is what that is there for. So they can basically unplug it, they can plug it into that portable HVAC unit, or they can unplug it and plug it into the capsule when they get there. And there's Satoshi Furukawa looking very, very happy um, uh, ahead, of, ahead of rolling out to the pad. Um, you can see also in the other shot, all the camera guys running around as well, they also seem pretty excited zooming in and out of uh, various things as uh, we get this uh, live fiber feed from NASA, uh, which we're very grateful for. And uh, it seems like uh, Konstantin Borisov just got up out of the uh, seat there. And um, uh, fingers crossed the other astronauts will be uh, joining uh, him as well very shortly as we count down to launch. And these suits are custom for each a astronaut, aren't they? Yep. They are, they are custom tailored suits and they don't get to keep them either. Oh. <laughs> I know. That kind of stinks. Yeah, I mean, you go into space and you, it only fits you. <laughs> they, I, think, I feel like some kind of mission, uh, like objective complete bonus. Like if you do X amount of things on board the station, we'll, we'll give you your Christmas bonus in the form of you can keep your spacesuit. I mean, <laughs> that, that would seem like a fair deal to me. But um, I wonder whether there's any, um, any regulations against that in case of stolen IP or anything. I don't know. Um, oh, and those, those, are the, those are the famous... Uh, uh, arm chairs it appears there the relaxing chairs that we saw <laughs> with crew six them stretching out and relaxing very much so before their flight it looks as if constantine has already picked his spot there and is relaxing um i believe they may have a card game coming up shortly as well and um yeah so it looks as if the other uh crew members are now getting checked out and um you can see there at the back uh the person with the danish flag that's andreas and um, uh, Jasmine McBelly is to the is to the right of Andre uh, Andreas uh, oh. in this image, kind of in the middle there. Skull, Viking power. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I can't remember if we've seen a Dane fly before. Morgensen's been to the ISS before. Oh yes, of course, second he, space flight. Mm -hmm. He flew on TMA fifteen, and he was up there for nine days, and flew down on TMA sixteen M. It was a short duration stay, but yeah, he's been up there before. Sounds good. I um, I forgot that. Thanks, EJ. I that's got a, you, man. It's the reason why we. It's the reason why there's more than just me talking to everybody here. <laughs> and um, for those of you just joining us, remember, if you have a question, uh, we are loading up the queue here. Tag us in chat at NASA Space Flight. If you do that, it filters through, and then it comes into the queue here, so we don't get any spam or anything like that. It's just a nice, easy way to filter all the questions through. So if you have a question, tag us in chat at NASA Space Flight. Brings it into the queue here. It's not we, we don't just answer Super Chats. We're not one of those channels. We answer as many questions as we can through whatever means it gets to us because, you know, just viewing is one of the best ways you can support us because if nobody watched, then we wouldn't have anybody to stream to. So, uh, yeah, if you have a question, just throw it into chat, but make sure to tag us at NASA Space Flight. That way it comes into the system and we can answer them on stream. Uh, we have another trajectory question here from James. EJ, I'll throw this one to you as well. What is the trajectory of the launch tonight? I'm out doing astrophotography right now and wondering if I could catch it. Well, first of all, that depends where you are. So, uh, EJ, I believe if you're up the eastern seaboard of the US, you may have a good, idea, a, a, a good chance, depending yep. if it's cloudy. If the night's clear, this, this Falcon 9 with Dragon Endurance on board is scheduled to launch basically northeast. A 51.6 degree inclined orbital insertion, uh, which should be a flight azimuth of like 045 on the compass. So it's basically, yeah, right. I mean, you said it. It's flying right up the eastern seaboard. You'll be able to see it all the way to Nova Scotia. And it's not just the eastern seaboard of the U.S. It's all, it goes all the way up to Canada. You'll be able to see it. Uh, it you know, over here on this side of the pond, you know, the sun, I mean, the sun's coming up for you, but the sun's 
going down for us is somewhere over the Atlantic right now. So with the right lighting conditions, you should be able to get it. Sounds good. And it seems all of the crew uh, members are now up out of their seats as they uh, uh, get ready. Um, it looks as if, uh, uh, what is that, Ninja number 22 is practicing the, uh, the lean back. The, uh, the, the famous lean back as uh, the the, the yep. astronauts get out of their uh, their Teslas and then look up, lean back and look up at the Falcon 9 and their their ride to space, which we'll see in a in a, in a, a little while's time as the, the crew roll to the pad. Um, so yeah, it just looks like some final conversations happening now between the crew and the the the, the ninjas. Uh, EJ yep. is that is that their actual name? I don't know whether that's just an affectionate term or not. But all of the people in the uh, the, the the dark grey uh, suits there with the numbers, uh, yeah, we call them the ninjas. I mean, I I call them pad ninjas. That's what they look like. I think the technical term is like launch operations support crew. I think that is. I might be pulling that one out of my tail. They basically. All these folks are here to support the crew ingress operations for the four crew seven members. Now, I, I get asked this all the time on my end, Ryan. Like people always ask me, why are they wearing numbers? Why are, they, why are you wearing numbers? Well, you don't. You have noticed these guys all have masks on and they're all wearing black jumpsuits. They have the numbers on the the back of their back of their jumpsuits, so you can identify who's who. Later, when we see the pad crew, the support crew, go, the pad ninjas go up into the crew access arm, right? They're all going to have, you know, he like, um, basically, a, it's not a hazmat suit, but they have, you know, hair covers and they have masks on. So you can't really tell who's who, but you can, you can definitely see a number on someone's back. Now, cool thing to mention is that, you know, some of these, some of those pad ninjas are actually astronauts that are supporting launch operations. I believe I saw as uh, pad crew support number 22. I think 22 was Anne McLean, who is an active NASA astronaut right now. There are, it's not just SpaceX crew. They usually have other astronauts supporting operations as well, which is really cool. Sounds good. And um, fingers crossed we'll get them walking out here slightly uh, shortly. 21. Thank you, Alex. Oh, 21. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, so everyone's up out of their seats, apart from Konstantin <laughs> Borisov, who right at the back of the picture there is just having the time of his life, relaxing in one of the kind of the maroon chairs at the back there looking to be comfortable i'm sure the others uh, uh i'm not sure if they're choosing to stand up or if they're still getting some final checkouts there but they are having conversations with the with the, all of the crew around them there uh, some final conversations before they start to uh roll out to the pad uh, oh look, they get their own little t minus clock at the back of the shot there as well that's nice and keep an eye out on the clock how it's going before they roll out to the pad very very quickly i'm going to run through a couple more super chats we've gotten uh, Musical Wolves uh, asking, is launching to the ISS so normal that SpaceX will only stream one hour prior to liftoff? Well, you can, you know, we're here, we're streaming. You can always keep a track, keep track of the of the launch to us. Uh, Silky Z, thank you very much for the five dollar super chat there, uh, saying right in Sharpie on the front. I flew to the ISS and all I got was this silly spacesuit. <laughs> um, well, you may have got the spacesuit, but you can't keep it. And uh, Musical Wolves also asking through a super chat, where did the flight suits go after use? Um, EJ, we were talking about this briefly before. We don't really know. I would imagine that. It what they i mean they obviously go back to spacex i mean for all we know they have a broom closet that's full of all the flight suits of all the all you know 38 prior people that have flown but i i think they take the suits back for multiple reasons they take the suits back so they can get analysis uh in flight data i mean that's important to understand how good of a suit you made and i think spacex takes the suits back and probably takes them apart if i if i knew any better probably take it apart figure out you know what parts you can improve and then when they make more suits for other astronauts you incorporate those new design features i mean that that reads correct like that i mean that's they did it with the rockets why not the flight why not, why not the flight suits i mean that makes perfect sense mm -hmm. and i believe we have uh, some crew movement here i wonder if this is them uh going to the table here um i'm sure mm -hmm. someone in the back channel can correct me i believe this yep this is the we're getting ready for the for the game of cards i wonder if uh if uh, <laughs> constantine will be joining them as well also quickly thanks to musical walls there there's constantine thank you musical walls for this uh, last piece of support here and um uh looks like some uh, some uh, some words going between the crew here and um uh, uh one of the uh, what was the word again ej you used uh, like uh, launch pad 
through support operations, something along those lines. Through launch operations support, I think. That's is the what word. It's called. That's the word. EJ's got the acronyms. Uh, I mean, I so might, that the, might be wrong, but that is what they do. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so here's the here's the. Uh, the, the deck of cards, the person in the blue suit in their left hand, that's the deck of cards and um, the crew are uh, listening intently uh, so, I wonder if they're explaining the rules or, or yeah. what else is going on here sounds like he's laying down the law, that's actually another yeah. that's another NASA astronaut, Lon you got this? yeah no I'm just, I was just, uh, just laughing over, over what's going on here so I, I, <laughs> it's funny the, I, I'm wondering what card game they play if any of you happen to know, seems like it's going to be a quick one I don't <laughs> Crazy eight. <laughs> I don't know, but the the guy that the guy that dealt there that he dealt the uh, hand to Jasmine and she split the deck. That's Joseph Akabe. He's the he's a NASA astronaut. I believe he's the chief of the astronaut corps right now. He's the he is the astronaut. <laughs> you know. It strikes me that they do have some good finger dexterity in those uh, those flight suits. So I guess they're probably a little easier to work with when you're not uh, pressurized, right? They are easier to work with. Fun fact about those suits: you can use a touchscreen with them. Right. Because Dragon is mostly touch screens, right? Yeah, I mean, it kind of makes sense, right? <laughs> they well, seem interesting to watch so far. They do. It looks like somebody has a good, uh, good hand there. So, And, you know, it's, it's interesting you watch some of the, uh, some of the older uh, missions on the Soyuz where they have those, those pointing sticks that they had to use to uh, push certain buttons, right? The Finglongers, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, according to um, Jasmine has lost already, so I, I do have to admit I'm not an expert on on the rules of, of the game that they are playing. Um, but according to uh, Daryl Nail from uh, from NASA, um, this is uh, the uh, the uh, card game. I don't believe this has been shown uh, before, at least for 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 a SpaceX crew launch. Um, but it does uh, it does date back um, because attached was a picture. Uh, from the, uh, the 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 suit up of uh, STS-135 in 2011 of uh, the the crew of that flight um, uh, playing the game as well. Um, I wonder if they're still going or if they uh, uh, have boxed it up by now. There's a round of applause. So whoever won, uh, congratulations. Uh, whoever lost, my condolences. I'm not an and expert. You're going to space. So. <laughs> and you go to space at the end of the day. So if you did lose, no hard feelings. You go to space. Everyone's a winner here. Now, I'm wondering if Chad knows what game they were playing. Did we ever figure out what game they were playing? Chad, you guys know? Ryan, you know? I, mean, I don't. I don't. Was uh, it... I, I'm. I'm not sure. Um, but it looks as if what, whatever it is, they're they're, they're they're happy and they're moving on now. <laughs> and <laughs> must um, not have been a good game. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sawyer actually in the back channel. Uh, uh, saying uh, back in the day, a few shuttle missions took. It took so long for them to lose out. It was cutting close to, to delaying the mission. That's quite funny. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, speaking of Sawyer, Lon, thanks for joining us for the first. Uh, how long are we going? First uh, fifty minutes or so of, of the coverage. Uh, fingers crossed. We'll talk to you later in the count. Uh, but for now, we'll let you get a little bit of a, a little bit of a voice break. So uh, uh, thanks for coming on and hanging out. A pleasure. It's been great, and I will uh, be here all night. So we'll see you in a little bit. All right, Lon. See you, buddy. And um, uh, speaking of Sawyer, uh, if he's ready to come on, uh, hello Sawyer, how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing great. It's a launch day. I'm currently set up alongside the road where the uh, crew will be driving by right in front of the vehicle assembly building on their way over to pad 39A. Hey, what's going on Sawyer? How you doing buddy? Uh, I am doing absolutely fantastic. It's a gorgeously clear night here. Stars everywhere. The light breeze. And oh yeah, there's three rockets behind me on different launch pads right now. So I'd say good night so far. Yeah, that doesn't Hayden's suck. Sight of the Cape is crazy. I mean, just the, the number of rockets on pads is just, you know. It's, it, a few years ago, it was epic to see a Falcon 9 up on Slick 40. Now there's one there practically every day. It's awesome to see. Uh, but back and to this mission. I do want to point out really quick. I actually got delayed by a booster driving around here. So when they say Kennedy Space Center is a multi-user spaceport, they're not kidding. Yeah, I mean, uh, at least we, at least your excuse checks out for having a, <laughs> for having <laughs> been held up by a booster there. Um, I'm sure. Um, if you get your report to Chris B, then uh, you won't be in trouble at all. Just kidding. <laughs> um, 
You can see a banner there over the door, actually, of uh, the, uh, what's the word, the patch for this mission and the crew members' names there. We've got Jasmine, Andreas, Satoshi, and Constantine there. They will be walking out of that very door and down that very ramp very, very shortly. Uh, mm -hmm. But first, I believe there's a lift they need to take down to the ground floor um, from the uh, the, uh, the the suit-up room uh, where they have been uh, for the... Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, EJ, do we know how long they're in the in the suit up room for? Uh, the suit up room. Well, they got to do the pressure checks and then play the card game. Uh, right now, probably just going through any final checks, making sure everybody's good to go, and they will walk out of the flight suit checkout room down the hallway, into an elevator, down a floor, out into another hallway, and then out out of the uh, ONC building into the Teslas. That was that shot that we saw a second ago of the double doors. That's a uh, fun fact. Every NASA astronaut, except for the ones that flew out of Baikonur on Soyuz, pretty much every NASA astronaut since Apollo 7 has walked out of those, out of those doors. Pretty cool. That's the same doors that Neil, Buzz, and uh, Mike walked out of, you know, uh, what is it, 53 or 54 years ago. Same exact doors, same place. They still use the building, which is, I, I always thought that's really cool. Pretty much every single then, shuttle mission. Yeah, there's some really awesome history with the with the facilities down here at the cave. And uh, mm -hmm. briefly, we were inside uh, down the corridor. There was a water cooler and some wonderful artwork on the walls as well. Yeah, I like that. That's really cool. And what we are currently looking at is the Teslas, the Model Xs, uh, which will be carrying the crew to the pad. And um, they've all got the SpaceX logos down the side, you know, everything you would expect from the crew transport vehicle. And I oh. believe there Whacked is that's, that's nice. Yeah, I believe at the front of the uh, well, queue, but kind of at the front there, I believe that might be like the family and friends of the, of the crew members yep. waiting to give them one final goodbye and there's tesla number two with the with the bye number plate there on the back <laughs> um I'm yeah not sure i think it's unique same. that they do it for every different mission the fact yep. normally they try and incorporate the mission number into it you know but this is still pretty cool yeah, yeah. so do we know if they're the same throughout all of the teslas if they all have the same plate or if uh, they have different plates well, these are not official license plates. They're yeah. kind of vanity I mean, number of plates for the role. <laughs> but yeah, and the other interesting thing is a lot of times if you look in the windshield of each of these Teslas as they go by, you'll see mission stickers. So basically, uh, once a crew rides in these Teslas, they get a mission patch sticker in the window so you can see how many different crews they brought out to the pad. And uh, it is being pointed out in the back channel quickly that the buy is seven digits long. So the, the number, the crew seven number is in there technically, just ah, not literally. So cool. yeah. I, I thought they would have done seven characters. E's then. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. I don't think they could fit all them. <laughs> Especially on a normal sized, uh, a normal sized plate. Your, your plate. I do have to say, as, as, as a Brit looking at the US, your, your license plates are especially, are especially thin. We're we're used to much wider plates over here, mm -hmm. uh, and in uh, down in the briefly in the in the right slash bottom right slash uh, not really bottom right but kind of on the on the on the right a bit there maybe if we uh, from another shot be easier to see, and um, uh, Bill Nelson, uh, the uh, administrator of NASA, Pam Melroy, the uh, I believe it's the uh, deputy administrator, deputy. and Bob Cabana, and um, the uh, associate administrator, uh, yep. uh, they're all they're all hanging out there, uh, ready for the crew to roll. Miles. So to see the, the the people from NASA waiting for the crew to roll out of the building, and um, if it seems, I just want to not really disclaimer, but I just want to say that if it seems like there's not much going on at any particular point, that's probably because SpaceX has built so much redundancy into this timeline. They yep. they leave much, uh, they leave extra time for practically everything up until T zero. That way, if there is a slight delay on anything, it won't cause a knock on effect and then eventually cause the mission to not go ahead because as Lon was mentioning earlier, this is an instantaneous launch window. If they miss the launch window tonight by um, a, even a, a, a tiny amount, then the game over for the night. They have, to, they have to wait for the next launch window. So by having much more time margin added into all of the different procedures, that way, if there is a slight delay with something right early, it doesn't have a knock-on effect all the way down to T0, right? So it may seem like we're just waiting around at the moment, 
but the whole schedule's been built that way so that if there was anything that did go wrong within the, you know, as EJ was mentioning, like super pressurization checks and things like that, yeah. that way it doesn't have a knock-on effect all the way down to T0. So um, it looks as mm -hmm. if one of the ninjas would just walked out of the building there and um, we are still waiting for the crew to uh, uh, walk out of the building there as well. And it's worth nope. pointing out, they have actually needed it in uh, even recent launches. There was one that there was some FOD for an object debris, which even included some human hairs that were preventing the hatch from closing properly. There was one where they weren't sure on one of the suit's leaks check. I believe that was Crew 5. But both of those missions went off exactly on time. Took the words out of my mouth, man. That's awesome. <laughs> oh, great yeah. minds, dude. <laughs> Redundancy is very, very helpful, especially in crew launches like this, when you need Absolutely. as many things to go to go to go to plan as possible and on time, preferably as well. Yeah. So fingers crossed, very shortly we'll see the crew walk out from the I'm gonna try and get it right. The Neil Armstrong operations in checkout building. Boom, got it right. Uh, eventually, by the end of the night, everybody, I will have that ingrained in my head. Um, okay. but it's a, right. it's a it's a it's, it's a, a very long name. It's the Neil cool. Armstrong. It's called the O and C. Yeah, or just, yeah, you could call it ONC. ONC is fine. ONC, there you go. I'll probably forget what the initialism stands for, but it's just the ONC. Overclock. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Um, so, yeah. Actually, uh, Ryan, I, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I actually wanted to point out something. So, you said that Bill Nelson, Pam Melroy, and Bob Cabana are there. I'd like to point out that the number one, two, and the number three people that are running NASA all have been into space. Pam Melroy and Bob Cabana are, were shuttle pilots. Both of them have flown and commanded the space shuttle multiple times. And Bill flew as a passenger on a flight in the 80s. <clears throat> but hey, still counts. All of them have been to space. That's pretty cool. Number one, number two, number three at NASA, all have been into space. I, I don't know. I don't know about you guys. That's, you know, I, you'd think that that would be like a requirement or something. But we, we have a scenario here where they do, they have all been to space. That's really cool. Yeah, it's good to have it's good to have actual space like experience at the top of NASA. It's um, oh yeah, you know, it's 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 it, 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 it's just really cool to see. Some people who do also have some uh, space flight experience is uh, the uh, the pilot and mission specialist one for today, Andreas and Satoshi. Uh, so fingers crossed, we'll see them uh, uh, walking out very soon. Uh, the uh, mm -hmm. it's actually the the spacecraft commander Jasmine. It's actually her first space flight as well as uh, Konstantin Borisov, mission specialist too. Um, uh, so um, we'll get you their details as we get through to crew rollout because uh, we are now just under three and a half hours to go until T zero. So we we have uh, we have plenty of time to go through, answer questions and such. Uh, but uh, as of right now, our eyes are firmly fixed on that pair of doors there um, mm -hmm. as we await the crew to walk down the corridor, go down the lift, walk a little bit further, and then come out of those doors. Um, a very a very famous set of doors and yep. ramp uh which um uh, as ej was mentioning earlier uh, many many different crews have walked down for uh, apollo missions and shuttle missions and uh, uh spacex missions and such and uh uh ej do we know if this will be used for the starliner uh flights as well um i i think so i think i think they will the all the suit pressurization systems for the uh for the flight suits, which on Starliner, they are Orion derived. So, I mean, I don't see why you wouldn't. It's right there and it already has all the equipment that you need. The suits that Starliner uses, once again, are derived from the shuttle pumpkin suits, the ACES suit. So the Starliner suit is similar. So I, I would imagine you already have the facilities there, but we don't, I don't think we actually have any concrete information on that. That's kind of an assumption on my part. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. And um, I wonder if this is a, zoom in there you go i think you may have just been able to see the back of bill nelson's head there for a brief moment uh from that ptc camera whilst we're waiting for the crew i'll just hit a little bit more support uh, oh there you go there's a uh, the back of bill nelson's head there on the left pam melroy and bob cabana there in the middle uh mm -hmm. very quickly and uh, uh maya's become a pan trap member and gifted one red team membership thanks very much for that cthi has uh, gifted another red team membership thanks very much and um, Jack Byer, never heard of him before, with the $5 super chat asking, given Ooh. the Northeast trajectory, will this be visible from New York? Asking for a friend. Also, shuttle horses bacon. Um, <laughs> yeah, 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 I can get behind this. Uh, and, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to divert our attention now to the crew who have begun yep. walking towards the, towards the lift. Uh, yep. With uh, lots of waves, and I, I imagine some applause as we well. Go. 
Yeah, is it getting into the into the into the? They have a oh look at that. They have a they have a like a uh, tarpaulin thing at the back. I believe that might be signed as well um, at the back of the lift. Uh, so schedule. Look down, uh, yeah. Or rather, get lowered down towards the ground floor. They're currently on the. Uh, according to the lift, they're on the third floor of the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building, and uh, they're right on schedule. And hopefully, mm -hmm. we'll see them appear from this door in just a few moments' time. Uh, again, they are now going down the lift uh, in the in the ONC, and they will be shortly emerging from that double door. And um, from there, they will, um, I imagine, um, share some brief words with their, for some brief final words from their family and friends, at least in person. They do have a, a, a tug of phone up at the top of the of the tower at LC39A, um, but at least in person, some final words with friends and family before boarding the blacked out Tesla Model Xs, which uh, as part of a, of a very long convoy, will take them around uh, up Merritt Island towards uh, the, uh, they'll drive by the VAB and then they'll um, drive down uh, just adjacent to the crawl away down to 39a uh, well they'll go into the pad gates and then roll up to the tower which they'll then get on another lift all the way to the top um up to the coaxis arm uh, at 39a and then from and, there it's also worth noting in... if i may f oh, go ahead i was going to say from there they're going to get into another lift but <laughs> and that's going to take them lift. up even higher yeah it's going to go a little faster anyway Sawyer take it away minus one pun token um, <laughs> Damn. I was <laughs> I was going to say is that uh, what's interesting to keep in mind is that they have been quarantined for a bit it started in Houston before they came over here uh, some of their family members have also been keeping a form of quarantine so that they're able to see their families and a lot of that culminates typically the day before launch uh, the families will usually get to go with their astronaut loved ones to a place called the astronaut beach house uh yep. which is a, an old traditional place and they'll spend time together on the beach have a barbecue and all that before their flight day mm -hmm. actually that's cool when when dm2 first flew back in 2020 i had a lot of people asking me like oh why are they all cordoned off is that because of covid is that because of quarantines so, no no they've been doing that for a long time this is a this is standard procedure you quarantine the astronauts you, because you don't want to get a head cold in space chat kid i don't know if you like think about how bad like a sinus infection would be in zero gravity zero g that that uh that doesn't sound good at all. And the reason why they do that is because that actually happened on Apollo 7. One of the astronauts on Apollo 7 got a head cold in space, and it was awful. That doesn't, that doesn't sound fun at all. So this quarantine is something that they've been doing for 50-plus years. Yeah, it's, microgravity of the fluid doesn't drain from your head normally, oh, so it pools up. Yeah. It sounds awful. Yeah, it's just horrible to think about and it's not like you know the ambulance service can't reach you in space it's it's just it's just better to avoid all of all every anything and everything to do with that by just quarantining and, and making sure that you're, you're you're perfectly healthy before you're boarding you're boarding dragon to the iss although at least one person from every expedition is trained to be sort of the medical doctor on board in the event that someone does get sick or needs surgery or of an emergency happens whatever the case may be yeah. not surgery yeah. but you know what i mean yeah as we were talking with the timings earlier it's best to have redundancy and speaking of timings right on cue there go the doors out come the four crew members of crew seven and i believe at the front there left is andreas the pilot right is jasmine uh the commander and at the back uh on the left Konstantin borisov from Rose cosmos and at the right from our perspective anyway is satoshi furukawa from uh japan and uh lots of smiles lots of waves they look yeah. very happy and are looking forward to boarding their uh well first of all they're going to say hello to their family and friends for the, the last time in person mm -hmm. and um lots of waves lots of lots of lots of smiles i imagine some tears as well and um uh, there you go uh, you can see them all talking to their their family and friends there just before they depart in the teslas from the operations and checkout building and um, they, they, they seem to be sticking to that yellow line there. So um, yep. keeping their distance to make sure they don't catch any germs or, or anything like that to make sure they stay healthy for their trip to space. But uh, um, also just close enough that they can still be within, you know, normal talking distance with their, with their, with their, with their friends and family there. And um, so they'll share some brief conversations very quickly before they board the Teslas. So actually, a couple of things to note. You can see... Andres Morganson is talking to his family, but there's another ESA astronaut uh, on the right side of the stanchions. That's Alan Alexander Gerst right there. He's flown into space multiple times. 
Yeah, very uh, cool. I believe he's the one with the uh, the German flag on his left shoulder there. Uh, yeah, the, the aerodynamic photos. haircut. He's got a Scott Manley yeah. on. It's very, very stylish. Yeah. <laughs> They're taking photos with his phone as well. And um, there you go. Get some, get some snaps for the album there. No selfies yet, I can't see. Although it would be particularly difficult to take a selfie when you, you, know, you have to stay um, away. And it looks as if uh, Jasmine on the right there seems to be um, having a an, an, a happy conversation there with her friends yep. and family as the, as the ninjas get ready in the in, in the Teslas. Yep. Yeah, I was going to say you could see them preparing the cars because uh, again, keep in mind they still have the uh, connections with the air and everything that will go into their suits to keep them cool. So it's kind of just getting them hooked up and in and as comfortable as they can for the ten or fifteen minute ride. And they seem to, <laughs> I believe that's um, a final goodbye there from uh, from Jasmine at the back as they now walk towards the Teslas and um, get in them uh, at the back. I believe that's Constantine and uh, Satoshi in the rear Tesla. And that's Jasmine with a big wave to her friends and family there. And uh, NASA Administrator Bill Nelson, Deputy Administrator Pam Melroy and Associate Administrator Bob Cabana there um, at the front of the crowd. Uh, waving goodbye one final time in person to the crew of Crew 7. And the uh, the Goldwing doors come down, sealing shut. Uh, or not. Uh, nearly nearly shut. Um, uh, they will. We'll, we'll give them a moment to sort the doors out. Um, but there you go, they're, now, they're, they're closing the doors and getting ready to go. And up it goes again. And... <laughs> yes, they have a, a little bit of door trouble there in the, uh, on the rear right. Um, go and and clear of the closing doors, please. Yeah, <laughs> give it water, one more go. There we go. <laughs> they're, they're, they're as, as silly as it sounds, by the way, that is why they have the extra time built into the countdown for silly yeah. things, even like the Tesla doors won't close. It's there always go, yeah. something small every time. Redundancy. Redundancy, redundancy, redundancy. It's so, so important. Yeah, small things can add up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe they just scrolled the window down. Oh, 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 the... Yep. Move the window down slightly there at the back there for Jasmine and um, friends and family there. Just uh, now going, they can now go up to the cars. It's safe to go up to the cars. One final time, one final goodbye there um, uh, to the crew's friends and family there, um, which is uh, wonderful to see. And I believe around the 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 the, the wall side now as well is also um, uh, uh, Andreas Monson's uh, friends and family there as well, as they yep. get ready to roll very very shortly. And then another thing, another thing to look out for, for the people that like, you know, looking for little details like that. Anybody that's wearing a blue flight suit is an astronaut, but that doesn't mean that there aren't astronauts there that are, are wearing other things. Like Anne McLean is on the support crew, number 21. She's wearing a black suit, but she is an, a NASA astronaut, right? But anybody that's wearing that blue flight suit with a patch and an, with a NASA patch on the arm and a flag on the left, that's a NASA astronaut. Like if you look right next to number 34 right there, that's Jessica Watkins. She just came back from space actually relatively recently. And the crew's family and friends are now leaving the, uh, the roadway and they'll be rolling pretty shortly. You can see up front, uh, in front of the Teslas, there's a, a much longer convoy as well. So it's a pretty long convoy that treks out all the way from the, uh, the, uh, uh, well, the ONC all the way down to 39A. And um, the convoy, the vast majority of the convoy um, will, uh, I believe they'll stop at the, the gate of 39A, but the Teslas will continue up to the pad with the crew members on board so they can uh, do the classic lean back, look up at their ride to space, and then uh, board the elevator all the way up to the level of the crew access arm. Um, yeah, the convoy, by the way, has a lot of vehicles involved, as you mentioned. There's armored vehicles as well as uh, KSC police vehicles. Obviously, the crew is sandwiched in the middle. And then there's also the helicopter overhead for yeah. additional security. That'll follow them all the way down uh, the main road until they pass by the VAB here. Yeah, but it looks like they're rolling out now. Okay, some point. There you uh, go. And we have the onboard cameras there. I wonder if this oh, is from excellent. the front. Uh, I, I can't work out if this is from one of the uh, uh, what looks like one of the Chevys here or the or the front Tesla. Um, but we have a uh, onboard camera here following them down through the Kennedy Space Center, um, and they just they 
Uh, there's no one else about, so they're allowed to blast through that stop sign. They won't get in trouble for that. They've also got the sirens on. And it looks as if the KSC helicopter is also up there in the in the top yep. right as well, keeping yeah, an look eye on that. everything. There it is. Schedule. And, and there's uh, a potential that yeah. maybe they have a NASA TV camera on there, so we'll see. But oh, again, it's also important to note that these are just normal employee roads. It's not like it's a special path or anything. This is yep. literally the road that normal NASA employees take to get here, the same road that I took to get here. It's yeah. so, But they obviously shut it all down for them. Mm-hmm. And as the uh, crew uh, uh, now start to uh, roll out to the pad, EJ, do you want to give us a quick rundown of uh, who's actually on board Crew 7? We've been promising it all evening, so it uh, <laughs> seems only fair we finally get through the roster of who's aboard uh, uh, Crew Dragon Endurance. So we have four souls flying tonight, hopefully. Um, we have three astronauts and a Russian cosmonaut. The commander of this mission is Jasmine Mogbelli. Jasmine Mogbelli is actually, this is going to be her first time flying. Uh, she was part of the NASA astronaut class, I believe, in uh, NASA astronaut group 22, so in 2017. Uh, this is her first time flying. She's the commander of the mission. And before that, she was, was, a, was a Marine Corps aviator with 150 overseas combat missions, flying uh, H-1 Super Cobras. So definitely somebody you want to be commanding an overall mission like this. I, could, I think that... Uh, Kind of speaks for itself. Oh, and then you know, after that, she just went to MIT. You know, you know, as one does, right? As you do, just, as you do. Yeah, right. So the pilot on this mission is ESA astronaut Andreas Morgan. Andreas Morgan, uh, he's flown to the ISS before. He flew on TMA fifteen uh, for a brief ten day stay in, or no, it was TMA eighteen, I think yeah, TM TMA 18M and then flew back down on TMA 16M. That was the Soyuz flight in 2016, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, he's the pilot on the mission. He was selected by the European Space Agency in May of 2009 and be completed initial training in 2010. So he's 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 been doing this for a little while. He is from uh, Denmark too, which is actually pretty cool. He got bringing that bringing that Viking energy from Copenhagen right there. So, uh, rounding up the last two spots, we have two mission specialists. One is Satoshi Furukawa uh, from the Japanese Space Agency. Satoshi Furukawa uh, became an astronaut in 1999 when, actually, believe it or not, you know, JAXA is Japan's space agency right now, the Japanese Exploration Agency. Before that, it was the NASDA, basically that same thing, but with, Japanese, with a Japanese acronym. I'm not even going to sit here and try to speak Japanese, so <laughs> I, I will make a fool of myself, so we're not going to do that. But he has uh, flown to space as well on the Soyuz TMA-02 mission. Uh, and then, rounding up Mission Specialist 2 slot, we have Konstantin Borisov, who's a Russian Roscosmos cosmonaut. Uh, he became a cosmonaut in 2018 and qualified for flight in 2020 and this is his first flight so we have two on here that have never flown before the commander and mission specialist too and there's the shot from that helicopter that Sawyer was talking about and as the uh, crew now rolled down um Sawyer, you're familiar with the area Do, uh, whereabouts are they now uh looks like they are on one of the main roadways going into the kennedy space center uh there is a portion uh, that's kind of near where the visitor complex is, and then there's a turn onto that main road uh, from the causeway. It looks like they are coming from about that direction. We should be seeing them there shortly. And then it's a straight ride, and then you hang a right turn at the VAB. So uh, I, they shouldn't miss their turn. I believe they're coming up Kennedy Parkway, I think, off the causeway. That is the name Kennedy. of the road. Yep. 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 Cool. And this, uh, this may actually be from the, the VAB roof. Um, yep. because I believe there's a pole in the middle of the shop there as well, which doesn't seem to be moving. Yep. Um, the chopper is visible, by the way, from the uh, press site now. Just want to point that out. So they should be making the turn here actually pretty soon. Okay. And they're kind of concealed by trees now, unfortunately, but fingers crossed we'll get eyes on them again very shortly. They're pretty easy to see, uh, especially at night with, uh, with, with, the, uh, with the, 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 uh, the red and blue lights flashing there on the, on the convoy as they roll down towards the VAB currently. And in the middle there, looking very cool, stealth black at night with the, 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 the three Teslas there with the crew on board. 
as they roll down towards the VAB. Um, they, they, in in their own way, they stand out and they look pretty cool there with the with the headlights on and and the, and, and the blacked out uh, color scheme because that's all you, it's all you can really see. Except for in person, because then it's at night and it's black and it's harder to see. From the from from this from this view, it looks cool. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, certainly. Uh, and you can see the uh, the uh, the two other convoy or two of the other convoy vehicles there, leading them in front, uh, directly in front and directly behind. There's some other vehicles further ahead and further behind there of the three Teslas as they continue to roll down. And I believe they'll be turning right very shortly towards yep. the VAB. Right now, yeah, the what, uh, front of the blockade ahead. just is setting up to shut down roads right here. So the front of the motorcade of the uh, of the astronaut cade, I guess, just turned. There we go. Yep, and they're now turning right uh, down towards the VAB. There, as you can see, uh, the convoy snaking its way around there. And uh, fingers crossed, they'll be coming up by our cameras very shortly. Yep. And um, briefly obscured behind this building. That's and, Operation uh, but there we go. Support Building One, OSB One. Here they go. Here they come. Uh, rolling down towards uh, the uh, towards the press site. Uh, look out for the, the the three vehicles without without the blues and twos. Those will be the Teslas there. Briefly, we just witnessed them before hiding behind the signs. Uh, we'll see them again. See them again in a moment. Here they come, and um, again uh, inside of there, along with the onboard view on the left. Inside of there is all four crew members of Crew Seven: Jasmine, Andreas, uh, Satoshi. And Constantine, they're all inside of those Teslas there, and uh, it'll be the uh, the commander and the pilot in the middle Tesla, I believe, and the mission specialists in the rear, as they currently snake their way around, and they pass by the VAB very shortly here. They are they they they're going at a pretty good speed here, uh, getting to the pad uh, in good time. There's the VAB, and there, there go the Tesla. Yeah, baby, and in front of it is the launch control center, the LCC, right there. And the press site is on the south side of this road here next to Operations and Support Building 2. OSB 2 is usually, it's behind the press site. That's usually where all the NASA bigwigs watch the launches. That's uh, right behind where this camera is right here. I appreciate the road close beyond 39A sign that is up, except <laughs> these guys blowing right through it. Yeah. <laughs> and there you go. And there, I, now, um, great shot. And I would like to point pad. out, I'm being one of the cheesy ones that waved to them as they drove by, so... Nah, I'd do the same thing, man. Absolutely. I'm sure they appreciate a nice final wave before they board the... before they board the board the vehicle towards the ISS. It's a, it's a, it's a six-month journey, so, you know, fi fi final eye-to-eyes -eyes with humans as you roll down towards the pad. And uh, this, again, I believe, from the VAB roof as uh, the, the convoy rolls out towards 39A. They will be rolling alongside the crawl away pretty shortly if they're not already it's kind of hard to see because um uh they are okay cool because th there's no uh, unsurprisingly there's no street lights along, along the crawl away so um it's pretty hard to see without the headlights um uh, but there you go you can see on the left there that's the pads that little faint speck in the distance that's the pad that'll be getting bigger and bigger pretty shortly as the convoy continues to roll down towards launch complex 39a uh where crew 7 will be launching in just over three hours time I made for reference here. You can see the um, the wooden post. Uh, there was the wooden post on the left that we saw. That was uh, what's holding up the river rock that's on the crawler way. Uh, and shortly after, it will actually fork into two. The left one is to 39B, which is where the crawler and mobile launcher one are currently. And then the other one goes to 39A, although it's not used since that portion of the crawler way is blocked by the HIF, the Horizontal Integration Facility, or that big building with SpaceX written on the side. Yeah, sounds good. And I believe that fork is now coming up, actually, because they're rolling around to the right now. Uh, so, so make the turn for 39A. The paved road goes to the right and the crawler way goes to the left. What they're driving around right there is the former site where the Apollo mobile service structure used to used to hang around. Hey, that's that hasn't been there for a long time, but they kept the road. 
Sounds good. And um, yeah. I believe Falcon 9 boosters also make their way this way. If you're ever watching on Space Coast yeah. Live and you see the boosters rolling out, they um, they uh, from uh, Roberts Road, I believe, they, 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 they roll down this way as well. So uh, it's, a, it's a very versatile road used for multiple purposes. Crew rollout, booster rollout, and uh, I guess second stage rollout and payload fairing rollout as well. Um, Can't confirm Falcon the one I got stuck behind today did that exact route. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> very cool. And um, I believe Falcon, Falcon Heavy stuff will also come down this way, but um, not not as a triple core. It'll come down in single cores and then get stuck together, as it were, in the horizontal integration facility, uh, which we'll be looking at shortly. And um, as they now are on the final home stretch now, down to 39A, Mm-hmm. And um, I, I believe uh, it looks as if they may be. I don't know whether this is just the perspective of our camera here on the VAB roof, uh, or if it will just be the um, crew slowing the the vehicle slowing down slightly. Um, but they are still making progress towards 39A. And I believe as they approach the gate fence, uh, not the pad gate rather, uh, the the pad fence, the uh, the vehicles with the lights on them will uh, will pull over, and the, the, just the Teslas will continue up up the, uh, yep. the, the the concrete ramp there, up towards the base of the tower at 39A. Uh, from there, the crew will uh, get out of the Teslas, lean back, look up at the vehicle, and then very briefly... Ready for crew arrival. We are on schedule. Will, uh, ...walk towards the elevator and uh, take that all the way up to their ride to space. So... Ryan, you were talking about the gate that they have to go through. That that gate has a name. The gate, the name of the gate is the Blast Detonation Area. I don't think I need to explain that one, but it's basically the outer perimeter for 39A. That gate marks yeah. the BDA, which, yeah, let's not talk about that. But that is basically the final checkpoint going up in there. The, the support crews that aren't going to be assisting the crew with ingress operations into the dragon capsule will stop here uh, it, when we can't see the bda gate it's behind the the big building that sawyer said has spacex on it it's behind the horizontal integration facility that's that's the building where they actually put the rocket together hor- horizontally I, I don't know if you could tell from the name it's a it's a very clever yeah. name but they're <laughs> inside of the bda now rolling up to the pad there we go yeah, they just emerged from behind the uh, the, the hiff, and they're now rolling up the uh, uh, the ramp there towards the pad. And very shortly on the left, you'll see a massive Falcon 9 with Crew Dragon Endurance stacked atop. There it is. And the other... Uh, oh, actually, no, that's not it. That's the Starship Launch Tower. Uh, next up will be <laughs> the... Uh, that's the that's the big new tank there. Then we've got some yep. lights. Fingers crossed we'll get the Falcon 9 shortly. Just a little bit further. Come on. We'll be coming in on the left side of the Come screen. On. They're they're going up the right hand side here. They'll go, there we go. go across over the crawler way or X crawler way, and there it is. There, no, there you go. There's that left turn, and uh, they'll uh, make their way to the base of the uh, the black and white tower there on the left mm-hmm. side, and uh, just uh, slightly hiding behind uh, what looks like uh, part of the former rotating service structure from the shuttle days. That's the Falcon Nine with the strong back. And um, yeah. that's what they'll be. Uh, that's what will be taking them to the ISS in about three hours' time. Yeah, that that gigantic um, uh, dark tube that's right. That's kind of obstructing our view to the actual rocket is the kingpin from the fixed service structure, Ryan. Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. That's the that is that's the basically the swivel hinge that moved a gigantic like service structure in there to be able to vertically integrate payloads into the shuttle payload bay. And uh, fingers crossed, the Teslas will. Um come to a halt pretty shortly well um, the first the first thing that they're going to do is actually drive past the rocket and go over to the porta potty yep that's that's what they're doing now the first thing they do when they get to the pad is make sure that everybody has emptied waste fluid you do not want that to i mean they're going to be sitting in that rocket for a good while now you don't you want to i mean more on countdown does have, have arrived at the pad on, on schedule restaurant. but in the time that when they can the you know the fasten seatbelt turns off fasten seatbelt sign turns off on dragon and now is a little bit of time here so make sure you know you do your thing yeah several hours because considering we're now just under t minus three hours and then they've got to launch and then they've got to take the suits off uh, you know is uh, and before that they've got to take the they've got to unstrap themselves from the seats it's a it's a little process before they can um before they can relieve themselves so it's better to get that done now um, yep. than later. So fingers crossed very shortly we'll see the crew uh, make their way to the base of the tower and uh, we'll keep our eyes out for that. Very quickly before that though, I'm going to go through a little bit more support we've been getting over the last few minutes here. And uh, first of all from uh, uh, Musical Wolves asking what do all the plates say? Uh, I believe it's by 
uh, which is uh, it has many E's on the end. It's seven characters long for Cree 7. And uh, Rob, thanks very much for the support here as well. Uh, we also have Cethia with uh, an Australian five uh, dollars. Uh, thanks very much for that. Uh, Bruce as well uh, with a store message. Uh, thanks very much for purchasing off the store over at shop.nasaspacefly.com. You got yourself a hat. And also Mark, thanks very much for the ten dollar super chat there as well. And asking if the Teslas, if the Teslas use full self driving to get to the pad, I believe uh, they are manually driven. Yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> You're correct. <laughs> And uh, we are still waiting for the crew to emerge towards the base of the tower. Uh, so quickly, I'm going to uh, look for some more questions. Uh, Space Wolf is asking, uh, how different are these pressure suits from the EVA suits intended for Polaris? Uh, well, Sawyer, I believe we haven't really we haven't really seen any of the EVA suits uh, as of yet. We've just been kind of getting a uh, little hints here from uh, from Jared Isaacman on Twitter. <laughs> Right. Uh, SpaceX hasn't officially revealed what it looks like, uh, if it'll be very similar to what you're seeing now with these suits. I can say, though, it is very different from what we're typically used to seeing, say, for an ISS spacewalk, at least from the U.S. side. Uh, those EVA extravehicular activity suits are about 16 layers thick. Uh, they're fully pressurized as well, but uh, typically even to a slightly higher pressure. Uh, those also come with drinking caps and uh, additional communications headsets uh, that they can activate just by talking. And so those are a lot more advanced. These are kind of meant to be your emergency spacecraft to go in the event something happens for a short period of time, whereas the uh, ISS spacewalk suits are meant to be your spacecraft for hours and hours. Sounds cool. Jack, and, Jack's uh, in chat there. He says, it's almost Kindar time, baby. That's right. Uh, Jack Byer, I got you, man. again. Um, I'm, I don't recognize that name, unfortunately. Nope. <laughs> I, I'm not sure No, I can so. idea what you're talking about. Absolutely, yeah. No, just just some... So uh, some some random guy called Jack by there, to, yeah, uh, yeah, Jack. We uh, we didn't answer your question either. Uh, River Dave Kenny is asking, uh, EJ. I'll throw this one to you. Uh, why okay. doesn't thirty nine A have four lightning towers? It just it just kind of has the one with some Y's coming down from it. Well, thirty nine A was supposed to have was supposed to eventually have three towers installed on it, uh, like thirty nine B does right now. Um, that plan was part of Constellation, which didn't happen. Uh, so they just outfitted 39B with three lightning towers. Now, why does 39B have three lightning towers? Well, it's commodity lines, commodity and propellant lines get in the way. Uh, there's only so many places that you can put lightning towers down uh, on a complex 39 style pad. I mean, on one side, you have the big gigantic ramp where the crawler comes up. On the other side, you have commodity feed lines for, you know, 39B, it's liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. And for 39A, it's kerosene and liquid oxygen because falcon 9 uses a little bit different propellants uh and then sound suppression pipes and uh what else is in there electrical power to the pad basically those are all in places that doesn't really warrant a symmetrical lightning tower configuration so there's two on the left side of 39b and one on the right side 39a though is still kind of basically the the, the fixed service structure there is i mean for the most part it's kind of still in shuttle configuration there albeit with some hot rotting done to it there uh for for falcon 9 and dragon but that lightning tower basically is in the configuration that it was in during the shuttle program that was good and in the shot there, there you can see go. a brief lean back i believe that is the first two up uh, jasmine and andreas they were leaning back looking at the There's falcon the lean. They, are now, they are now nice. walking towards the know. I was going to say, sorry, for those who don't know, that dates all the way back to uh, Alan Shepard when he went out to his Mercury Redstone rocket. He, holding on to his uh, pack to supply suit and everything, did that exact lean back and looked up at his ride to space. So ever since then, uh, it's become a tradition, especially with these uh, Falcon Crew Dragon missions, to do this lean back and look up at your vehicle before you head up the elevator to the crew level. Mm hmm and uh, the two crew members just boarded in the uh, the, the right lift there, and then they will now be, um, I assume, pressing a button and being taken up to the uh, boarding floor in the tower, which is right up near the top. Not the tippity top, but uh, relatively close to the top, much higher than the than the access arm for the the space shuttle was. I should yeah. point out they've updated that elevator so that now the uh, the button that they use says space. 
Yeah, that's pretty cool. I like that. Pretty descriptive, pretty easy to understand. So actually a little bit of a fun fact, when the when the other two uh, crew members get up to the elevator, you'll note that on the top of the elevator, there's a numeric, there, there's a number. That number doesn't indicate like floor one, two, three, four, and five. On the fixed service structure, the floor height is measured in feet. Now I know, I know, I know some people in feet, like, oh, feet, what, what do you mean? Like, where's the meters? But yeah, it, it's been there for a long time. So it's it's actually measured in feet. So if you see the elevator say like 255, that means it's on level 255, which is towards the very top. And you can see the ninjas now walking up mm -hmm. as well. Including Anne McLean, number 21 was there as well. Oh yeah. And you can really see now um, your point that you made earlier, EJ, the, uh, the, 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 the ninjas are really sealed up. I mean, all they have yep. exposed is their eyes because you want to minimize any opportunity for foreign object debris to get stuck in seals or inside the spacecraft or hatches. Yep. Or you just want to minimize all of those opportunities. And uh, by covering everything up that you don't need, apart from your eyes, um, I mean, that's the, that's the best way you can do it. So you'll note that only their eyes are exposed. They've got, um, they've got their hair, they've got their... Their, their ears, their noses, and their mouths all covered up as well, and it believes I believe they are now getting hooked up to some uh, some of that um, air circulation is there as well with the uh, with the umbilicals there as well. That uh, Andreas getting hooked up there. I wonder if Jasmine will get hooked up as well uh, shortly. Well, what Jasmine is doing right now is, believe it or not, just to the right of that NASA Worm logo, Worm Gang. Just to the right of that sign, uh, this is a tradition that also goes back a good while. Uh, making one final phone call before they launch into space. Jasmine is currently calling, I, don't, I mean, who knows, friends, family, significant others? We don't know. But they are afforded a phone call right before they walk into a very fond critical area, which is called the White Room. The White Room is inside of the crew access arm, and you have to be very careful about contaminants. Sawyer, you were talking a little bit earlier uh, about, you know, FOD or foreign object debris getting inside uh, certain parts of Dragon and something as, as small and as tiny as a human hair can actually make it so the hatch doesn't seal correctly. That's a problem they had on a previous Dragon mission. There was a little bit of human hair that was stuck between the inflatable seal and the flange on the hatch. And I don't think I need to tell you guys why a leaking spacecraft is probably not a good thing. It's pretty self-explanatory. It's the, yeah, the, I mean, these fine. things need to be sealed up as, as as much as possible because, of course, they are the, that that dragon capsule there at the back of your shot through the through the railings is 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 going to be pressurized against the vacuum of space, pretty much. So, you need to be sealed up as tightly as possible. I think it's also worth pointing out here that you see those uh, arrows kind of on the ground. Uh, part of that is, in the event of an emergency, the ways to get out of there and for the crew uh the main way that they get out of there if something goes wrong is that the crew access arm can swing back in less than 30 seconds to reattach and then they would leave out following the arrows get into special slide baskets and those slide baskets will slide down ropes that take them as far away as they can from the uh from the launch pad in the event of something going wrong Yep, slide wire baskets. Like you said, that's left over from the shuttle program. SpaceX just lifted it up a couple of floors. <laughs> and I believe that's Andreas there on the phone at the back. Um, mm -hmm. Just trying to see there. That's Jasmine there on the right, just leaning over there. <laughs> leaning over the railing there, looking down. Um, yeah. That would probably make me feel a little bit uneasy. And the other two crew members here, Mission Specialist 1 and 2, uh, that is uh, Satoshi and uh, Constantine. They do the lean back now. As they yeah. peer up hey, at their right. space. <laughs> They're having a little bit of a longer look than the pilot and the commander did. Uh, nothing wrong with that. Uh, it, Constantine, oh, they're going for the, the, the second lean back there as well. Final wave to the cameras as they now wander towards the lift as well. They're taking what looks to be the left lift up towards the uh, yep. boarding level. And uh, ninjas are already waiting for them in there as well. Wonderful dragon decal at the back of the lift there. And um, a sign there reminding you that this is a FOD critical area. Um, once again, a reminder that um, you need to be as sealed up as possible. For an object debris, it's not something we want to be playing with. Nope. And then the elevator indicators too. The right lift, that the right elevator that the first two crew members took is on level 255. That's 255 feet straight up. Uh, for the metric folks, that's, I don't know. What do you guys think? Like, you know, it's like 70, 80 meters. It's a good ways up there. 
and it looks like we're actually getting a, the, the, the NASA logo being signed now, yep. uh, first by Jasmine Mogali. This is a, a, a tradition that uh, they've been running. So all the NASA missions signed by the NASA logo and all of the non-NASA missions, uh, all the private missions rather, signed by the SpaceX logo. And uh, Andreas is uh, going to be signing his name there as well. Yeah, that's a relatively new tradition. That's not one that's brought back from shuttle. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a it's a good tradition though. I do like I do enjoy that tradition. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other two crew members there. First of all, Constantine walking down the corridor, and shortly being followed uh, uh, by Satoshi. Uh, looks as if they're just uh, getting the, uh, uh, the the final bits of protective sealing uh, 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 unwrapped and, and such to make sure. Again, just to minimize any possibility of foreign object debris getting inside of the Crew Dragon capsule. So there you go. They'll be uh, walking up the stairs shortly, uh, past level 255, I believe that is. Yep. Fingers They're crossed we we'll get an eye. Yep. Yeah, exactly. They're on 255, and the Crew Access Arm is actually on a floor, uh, an intermediate Core, floor above crew ingress has started. Okay. Crew and Ingress that, has started. The, that's the net confirming that from SpaceX. And there you go, Jasmine's already on board, uh, getting positioned in her seat, and Andreas is now walking it through the hatch as well. These seats are actually rotated to make it easier for them to get into the spacecraft, and then once everyone's in and everything's closed up, they will rotate into a launch position. Sounds good. And the... Uh, it looks like the camera operator's been left lonely for a short while whilst we wait for the rest of the crew members to join... Uh, Jasmine and uh, Andreas inside of uh, uh, first of all, the white room to sign the wall with black and curtains. then to and then to join the uh, <laughs> to join the to join the, the, the crew inside <laughs> of Dragon. Uh, as the helicopter whips by in the back of the shot, I'm going to quickly toss it over to uh, a way that you can support us, known as shop .com. If you are a Spaceflight fan and you want some merch, then the shop is pretty much the best way to support us if that is something you're after. Uh, we also have a specific human spaceflight collection here. Uh, it looks like they currently have a, a, a savings on offer now, $25 each for the, for the uh, different items here. Human spaceflight with a little dragon there. Uh, looks as if it's the inspiration for dragon there uh, with, the, um, uh, with, the, with the dome there in place of the docking port. The cupola. The, the, the cupola, thanks Sawyer. And um, oh, Patrick's got many things in, it, in his cart there from all of the different merch plugs. Uh, what's he going to write now? Okay, here we go. What's Patrick going to write? Go, I'm going to... Go Dragon. Okay, it's not... A, it, Patrick hasn't taken any of Sawyer's pun tokens, but if you wish to take one of Sawyer's pun tokens and do <laughs> the pun from a store message, you can do so by going over to shop.nasaspacewhite.com and when you get to the checkout, you can check that box there. Um, when it says we're live, you can check the box and leave a message for us either with your name or anonymously. Um, either, either options exist, so there you go. You can you can uh, do that all. Shop.nasaspacewhite.com Fingers crossed we'll see some t-shirts and, and patches and mouse pads coming through shortly. Yeah, two things. One, you, you can also give me pun tokens. Um, but uh, secondly, I'm actually wearing the Human Space Flight shirt right now. So hopefully it's good luck and hopefully it'll be good luck for the people that get it as well. Don't give him pun tokens, chat, please. The, please don't do that. <laughs> the day's going to come well, when we need an official <laughs> agent spreadsheet to track the pun tokens. <laughs> well, I know there's the uh, pun token emoji, I believe. So, Oh, dear. Oh, and Jack yeah. spamming it. Lovely. Jack Byer, who I've never Thanks. heard of before, is, is spamming Thanks, man. it now in chat. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. I believe in the background there, I'm trying to squint at the flag. I believe that's Constantine about to get on the phone. I think the ninjas are helping dialing the phone there for Constantine. Uh, uh, there you go. The phone's been taken off and it's now being handed to the Eros Cosmos cosmonaut. And uh, final calls to her friends and or family. Um, Sawyer, do we know if they get to call multiple people or if they just get one number to, to call up? Because you know they they all, they they want it. They want to say goodbye, but they also you know need to hurry up and get on board the on board the spacecraft. 
Right. Traditionally, it's one phone call. And uh, again, it's their kind of last phone call from Earth. But as you mentioned, they are still on the timeline. So uh, they keep an eye on the timing. They still give them a little bit of time with their family or friends or loved one, whoever they call. But um, yeah, I believe it's just one call. You think they get charged long distance, especially if Satoshi and Constantine need to make a phone call? Minus one pun token. Uh, well, that wasn't a pun. Oh, whatever. <laughs> and we got a wave there from Constantine at the back there as well. Another wave down the down down the other corridor from the cosmonaut on the phone there. Um, the 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 cable seems to have been coiled, kind of tangled up there a little bit. So um, maybe that's why they're having some issues with it as well. Um, and they've hung up now and put the phone back on the on the on the. What is it? What's the what's the word? Phone holder. I'm not sure if there's an official word for that. I'm on the hook. Uh, unfor- <laughs> on, I'm, the unfor- unfortunately, I'm from the age where um, I don't have a landline. I just I, an old landline. I just have a mobile, so I don't know the the official you know hang up clunking yeah, hang, hang procedure. Up. I don't know the. Uh, Back in my day, if you didn't want to talk to someone, you would literally, it's called taking the phone off the hook, where you would take it off and just yeah. set it on the counter so that way no one could call in and they just get a busy signal. So it's the hook. Oh, boy. And the Brian. curtain has been pulled back, and the crew are now walking down the uh, the crew access arm. Here they go. Here Fingers crossed we'll get the shot from the other side. There we go. And... um What's that green flashing light? I, is that an emergency exit sign? I'm not sure. But uh, that's anyways, the chopper uh, flying by. No, no it's, it's not in the back of the CAA. It... Yeah. Oh, okay. So you're talking it's about through the window the there because the chopper was flying right by at that moment. Yeah, there's some green flashing light at the back. Here we um, go. And there's also one at the other end. But there you go. Waves and smiles from Constantine. Uh, Con- it looks like Constantine's hey. forgotten something, so he, he he's wandering back. <laughs> oh, um, I need that. Bye. Ah. <laughs> uh, Oh, the patches! He needed the patches from the from the um, from the ninjas. That's a tradition, no. I believe, dating back to to, to yep. shuttle. Yep, that's so a tradition. That... You all for your pad support. Your pers- like the people that have been supporting the astronauts and cosmonauts. They take the patches. Good luck. Take it all the way into space. Uh, Satoshi. Yeah. Sorry, Satoshi Furukawa. Uh, signs the uh, just outside the NASA logo. They're soon going to wrap all the way around that logo. They're throwing, uh, throwing so many NASA people into space and Constantine awkwardly bending over trying to get his name in there as well, uh, which it seems to be able to doing just fine. So and, um, it looks... if you notice there, you, there's a NASA logo and then there's a SpaceX logo. The difference there is that obviously NASA has, the, the NASA logo has the NASA astronaut signatures on it, but we do also have on the on the SpaceX sign the commercial missions that SpaceX has launched with Dragon. So you'd have Inspiration Four over there, Axiom One, and Axiom Two, and those are the signatures on the right hand side of the crew access arm. The NASA signatures and all the DM Two and the seven crew missions now have the signatures over the NASA logo on the left. And very briefly there, if you paused at just the right time. You could see the patch, the, the names on the patches, and uh, uh, launch photographer from the Cape, Ben Cooper, who's been uh, taking photos of rockets for for many, many, many years, dating all the way back into the into the into the shuttle period. Uh, his patch is going up into space, so Ben Cooper's patch is going to be uh, loaded on board Dragon with the astronauts, which is which is pretty cool to see. To see um, not only the the the, the ground support staff uh, getting their patches flown, but also the photographers, because you know. Uh, uh, my, my position may be slightly biased, but the media's... Core on countdown. Um, seat 1 and seat 4 are beginning their ingress into Dragon. We are on schedule. There we go. And the Nets are saying that we're on schedule. Um, but yeah, the, the, the media is important to cover this, which is, you know, it's why we exist. To share this epic stuff with you all live, because it, it just, this is just so cool. Human spaceflight yeah. is just so cool. Crew launches are always, in my opinion, the biggest launches of the year, because we're sending actual people to the space station which is just yep. you know it's just bonkers to think about when you really put it into into perspective there it's just it, it really really awesome to see as it looks as if jasmine and andreas are getting comfortable there uh, they boarded first and uh, it looks as if they're I, I assume setting up with the touch screens ahead overhead rather and um the uh, the uh, astronaut uh, from jaxa and the cosmonaut from Rose cosmos uh, satoshi and constantine are uh, getting uh, suited uh not suited strapped in uh to the seats there uh on the left and right respectively 
Yep, they're gonna... also interesting to. Oh, sorry, I was yeah. going to say one interesting to note is they're also being connected basically yep. to the spacecraft by a single set of wires, a single tube yep. essentially. So that's providing them all of their air and air conditioning in some cases. But that's also what's bringing all of their communication lines. So when they start talking back uh, to the team in Mission Control, that will also be through the same line that's bringing them that air. Dude, you are a good expert. Nice. Thank you. It's one and done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, we seem to have lost that uh, dragon cam there uh, slightly. Uh, that is being provided by NASA. Um, but we always, there we go, it's back now, but we always have the pad cams to revert back to. Um, looking at this very skinny Falcon 9. I say skinny, it's like 3.7 meters wide, but it seems skinny um, compared to the, 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 the ratio of the, of the diameter to the, um, the height of the vehicle. It's a. Uh, uh, relatively a pretty skinny vehicle and it looks as well, if that's a, a mirror getting strapped mm -hmm. to the wrists i believe there that's what number 20 20 something i can't work that out unfortunately ninja on the right there is now putting a mirror i believe on uh one of the mission specialist's wrists yep so the mirror is there so you well it's a rearview mirror so you can look behind you the head the suit your head moves freely inside of the helmet you can't really look behind you so you have the mirror to be able to see if there's anything behind you. And Ryan, you were talking about, you know, Falcon 9 being so skinny. There's a reason why it's three point, it has a 3.7 meter core. The reason why, believe it or not, is so they can move Falcon 9 by truck. That's why Falcon 9 appears so skinny and so oblong. Because when they first engineered it, they wanted something that could move around by a, by a truck on U.S. highways rather than something that needed to be moved by a barge. Because that can support a higher flight rate when you just load it up onto a truck rather than loading onto a barge, which is going to take a couple months to get to the launch site. That's why Falcon 9 is so skinny. You've got to get this thing from California down to McGregor and then also across to the Cape. So yep. you need to be able to fit under all the bridges down all the interstates, uh, which is, um, you know, the U.S. interstate system is a pretty, pretty uh, well thought out design. Uh, yep. I would I would say probably one of the best road systems in the world coming from mm -hmm. a Brit. Um, uh, but yeah, it's uh, that's the reason for that design. Yep, it's the interstate system. Now to go down this tangent, it's a giant grid, and if you have now if you have a route that ends in a five, that's a road that goes north south, and if you have an interstate that ends in a zero, that goes east west. So yep, bottom, yeah, yeah, there you go. So in the bottom left hand corner of the U.S., if you're looking at it on a map in Los Angeles, you have five and ten, but on the top right of the United States in Boston, where I'm from, you have 90 and 95. They converge. And then everywhere in between is just a giant grid across the entire country. Fun little interstate. Very visible from space, there. that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there you go. As the crew are now uh, getting final uh, uh, checkouts and getting strapped in, you can see their work on the wrists. Those are the mirrors that EJ was just talking about getting, uh, getting hooked up onto uh, uh, the uh, wrists of Constantine on the left and Toshi on the right. And it uh, looks like we'll be getting final checkouts shortly uh, of the crew. Uh, next up, once the crew is all settled in and all uh, happy and sorted, and uh, and uh, 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 that's when we verify that the crew's okay and ready to go, uh, uh, we'll be getting a, a seat rotation uh, probably in about 20 minutes time approximately 20 minutes time and then at t-minus two hours that's when we expect the hatch to be closed but remember we've seen it before time redundancy is very well built into this countdown there's lots of spare time for things uh in case the the for example we've had it before where there was foreign object debris stuck in the hatch seal uh yep. which they had to clear out so that's why we have that time redundancy so in the event that some fods does get stuck in the hatch for example there's not really any rush. They can just open it back up again, wipe out the seal, and try and close the hatch again and, and pressurize the vehicle. So, you know, it's a, everything's designed in order for that redundancy. So uh, don't fear if, if something like that happens on, on this occasion. Fingers crossed it doesn't, but it's happened before and it's been dealt with very swiftly. So right now they're just doing final harness checks, final suit checks, make sure everybody's strapped in nice and good. Uh, if you notice the... Commander, Jasmine, and the pilot, Andres, have... Actually, all of them do, but you can see it on their left thigh. They have a, a, a tablet there. That's, that contains flight checklists. That's, that's what's on there. Uh, the bag underneath it, I think, is a first aid kit. I'm not 100% sure on that one, but the tablet basically is a redundant way to be able to go through the flight checklist. There's different sections to a crewed ascent, and I think, if I'm remembering right, we're on section three or section four. 
um, which is crew ingress. It's, it's, it's either one or the other. Five is suit checks and Kindar tones, and then six is priming the launch escape system, and then seven is the actual launch operations, if I am understanding that right. It c could be once removed from one number or the other. And I'll just quickly address it. Uh, running for the last few minutes in chat, somebody has started a poll uh, uh, on which the best NASA logo is. Uh, the, the NASA worm, the NASA meatball, or the um, the, uh, the, uh, the the fan-made NASA worm ball. Uh, unfortunately, at least from my opinion, the worm seems to be winning with nearly hey. half the votes. Um, nice. Personally, I believe the meatball is the best logo, but I'm not going to no. state anyone's opinions. You, Falcon 9 has both logos, okay? Yeah, yeah that's you fair. Can, you can, I was going to say, you can, yeah. You, if, you, if you like the worm, it's got worm. If you like the meatball, it's got meatball. So, you know, just... Everyone, everyone's requests have been satisfied. You know, I can. Except I can for Wormball, that will never happen. <laughs> Wormball will never happen. I can imagine a, a, a branding meeting being like, "Oh, should we include the meatball or the worm? Wait, oh, we can't decide the future branding for NASA. Why don't we use both?" And that's where we are today. I can just imagine that scenario in my head. And to be honest, I, it's not like, unlike some people and some opinions I've seen out there, I don't despise. The worm. I, I I like the worm. I like the logo, but I just prefer the meatball. You know, that's just yeah. That's just that's, just that's just my opinion. Everyone's entitled to their own opinions. I'm sure we'll have many different messages in in chat as we already do. I, it looks like some people are also vouching for the worm ball. Unfortunately, um. <laughs> oh. So it looks like we're seeing uh, final crew ingress operations here. It looks like the pad crews moved out, and unless they're in frame on the right hand side, but. Looks like we're getting ready to shut that hatch. First, though, we'll have the uh, the, the seats uh, uh, flip up. They'll be brought towards the touch screens there at the top, which you can just see the the, the bottom edge of, just behind the clock in the top left, uh, with the Crew Seven text as well. Uh, there you go, and that's what Andreas is currently prodding at. Yeah, and these, uh, by the way, they're very similar to the iPads and things that you'd be using at home, except a lot of these are radiation hardened to be able to withstand their time in space. Because uh, as they've learned the hard way early on, the radiation can do some serious damage to uh, basic home computers and tablets and things. Yeah, yeah, and I believe... In I, I can't remember if they still have it or not, but uh, especially around the time of DM2, SpaceX had a little dragon simulator on their website as well, which was cool. You could try and dock with the ISS using the, uh, an interface which closely resembles uh, the interface which is on board the actual Crew Dragon. And I believe we may have just had a little bit of a photo opportunity there with, uh, yep. uh, with the crew waving uh, down the hatch uh, towards uh, uh, the uh, a, a photographer, I assume, uh, in the hatch there uh, i believe we've also seen we've seen that shot many times before um i'm sure where we don't have it this time but uh, we still have eyes on the crew anyway okay copy dragon it's come stand by for umbilical comm check all right so they're going to do three different types of comm checks here one is through falcon 9 umbilicals on the pad the other one is through a ground tracking station and the other one the third way is through nasa's tracking data and relay systems cdr do this three times ms1 ms2 comm check Loud and clear, help me. Core, loud and clear. How's you loud and clear? How me? Core's got you loud and clear. This one has you loud and clear, how me? Core's got you loud and clear. So I have you loud and clear, how me? Core's got you loud and clear. Umbilical comm checks are complete. Report when ready for seat rotation. Dragon, so there you go. We just had the comm checks with the commander, the pilot, mission specialist one, and mission specialist two. And uh, we believe, I believe we just heard uh, Jasmine say uh, 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 Wilco, which is uh, basically radio slang for will comply. Um, so that means that Dragon will let uh, SpaceX Mission Control know when they're ready for these seats to be rotated, which we expect to see, I believe, uh, in about five-ish minutes, looking at the timeline. Uh, or actually, rather, 15 minutes. Here we go. All right now. Copy, Dragon. We will report when initiating. So, believe we're actually 15 minutes ahead of schedule here, roughly. 
Yep, there is yeah, a little bit of leeway. leeway. Yep. Ahead, and uh, interesting to point out the uh, the core. Uh, I believe that stands for the uh, crew operations resource engineer. That's basically their the one person that they used to talk back and forth to the crew inside the capsule, as opposed to every individual engineer talking to them about specific systems. So you'll hear them going back and forth with them. Uh, it used to be called Capcom, uh, but SpaceX and decided Dragon to change SpaceX it up. SpaceX initiating seat rotation. Okay, core. Core signaled for a crew rotation here. Jasmine has replied. We should see these seats rotate up here. And this is into their uh, launch position, which allows them to easily see and access the uh, touchscreen screens that are above them at the moment. Here we go. Up they go. Some final waves there from Constantine and Andreas. Let's As roll. the seats rotate into their final launch position. Uh, man, that's cool. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm geeking out. That's so cool. Yeah. I've, I've watched every one of these, dude. It's still cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Looks awesome. And actually, as they rotate up, you can see some of the uh, the, the, the cargo and goods that have been uh, uh, velcroed yeah. and strapped up uh, behind the seats there, down uh, from this perspective at the bottom. But of course, when they get to space, there's no up or down. Everything's, everything's equal when you're weightless. Well, yeah, so some of those supplies that they have down there, if you notice over at Jasmine and Andreas, you have, seem to have some kind of metal crates. Those are actually racks. Oh. Dragon SpaceX, seats are in the launch position. You are... Here we go. Or go for Section 2, suit lead check preparation. SpaceX Dragon Cappy, proceeding to Section 2, suit lead check preparation. Okay. They're going to do suit lead check, lead check. But as I was saying, down there, those metal cases are actually... They're actually racks that uh, that they can use. So the ISS has configurable, um, like basically sections. They're configurable shelves inside of the ISS, and that's what those racks are for. Some of them are plugged into umbilical power because they might need it. So you, the Dragon is actually powering some of those experiments. Those that, that thing, the racks could be anything from an oven to cook food to scientific experiments. It's actually really, really cool to see them down there. The ISS yeah. has this whole modular system built into it to be able to swap out stuff really, really quick inside of the modules. And it's by design. It's a, it's a, it's a good idea to have all of that set up. Yep, the whole because system. Because then you can modular. stuff. Yep. Even I mean, even the even the modules they're they're designed to be reconfigured. You can reattach them in every different ways using the modules' common berthing mechanism or CBM for short. Uh. I'm going to quickly run through a little bit of support here whilst we uh, uh, have a, a quick little bit of downtime whilst the crew's ahead of schedule. First of all, uh, Gareth uh, with the Super Chat. Thanks very much for that, Gareth. It's greatly appreciated. Are we doing a boost back burn tonight? It's coming back to landing zone one. So yeah, baby. yes, we are. Justin has become a Pad Rat member. Thanks very much for that. Uh, Roland has gifted one Red Team membership. And uh, Mark has been buying some stuff off the store. Uh, a couple of items here. And uh, saying, appreciate the detailed coverage of Crew 7, but you missed my Team Stubby and the Pun Token from Sawyer earlier. Uh, so, unfortunately, it seems like we have a Go Stubby and two Pun Tokens for Sawyer. Uh, looks like you've got the unisex sweatshirt there. Uh, and also, the uh, all the Concrete Get Way to Go sticker. Wonderful sticker there, reminiscing from uh, the first integrated flight test of Starship. So I'm also going to quickly uh, go through a few questions here. And uh, Brian, firstly, saying, do the ground support staff get their patches back uh, to keep when the astronauts return? Sawyer, do we know if the patches are returned or are they just uh, kept somewhere like in a cabinet on display? No, they're absolutely returned to them. That's part of a thank you for helping them as they literally grab the patches and take them to space and give it back to them as a space flown memento. Sounds good. And the leak checks are now underway with Dragon. Uh, uh, not Dragon, sorry, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the suits. By the way, EJ, you keep mentioning, and these are some of my favorites, the Kindar tones. What yep. are you talking about for the people I don't know? So Kindar tones are basically letting you know somebody's keying their mic on. It's kind of a classic thing in, in space. You hear the beep noise right before, uh, right before uh, communications happen. Uh, those Kindar tones are kind of like iconic, you know, from dating back all the way back to the early Mercury program, the early parts of the space program. They're just really cool to hear. Uh, 
And uh, they also have like a more, uh, what's the word here? It's kind of a, a, a slightly different tone for, for when the communications end, I believe. I don't know if they still have them on Dragon, but I believe they had them for Shuttle and uh, Saturn and such. Yeah, you'll hear yeah. those too. There's the higher pitch and the lower pitch. That's the different ones. And uh, it was interesting because the actual tones are very different from the ones from Shuttle and Apollo days. So I remember Demo 2 listening to it going, wait a minute, those sound different. Yeah. So <laughs> the little detail, but it's a part of spaceflight history. Yep. Let's hit this question from VSMG1 asking, do we know if any other crewed launches to the ISS that have had four people from different space agencies? EJ, I'll throw this one to you. Uh, I believe the only vehicles that could have done this is Dragon and the shuttle uh, because, you know, like Apollo, uh, could, that was all American, they could only launch three. Uh, uh, the shuttle launched up to seven, Dragon can launch up to four, Soyuz can only do three. I... I'm going to quickly look through here, but I don't believe we've had a Dragon mission with four different people from different space agencies before. No, I don't think I don't think four different. No, I don't think we've ever had that uh, in terms of any other missions that have carried four different people from four different space agencies. The shuttle, I, I'm pretty sure, did do it if and I could once again could be pulling this out of my tail completely. I think it was STS-88. I mean, Sawyer, I don't know if you know off the top of your head, but I know that I know that there were. Cosmonauts, astronauts, and uh, and I think a European astronaut and a Japanese astronaut on that mission. But I could be wrong. I know it's happened before. I just don't know which mission off the top of my head. ST STS eighty eight uh, actually mm -hmm. had uh, Bob Cabana on board uh, for yep. his last spaceflight as commander. Uh, but it was a uh, it was a um, it was just a uh, five Americans on board and a Russian uh, yeah. from uh, Rose Cosmos there. Yeah, um, it was. Uh, I'll have a quick crazy. flick through here, but I'm the, yep. I'm I'm not too sure. Yeah, but we'll try and figure out that answer then. for you. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. That was that dude. That's a really good question. To be honest with you, that's not something I'd have to go look it up. We'd need like a, you know, an Adrian spreadsheet for this kind of stuff. You yeah. Know? <laughs> I believe that the highest I've found so far is uh, three different space agencies on a flight, which uh, would have been. Uh, set by the shuttle uh, i believe and then or maybe set by soyuz i'm not sure on that uh, but certainly that has been matched by dragon but in terms of dragon flights this is the first flight that has four different people from different space agencies uh so yeah we've only had three different agencies on board yeah. before okay there you go an international crew for an international space station that sounds right to me spacex dragon we see four good suit we check Okay. Dragon, we copy and concur. Four good suit leak checks. Closeout team will be performing its final closeout steps. You are go to proceed to section four and report when ready to close the side hatch. Okay, section four, section side Dragon, hatch close. Also proceeding with section four, side hatch closure. Good copy from the crew. There you go. So all going as planned so far. As we count down to a launch, just over two hours, which is just over two hours and twenty minutes away now, and a wonderful shot here of the pad. Unfortunately, we're not going to get any sunlight from the uh, pad cameras here because uh, liftoff is scheduled to occur uh, many hours before sunrise. Uh, but we are, uh, uh, we will. Uh, fingers crossed if they if. Uh, NASA stick with the onboard cameras from Dragon. We'll see some sunlight as it launches into uh, towards the east uh, because that's the way the sun is rising. The sun's risen in Europe now. It's now slowly going to be making its way across the Atlantic. So fingers crossed we'll get some, uh, some sunlit views of Earth as Dragon heads up towards the International Space Station for today's Crew 7 mission. I could say at least in person, though, it makes it look like it's daylight here once it lifts off. So that's something. <laughs> Very Light briefly, it's sky. pretty bright. I I remember the shots from Artemis One, and just you know, it just it just absolutely incredible. It just shows how much pure energy is just getting released from those SRBs. It just lights up the entire island. It's just you know, it's absolutely mind-boggling to think about. Just okay. Copy, Dragon. Crew is ready for side hatch closure. At this time, we are also going to proceed into our pre-launch comm checks. Okay, 
The other two of the three comm checks here are going to happen. First one, once again, is going to be through ground tracking. And then the third one will be through the tracking NASA's tracking data and relay system, which are the relay satellites that NASA uses for constant communication with the ISS and any NASA missions that are um, below high Earth orbit or geosync. So we'll be standing by for that. Dragon, In SpaceX, a comm check. Here we go. SpaceX, Dragon has you loud and clear, help me. Core has you loud and clear. Tedris comm check is complete. Stand by for comm checks with DC, MD, and LD in the launch configuration. Dragon, DC, on countdown one, comm check. DC, Dragon, has you loud and clear, help me. DC, loud and clear, stand by for comm checks with MD. Dragon, MD on countdown one, comm check. MD, Dragon, has you loud and clear, help me. MD, loud and clear, stand by for comm check over Dragon to ground. Dragon, MD on Dragon to ground, comm check. MD, Dragon has you loud and clear, help me. MD, loud and clear. Stand by for comm checks with LD. Dragon, LD on countdown one, comm check. LD, Dragon has you loud and clear, help me. LD, loud and clear. Stand by for comm check over Dragon to ground. And very quickly, there goes and the hatch. Dragon, now, LD uh, on Dragon to ground, comm check getting inspected. Yep. They're doing a FOD LD, check with Dragon the lights. LD, loud and clear, help me. LD, loud and clear. Let's go fly. Let's do it. And Dragon SpaceX, launch configuration comm checks are complete. Dragon copy. So there you go, the comm checks are complete with Dragon and SpaceX Mission Control. The ninjas just swapped around for a final foreign object debris inspection of the crew seal before number two closes it up, ready for the vehicle to basically be on its own until launch. From there, the ninjas will vacate the white room there. Um, oh, it actually seems like they're putting the hatch back up, so maybe they just need to give the, the seal a little bit of a wipe over um, uh, just there. Um, we'll keep an eye out for what happens uh, but yeah once the seal's closed yeah, up yeah. the uh, ninjas will leave the leave the white room leave the uh, arm and then the arm will uh, fold back towards the tower mm -hmm. by the way for those wondering the uh, MD was the mission director LD was the launch director yep there you go and it seems as if Andreas uh, and uh, Jasmine are working on the touch screens there probably just running some checklists or things like that because this vehicle it, this isn't like virgin galactic this is not flown stick to space this is an autonomously flown vehicle uh so yeah fingers crossed no human intervention is needed it's possible if required on orbit uh, but in terms of the launch sequence this is entirely automated by the vehicle uh pre-programmed uh all the way up to orbit it's got to be pretty impressive for the teams that do all the coding and maintain all the servers and software for all of this stuff. I just got to say to have all those yeah. immense calculations going to keep the crew alive is always just shout out to the teams at SpaceX. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, rocket science so, is not easy. So Ryan, you were, you were actually talking about it. You're talking about how SpaceX had a docking simulator game. It's like a little video game that they put on their site right around the right around DM2. Yeah. An interesting thing to note is that you know what? You want to know where SpaceX gets their software engineers from for stuff like that? For the for the UX, for the capsule, and for for the design, for all, all the all the like kind of front end software on the capsule. They they poach people from game development companies. Seriously, SpaceX has showed up at the game developers conference pretty much every year for the last like I mean I don't know like 10, 15 years. The people that because video game developers are really good at working on UIs, right? So they, they poach people from GDC. They poach people from video game companies to get the UX work, which I always thought was really cool. I think that's really neat. 
What did you do before? Yeah. I just designed I designed video games. What do you do now? I design video games for spaceships, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I can't find it anymore. Uh so it may have been removed. But I do remember that that was indeed a thing I had much fun on during uh the uh kind of the DM two era of Dragon. Yeah, it was fun. Did you get it on the first try, Ryan? Don't lie. No. No, I didn't. Yeah, me neither. Second I did, time, but that was because of Space Shuttle Mission Simulator 2007. <laughs> oh. Yeah, okay, um, unlike fair. unlike it's Kerbal, different. the uh, the uh, docking ports were much less magnetic, so you know, just made it a little bit more difficult there. Yep, yep, yep. Center, uh, center. And whilst we're whilst <laughs> whilst All we're right. waiting for the crew hatch to close. Uh, uh, we mentioned it before, but we'll bring it up again. If you want to get yourselves some spaceflight swag, you know the place to go. Shop.nasaspaceflight.com. Uh, very apt for this mission, as we have an RTLS. Let's have a look at the launch entry landing collection of the nine Merlins igniting at launch, the three Merlins igniting at entry into the atmosphere. Uh, you can also get it on a mug, and then the single engine lighting for the final burn down to the pad. Uh, in this case, today, that'll be down to a landing zone one at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Uh, we also have it in, uh, look, it's got a sleeve tee and many other items of clothing uh, in multiple colours as well. So if you want to rep your support and uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, not, not fascination, your interest in Falcon 9 recovery, we have a design specifically for that over at shop.nasaspaceflight.com and I've been seeing many, many orders coming in with the merch messages uh, over the last uh, uh, couple of hours now that we've been live. Uh, so yeah, thanks everybody for the support. It is greatly appreciated and it uh, it definitely helps to keep 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 operations uh, going over here at NSF and uh, yeah, alongside all of, the, all of the supers and things like that. But of course, everybody tuning in just to watch, that's probably one of the most important ways of support there is because if nobody tuned in to watch, there wouldn't really be much point in doing these live streams and videos which you all seem to enjoy. Uh, so yeah, everybody who's ch tuned in and is continuing to tune in, thank you very much for your support. It is greatly appreciated. We love to see you all joining us for these launches, especially a crew launch at a ridiculous time of day in the US because, you know, it's just, it's just so exciting to see people go to space. Yeah, thank you for the support, everybody, especially folks over on Twitch too. I do appreciate it. We all do. It means a lot. Thank you for giving us your time. Even really the likes mean way. a lot, so thank you. Yeah. <laughs> The weather is reporting 95% still favourable for launch, so there's a very good chance that weather will not be a factor in uh, any kind of delay today. So uh, everything looking uh, bright and clear. Uh, Sawyer, you're down uh, at the Cape, joining us from the field. Uh, how's the weather from your location? Is it still clear, as Lon reported earlier? I may not have done a complete 360 of the sky when you mentioned that, just to check. Uh, yeah, I don't see a single <laughs> cloud in the sky. The stars are out and bright. There's a little bit of haze over by the pads, but other than that, uh, yeah, it's a gorgeous night here. Occasionally a light breeze, humid, like you would expect for Florida, but I don't see any weather issues at all from where I am. Sounds good, as we're now just coming up on two hours and 11 minutes to go until launch still plenty of time to go plenty of time to uh check things out if things aren't looking just right but as we've said multiple times now time redundancy is built into this countdown at every single opportunity so there's plenty of time to check things out in case anything doesn't go exactly to the second on schedule the only thing that really needs to go to the second on schedule is the final 60 seconds of the of the of the countdown here uh, that is when the, when the, and the vehicle controls that essentially so uh that's fully on automation uh, the crew will be fully secured and ready at that point so pretty much no human intervention uh, that can uh, uh, get in the way of that. And um, if you just saw the, the clock there, stop for a second. Don't fear. There's no hold. We're still going. Uh, the, the clock is still ticking. That, that feed just seems to have frozen there. Uh, and Musical Wolves asking alongside a uh, 499 Super Chat. Thanks very much for that. How often are the relay satellites for the ISS launched? Uh, now, Sawyer, I believe that's the T-Dress Musical Wolves is, is talking about. Are they still launching those or, or is the deployment of that uh, constellation complete? Uh, they've been occasionally launching upgraded TDRS satellites. Uh, the original network was launched by the Space Shuttle, uh, but now they use uh, other rockets like Atlas. 
So uh, it's constantly being upgraded, and uh, yeah, it's not just used for the ISS. As mentioned, it's for a bunch of other crew capsules and uh, other satellites and uh, telescopes and things in space that have access to it. So not only do they use Tedris for anything that's below geosynchronous, they they do use Tedris to relay information between the deep space network tracking sites that are actually ground side. There's three deep space network tracking stations around the world in Madrid, Spain, Canberra, Australia, and Goldstone, California. Those are designed for getting, those are big like 70 meter antennas. They're designed for talking to Voyager 1 and 2, which are way out of the solar system. But those things actually have smaller smaller relay dishes that can bounce stuff off Tedris back to NASA. So, you know, if, if Voyager 2, if, if the Canberra tracking site is pointed at Voyager 2, obviously, U.S. on the other side of the world, can't see it, there's an Earth in the way, they can bounce the signal off Tedris back to Houston or back to wherever they need to. I love that. There's an Earth in the way. There's, it's true. <laughs> I mean, it's not wrong. It's not wrong. Uh, Blackhawk, thanks very much for gifting five Red Team memberships. Uh, if you receive one of them, make sure to give them a little thanks in chat. Uh, and talking of chat, if you have a question, tag us in chat at NASA Spaceflight. That brings it into the queue. We queue them all up and we answer as many as we can. Uh, of course, realistically, we can't answer every single question because we also have a launch to watch tonight. Uh, so, um, uh, sorry if we don't get to your specific question, but we try and get to as many as possible. So it's always worth a try. Tag us in chat at NASA Spaceflight. We'll do our best to answer them. Uh, I'm going to hit this question uh, here from Ozzy. Asking, will the crew... The closeout team is taking its final steps in preparation for side hatch closure. Stand by for transition to pad hatch closed. Ensure that all items are secure from now through launch. SpaceX Dragon copies. All items are secure. Please make sure your tray and seat back is in the upright and locked position. That's essentially what that message means there from Mission <laughs> Control. Uh, back to this question, though, EJ, quickly uh, yep. asking, will the crew be able to walk when they return after six months? Now, we, we, we see them get support uh, getting out of the Dragon, uh, but I believe they usually adapt relatively quickly. So, yeah, they, it... It, you do take some time to adapt, but the, actually one of the first things they do after the crew egresses out of a recovered Dragon capsule out on SpaceX's recovery vessels, the, actually the first thing they do is have a PMC, a private medical conference with their flight surgeon. Every astronaut and cosmonaut has their own personal doctor that's watching them. They have their own personal physician, just like you, you and everybody else has their own doctor, right? And that's actually the first thing that they do. You actually kind of want to take it easy when you've been up there for six months. The reason why is because when you come back down and you, you if you start walking around, well, your, your heart's not used to using all those muscles down there, uh, especially for walking around because you haven't been in gravity. It's really easy to get muscle atrophy up there. I mean, when they're up on the ISS, they do work out. There's mandatory workout. You have to hit the gym every day and you better not skip leg day, man. You have to stay up there to make sure you don't get muscle atrophy. But even then, even after all that, you still can you can still can basically get your heart racing. Your heart's racing like crazy to to pump all that blood to use all those muscles that you haven't used before. So you got to kind of take it easy when you get back down. But I've heard astronauts say that it you know it takes like maybe a week to kind of readapt. But you you got to kind of take it easy. You don't want to. Well, I mean, what will happen is you know your heart starts going really really fast, and if the ticker goes red line, then you you have a you're gonna have a bad day. So that's why one of the first things that they do is see the doctor right away to make sure that they're okay. And that hatch is now being firmly closed by three ninjas there, it looks like, uh, making sure that's yep. all sealed up. So what, they're gonna, what they did there was a FOD inspection on the uh, metal flange on the capsule. So that metal flange will meet up with a pneumatic seal. Right now, what they're doing is torquing the capsule down, torquing a bolt basically on, on the hatch there to make sure that the door is pushing on that seal with the right amount of force. The next thing that they're going to do here is they're going to take a vacuum gun and they're going to actually, believe it or not, fill the seal with vacuum. It's a vacuum sealed hatch. The vacuum seal is a, it basically perches, it's, a, it's like a little rubber tube that kind of goes around the hatch and that actually pushes up against that metal seal. And that's why something as small as a human hair can actually cause, cause a leak. So right now, what they're going to do is they're going to evac that, that seal, and then they're going to they're do a leak check to make sure the door isn't leaking. If they pull vacuum out of that 
out of that seal and then it starts inflating again, you know there's a leak somewhere. And uh, as you can see there, there seems to be three ninjas uh, on their iPads they're scrolling through. Don't worry, they're not just scrolling through Twitter and getting bored. They're, they're going through checklists and, and procedures and such. Um, just and to make Dragon, sure they're doing everything seconds. right. We are commencing a health check for the launch escape system. Expect a momentary flight computer state change, followed by a transition back to pad hatch closed. SpaceX Dragon Tapping. So yeah, Ryan, you, you were saying they're not just scrolling around on social media right there. They're all working through the checklists. The other thing that you have to do to basically to basically make sure that everything stays right is you have to document every single step. If you notice, some of those guys have tablets and some of the other ones, some of the other pad ninjas have like a cell phone. And what they're doing is they're taking pictures and they're uploading those pictures back to SpaceX headquarters. So every single step gets documented with photo evidence. That type of stuff can be crucial with figuring out, it. you know, oh, this may have happened during the mission. Obviously, we got the crew back, but something went a little weird with this. Let's go check and make sure that the pictures were taken and everything was everything was done correct. Everything is basically tagged out on those checklists. They're constantly taking pictures of every single step just to be absolutely sure. I just want to point out really quick, they did mention that uh, they may see a state change because of a test of the launch escape system. Uh, the way that it works on Dragon is it's basically built right into the capsule. There's the Super Draco thrusters that, in the event that something goes wrong, will pull the capsule completely away from the booster. Uh, and there are actually different abort zones all the way through the entire launch that you'll hear them call out uh, as they ascend that... Mm -hmm. Worst comes to worst, there's crews there ready to pick them up after hopefully safely splashing down in the ocean via parachute. Now, Sawyer, the the uh, they have different abort modes, right? For different phases of the mission, they're different. They're di like mode one, mode one Alpha and one Bravo and one Charlie, right? Like that, right? Yeah, and a lot of that is also just based off of where they would be able to. So for shuttle, you would hear uh, for the transatlantic abort sites would be uh, runways in different cities like Zaragoza, Spain. Uh, yep. Whereas this is different parts of the ocean. They basically have giant imaginary circles in parts of the uh, eastern coast of the United States going all the way up towards Canada that are labeled as different abort sites. Yep. And of course, Dragon is using an integrated launch escape system. That integrated, that ILES is something that's built right into the capsule. It's not like, uh, not like its predecessors. Uh, well, the shuttle didn't have an escape system. We all know that. But uh, the Apollo capsule and, and the Mercury Dragon capsule SpaceX for post ingress briefing. Okay, post ingress briefing happen here. Go for Dragon. Okay, Jaws, we'll keep this one short. At this time, the Dragon team and F-9 teams are not tracking any issues, and you couldn't ask for better weather. I'll copy. Dragon copies, good to hear. There you go. Dragon is, uh, Dragon copies that uh, there's no issues with the booster, there's no issues with Dragon, and there's no issues with the weather. It's all looking good for a launch in just over two hours' time. Uh, but for the time being, I'm going to quickly uh, uh, thank Sawyer for joining us from the field for the last probably about an hour or so. I've lost track of time now. Uh, thanks, Sawyer, for hopping on. Uh, and uh, hopefully you get some, uh, some uh, uh, wonderful angles of the launch here in just about a couple of hours' time. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to be on and talk... Uh falcon 9 and crew dragon and uh yeah go crew 7 and in soy's place we're going to bring on uh probably the most knowledgeable person on the team about falcon 9 alex how you doing alex i'm doing super great really excited to see four more people going into space today buenos dias amigo <laughs> It's a slightly nicer time for you in Spain, I do have to admit. Uh, but uh, yeah, but uh, anyway, we'll for, just... for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> you haven't just got up. Uh, and uh, also, I've been going for about a couple of hours here, so I'm going to take a little bit of a uh, of a rest break here. And in my place, uh, Lon Seidman, welcome back. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm back in my uh, spot here, and I uh, want to thank uh, Sawyer um, for providing the bug spray. <laughs> He's got this great bug spray. It's called Sawyer. <laughs> actually got Sawyer on the can, but I don't think it's his. Um, but it's uh, so far working, and uh, we're, the mosquitoes are around, but they're not biting me just yet. But uh, yeah, you know, thank you, uh, Ryan, also for 
uh, guiding all of our viewers through the first couple of hours here. A lot has happened already, right? We've had the, the walkouts and uh, the drive outs on the Teslas, and now we have a sealed hatch. And um, what's uh, amazing about this is when you think about these folks, you know, we're in the fresh air just a few minutes ago, our crew of four, and once that hatch is sealed, they're not going to have fresh air for six months. It's, uh, it's quite a yep. transition there, isn't it? Um, uh, EJ, what, what, yeah, we talked about when they come back to Earth, what, it, you know, what they have to do just to get acclimated again. What does it feel like for the astronauts just to breathe the, the fresh air again? That's got to be something, isn't it? I, you know what? I've heard astronauts say that uh, the ISS and inside of the Dragon capsule is like hospital air. It, it's, you know, mm. just kind of cold. And I mean, it's not, it's good to breathe, obviously. But yeah, it's, I mean, it's right. not, I don't think it matches anything for being down here on terra firma, you know? I was on a bus ride with an astronaut once here at the Kennedy Space Center, and one of the astronauts said, the ISS kind of smells like a gym locker. I won't say which Oof. astronaut it was, but it does, I guess, get, you know, you've got people up there, you've got recycled air. It's probably, you know, a little well, uh, stinky after a while. Yeah, Lon, I mean, they, <laughs> fun fact, you know, he said it smells like a gym locker. They don't actually do laundry up there. It's, it takes up too much water. Water is a precious commodity on the ISS. It's not like you can go you know, down into the sink and just turn it on and have an unlimited supply and just pay more money because your water bill went up, right? It's a precious commodity. So they don't wash their clothes. The clothes are one time use and then they put it in a capsule that gets disposed of by being non-recoverable like Cygnus or Progress. Right. Uh, they also don't take showers up there. They have dry wipes. So right. yeah, I can, I can, <laughs> I can see the gym locker thing. Yeah. That sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds about right. And, uh, Alex, you know, we're, we're, we've got the, the hatch sealed now. I see the ninjas are, are gathering. I'm assuming they're mm -hmm. waiting for their elevator ride back down to the, to the lower level there. Does fueling start after the ninjas clear the, the, the pad area? Yeah, so right now they are sort of doing those checks of the seal on the hatch between, you know, the, the outside and inside of the Dragon capsule. It's going to take a while. It usually takes about 10, 15 minutes uh, normally for these things to happen. Once they confirm that the hatch is sealed and you know they have a good seal there on, on the on Dragon, they can exit the the pad area. Right around T minus one hour, that's when things gonna get start very very interesting because that's when they start with a go no go poles uh, both uh, at Hawthorne at the Mission Control Center there. Uh, they're also gonna be doing go no go poles at the Launch Control Center at the Kennedy Space Center. And they're also going to be pulling the crew uh, ahead of that propeller load start, which will, which will begin around T minus 35 minutes as usual. Now, the difference, though, is that here we have a crew access arm and a launch escape system that needs to be armed. So those are the few things that they also need to do between the go-no-go no go pull ends and that propeller load starts. So that's sort of the outlook here for the next hour, hour and a half. But for now, they are there on that hatch uh, leak check. Right, and that'll take a little bit longer. And you know, obviously flying humans, we were talking about this a little bit earlier, flying humans is very different than flying a, a stack mm -hmm. of uh, Starlink satellites that at this point yep. are going up like every week now, right? Um, so it, NASA has a lot of involvement in, in these decisions that obviously they wouldn't have with any other SpaceX mission that's not NASA related. So what, what about human spaceflight is, is different for, for SpaceX that they obviously takes more time for prep? Ooh, they, they have a, they have a ton of checks on multiple systems on a ton of different um, different parts of the vehicle both the rocket and the capsule um, you see for example for these crew missions they execute a static fire which is a rare thing these days for for Falcon 9 it is not a normal thing for for them to do nowadays and yeah it's it like they, they Basically, double sure, like double check, triple check everything, and make sure that it is everything safe for the trip to space for these astronauts. Because this is not like a Starlink mission or any sort of you know satellite mission. These are people Dragon, that you're putting SpaceX, on the rocket. Nominal side hatch leak check. SpaceX Dragon copies nominal side hatch leak check. That sounds like good news, EJ. Yep. Uh, it just reported a nominal leak check. Sounds good. So we are continuing the, the uh, countdown here, and that's always a good sign. And this is uh, an instantaneous window, so there's no margin for being a minute or two late here, right? 
Nope. Yep. No. Nope. That's yeah, no, inclined I... orbit. Yeah. So you've got to be on time here. So it looks like everything is uh, going mm. well. And and and, I, and Alex, I, I would imagine they probably build some margin into this time budget, right? Yeah, that's that's why we see these things. Uh, for example, the NASA schedule that they gave out uh, had the hatch closure leaks checks to begin around T minus one hour and fifty minutes. They are already done by now. So that's that's sort of how it goes. They leave a lot of margin in the schedule to be able to complete these things on time. Because you know, in about an hour, that thing needs to be cleared for the propellant load to start. So yeah. Yeah, and I, I think about like Scotty on Star Trek, who would often you know need needed like two weeks to do something and then do it in do it in an hour, right? <laughs> so your <laughs> the margin is margin's a good thing, and it's always good to have reasonable expectations. So hey, I want to have some uh, thank yous here. We have uh, some folks uh, who have given some support to us over the last couple of minutes here. Warren with a store message, uh, who says best of luck and Godspeed to the crew, and we also have a super chat from Ronald Kame, and he's says, I would hate to have the responsibility of making sure the hatch is secured. But uh, in looking at how many people are making sure that hatch is secured, it looks like the responsibility is not on one person, is it, EJ? No, no, you have a team of people. There's, there's always double redundant logging of the steps. I was talking earlier about how some people are taking pictures of it, some people are doing photo fetch, and some people are following the checklist. There's there's two people doing each of those tasks. You, I mean, if, if we get an inside shot here of the um, of the white room, you, you could see that there's multiple people just scrolling around. I mean, one of them might be playing Galaga or something. We don't know, but I'm pretty sure they're scrolling through the checklists. But there's always t there's always double redundant positions. Just to be absolutely you sure, you don't you don't want to mess that one up. Absolutely not. And actually, none of these these things, Alex, right, especially on a crewed mission, you, you want to mess up. Um, what, what are some of the other things that they're probably doing right now in addition to getting those leaks checked secured? What, what else is happening with the vehicle? Well, um, right now, I'm mostly sure that they're probably checking the, especially the rocket systems and the vehicle systems, the computers, all of the propulsion systems. Because the Dragon right now, you see it there, while the rocket is not fully fueled, the Dragon is fully fueled. This is sort of like... Uh, a thing that is normally not talked uh, a lot, that the spacecraft is already fueled weeks in advance because uh, it uses a storable propellants. And so those things, they usually have like valves that they need to, you know, to loop, to cycle through and make sure that they work uh, ahead, of, ahead of flight and everything. Just so that, you know, you don't have any sort of issue once the, the Dragon is actually up there and... and have to use those valves uh, for the Dragon. Uh, for excuse me, for the Falcon Nine, they also have a few checks coming up here around the T minus one hour and thirty minutes with the engines. They do what is called a fuel engine bleed in. That is when they flow a little bit of uh, kerosene through the engines to make sure that the fuel inlet valves all cooperate and basically work for the when have when they have to flow uh, the kerosene through the engine. Because for Marilyn, unlike, for example, Raptor, uh, it only uses one cryogenic propellant. It is only the liquid oxygen. So when they do the, the engine chill, they, al they already flow liquid oxygen through the engine. But they don't have any chance to really test the flow of kerosene through the engine. And so this is the time when they actually take that time to do that engine bleed in of kerosene into the engines. So they make sure that those work well ahead of time basically pumping the gas a little bit before they mm -hmm. ignite the engines, huh? You gotta prime it. And we have, what's that? Yeah, you gotta prime, you gotta prime that pump, exactly. Prime hey, we have a like new a lawnmower. Uh, that's right, <laughs> pull that, pull that cord. I, I, had, I had a mower that uh, was very uncooperative and no matter how much you primed it, it never turned, turned over. So, hey, I wanna thank a new launch director member, may, maybe somebody I told to watch the stream tonight and that is uh, Matt Reese. So thank you for joining us. I know he's been a longtime fan of NSF, so thanks for tuning in and sticking around with us as we approach the almost 2 a.m. mark. We're, we're getting there, and uh, you know, hosting really gets me going here, especially when I'm looking at rockets. So we're, we're definitely uh, getting our way closer to the, was it 3.27 a.m. is when uh, the Falcon 9 will lift off the pad? Alex? Yep. yep, 3.27 and 27 seconds. That is really nice for them to, to have that. A.m. Eastern Time, uh, 7.27.27 UTC. So we still have plenty of time for everyone watching to uh, let a friend or two know that we are uh, covering this mission with some experts that 
uh, know a lot about this. And I think both of our experts on the, on the uh, commentary today could probably build one of these rockets at this point if they had a couple billion dollars laying around. And uh, I know I learn a lot every time I do one of these streams and the dedication of everybody on this team is just awesome. So thank you all for supporting the efforts here as we uh, continue our early morning watch of this launch. Hey, we have some questions also in the chat. And if you want to just at NASA space flight us in the chat, that'll pop up in our, in our question queue. And uh, this might be a good question for um, EJ about, let me pull it up on screen here for everybody. Uh, this is about the families of the crew. Do they get special transportation to a viewing site to watch the launch? I know in my past experiences here, NASA is very protective of the families, right? So yep. what do they, how do they experience a launch? Well, Lon, just behind the press site, so if you look 180, 180 degrees behind you from Launch Pad 39, look basically due west, there's Operation Support Building 2, or OSB2. That's where NASA VIPs and families of crew members watch it. There's a balcony on top of the building that has a perfect view of 39A and 39B. Um, we actually watch, watch them drive by OSB1 and OSB2, which are Operation Support Buildings for NASA's spaceflight program. So right now those buildings are supporting commercial crew and SLS. Uh, so yeah, they, they do, they watch from there. And, and of course they are out of, out of view of, of the press here because they are yep. given a lot of privacy for, um, for a whole host of reasons, but also just how, you know, I, I, I'm sure if I had a family member going up in a, in a rocket, I would like some privacy and not have the entire world watching um, my emotions at that point in time for sure. Hey, I've got right. another question here. Now we talked about this a little bit earlier um, in the uh, in the in the coverage tonight, but I, it's worth bringing back up again. Um, this is from uh, Stage Crew at School, who says, "I know the launch window is instantaneous, but why does it seem that all the crew launches are at night? And how come yesterday's was pretty much at the same time? But not quite, though. It was a half an hour. We're half an hour earlier now on the uh, window than we were last night. Alex, what's the reason behind this? It's not always at night, right? It's just a matter of where things are in, in orbit, right? Yeah, uh, real quick, I, I can say a little bit here what's going on uh, on the screen right now. They are removing oh, sure. the seal between the Cryoxis arm and Dragon, because right now they're, they're basically preparing it all for when they are outside of the pad and then they need to retract the, the Cryoxis arm. So they're getting it all nice and, and tidy there. So yeah, uh, regarding the question, the the reason it is at night is just because of orbital mechanics. Now uh, it is not pretty much the same time. If you uh, if if you look at the time that it was for yesterday, it was about uh, three fifty a.m. Whereas today it is three twenty-seven a.m. So I went back about twenty-three minutes, and it normally does uh, by about by about twenty-two to twenty-four minutes. It depends sort of like which day and you know again it all comes down to orbital mechanics how far back it goes but on average it's between 22 and 24 minutes back each day so the the reason why some of these crew launches are during the night there's a nice coincidence if you do the math if you take those sort of 23 minutes on average and you count six months that each of these crew missions occur right it turns out that if you have one crew mission at night the next one six months later, because of, you know, it goes back 23 minutes each day, it will be almost around the same time. It's not going to be exactly around the same time. It, it, shifts, it shifts basically a few, a few hours, but it's still during the night. If you had, you know, the launch previous to that during the night, because of mathematics, you do the math at the end of the day, and six months later, it's still during the night. So right. that's so just, pretty much it why just, it seems... That's Right. Yeah. That's the schedule they're on now. And it just happens to be that we're doing these crewed NASA missions every six months now. Right. And, and now and then SpaceX has been doing some commercial uh, commercial flights with crew uh, that happen mm. in the off months. Right. So so in, yep. when we hit the, those quarterly uh, changes, we might see some day launches. Right. Axiom 2, for example, was during the day, which happened mm -hmm. like it was May or so. It was about one month after Crew 6. And so by you know, after one month, it had already moved the, the, the time for launch that, you know, it was already during during the day. It was, you know, uh, oral mechanics, but sometimes it also comes down to just, you know, we have 24 hours in the day and things cycle if you count 23 minutes back every single day and you get to a daylight uh, time. 
And it is like clockwork because the, it's a very predictable event, right? The, the space station is moving pretty much at a steady speed all the time. So uh, yeah. you can definitely predict this. Hey, so I, yeah, I just wanted to give you all some, some impressions of what I'm seeing around here. You know, there's certainly a lot more people now at the press site than there were when I first arrived. It's not up to Artemis level of participation here, but I think it's also because it's almost 2 o'clock in the morning <laughs> and uh, not everybody wants to come out this late. But it's, uh, it's amazing when you come out here, and I'm sure both of you on, on the chat here can, uh, can offer some of your experiences too. You know, when you're three miles away from a rocket, it is a, just an amazing thing to observe in person. And one of the things, two things that really strike me here is that I don't think people watching at home can appreciate the scale of these rockets. You know, they, they, they look, you know, on screen like, like they're big, but until you're standing next to one or have the opportunity to get three miles from one, uh, it's a totally different experience, I think, and that's one of the reasons why I think anyone who has an opportunity to come out to see a launch should, no matter where you see it from, because it will, I think, give you a just a different perspective on what goes into spaceflight. We always, always see how hard spaceflight is, but the fact of the matter is nowadays we're, we're launching rockets into space several times a week. Um, I know how many times I'm called to uh, host a uh, live stream here on NSF about all these different rocket launches going off. So there's so many opportunities now to check it out. And I'm reminded just of this because uh, just about maybe 100 yards away from me are the NASA social group. And I was part of the NASA tweet up way back when. That's how I first got into this. And it's a great opportunity if, if you want to try to get close to a launch. Uh, just keep an eye on, on NASA social because they uh, bring people out here to the press site right where we're sitting as, as members of the media and you have a front row seat and you can get just uh, an amazing experience so much so that it changes a lot of people's lives i mean my whole online uh, media career began with that that tweet up and i know a number of others that i attended with uh, also had that experience uh, ej how many launches have you seen oh uh two shuttle launches uh, i don't know like three or four falcon missions i've seen an atlas go off bunch, uh, an antares go off yeah. And when you saw your I, first I launch, I lost what, track. What, yeah, you lose track after a while. What what was your first like your first impression of that of seeing that launch in person for the first time? The first launch, the first launch that I saw, I it was a shuttle mission in late 2006. I watched it off of my porch from my house in Florida when I lived down there, and you, mm -hmm. you know what? It, it's wild. It's like. I, you know, I would say it's out of this world, but I don't want to give a pun token. Sawyer, I know you're out there. But, um, <laughs> you know, I, I would say that everyone should go see one at some point, even if you don't like rockets. Dragon SpaceX, closeout team has departed the crew arm. Closeout team is away. SpaceX, Dragon Captain. So there go the ninjas, so I guess fueling is next, right? Well, arming the launch escape still system have, is... They still have a, a long ways to go, yeah. Yep. You right. gotta arm that there launch escape system because Fa nah, Falcon 9 uses a load and go system. Basically, it, when a rocket gets fueled down, and Alex, feel free to jump in when you need to. When a rocket gets fueled up, you're going through a lot of transient conditions. That's actually a really dangerous mm -hmm. time to be near the rocket. It's not. It's pretty safe, obviously, when it's not fueled. And believe it or not, it's pretty safe when it's fully fueled. It's the fueling process. So because they put crew on this thing. They're going to move that crew escape arm or the crew access arm back and they're going to arm the launch escape system. Now, Alex, what type of launch escape system are we talking about here? You said there's valves and it's pre fueled. What, what, do you know what propellants it uses? What does it use? Yeah, it uses um, monomethyl hydrazine uh, as the fuel and nitrogen tetroxide as the oxidizer. And so when they come together, they pretty much ignite in content. That's mm -hmm. what is called a hypergolic fuel, well, propellant in this case. And they use these eight super Dracos. They have like four pairs of, of Super Dracos around the capsule. And these Super Dracos, they need high pressure to operate. And so one of the things that they're going to do when they when they arm the, uh, the escape system, they arm those high pressure bottles that they have inside because the little Dracos that they use for on-orbit maneuvers, they are low pressure. They actually are like the, the relationship between the pressure and the thrust, uh, it's sort of more or less one-to-one. -one. And so... The higher the pressure, the higher the thrust, and so those super dracos are called super dracos because they are they produce more thrust, and so they need a higher pressure. So part of the activation of the launch escape system includes uh, activating the high pressure bottles that the Dragon capsule has on board to be able to, you know, rapidly pressurize the tanks 
to activate the, the escape system if it were to be needed. And that is like really, really fast. It's milliseconds that he can do that because it, 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 is, it is a really fast paced kind of thing. And it helps that it is hypergolic because you don't need any, any source of ignition for the, for the hypergolic propellants to, to come and, and ignite. Because it's just you know, basically as they come together, they, they burn up. And you still so, want to breathe in those hypergolics, though, right? Oof, yeah, no. you don't want that. Oh. So, uh, That's which some is, nasty stuff. <laughs> I, yeah, I actually ahead. have a question. You, you said there's like high pressure and low system. Do you, where are they getting the pressure from? Like, how are they pressurizing these tanks? Yeah, so inside, so the capsule has a, an inside pressure vessel, but right outside it, they have on the bottom of the, of the, of the capsule, they have uh, what is called the integrated service module. It is not the trunk. What I'm referring to is you see that wide cone. It is actually only the outside. On the inside, there's, it's, it's sort of like it tricks the eye. There's more stuff inside, and that's more, more stuff is on a pressurized section, which they call the integrated service module, where they have all of the tanks for the propellants, all of the tanks for, for pressurizing, Basically, they have all of the uh, life support systems, uh, everything that they can they can fit outside. They have it there as well. And one of them is precisely those COPVs, composite overwrap pressure vessels that hold the both the propellants and also the high pressure um, the, the high pressure helium that they use to pressurize those tanks because it's a pressure fed system. One of the things that I will mention though, those propellants are nasty, and this is sort of the reason why. This pad has an escape system, so the the crew themselves can escape using the launch escape system on the crew dragon. But also the pad has it, its own safety system. You know, if in the unlikely event that something goes wrong, that doesn't need the launch escape system, they can escape the pad via that that zip line that they have on the other side of the pad and basically get to safety. And one of the things that one think you know maybe need that and not the launch escape system could be precisely a failure of you know the the propellant systems or th or things like that and they need to get out really quickly yeah and alex how you know we, we can we can look at the, the escape system on on dragon in a couple different ways if you have a fueling problem on the pad it, it can basically launch that dragon to a height in which its parachutes can safely deploy and 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 keep the astronauts safe even from the pad Yep, they actually tested this back in May 2015. That was a long time ago. They tested in... I remember that one. It was really yeah. fun to watch, yeah. And it was actually... It, it underperformed a little bit. It was very early in, in Dragon's career, let's be honest. So a little bit of underperforming was probably understandable. Uh, but it had, like, one of the eight Super Dracos didn't perform fully, but still, it did its job. That That is the good thing of this kind of systems, like like having eight Super Dracos, Whereas if one doesn't totally do its job, it's okay. It's still, the whole system still does its job of keeping the, the people away from, from danger. And, you know, it, it, it performed well. And it also was tested again in flight in 2020. So that was, man, that was amazing in 2020 with the flight. Falcon 9 exploding. Yeah, that was, wow. that was amazing. <laughs> and and uh, Dots had a great camera And that's the only time. <laughs> yeah, that's the only right, time we want to see it being used. Yep. And this is not right. something either that the, that the astronauts would would engage themselves, right? This is an automated abort system. They well, do they, have. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. You, you were gonna say, right, EJ? <laughs> they have an oh crap handle just in case, but they yep. do have an automated flight <laughs> termination system. It's actually right between the pilot and the commander. If we see one of the dash cam shots, so to speak, on Dragon sooner rather than later here. It is a black T-grip handle that is right in the center below the center screen. That's the, that's the oh crap button or handle. You got pull it. that. And, a, and it's a physical handle and not some button you got to push on the screen. So you don't have to worry about a, a fat finger <laughs> kind of incident going yeah. on, right? And exactly. apparently, so, I think so that it doesn't get triggered uh, accidentally. It's not only just pull, but also twitch. Like you pull and then yep. rotate so that it's, it's sort of like a two-step system so that it's not triggered accidentally. Mm -hmm. The, and the we other have thing some to uh, know, more... Oh, good. Sorry, go ahead. Real quick. I just no, want to get this. The other thing, yep. Absolutely. The other thing that to note is that, guys, so 
you know, say somebody's floating around while the capsule's docked to the ISS and they may maybe hit the, the old crap handle. The, the system, the launch escape system on the capsule, after a certain phase during ascent, it does get inerted. Uh, it, they basically put it into a mode where it cannot be fired. They basically permanently disable it, and the only way you're going to re-enable the launch escape system after Dragon is on orbit is by having someone take apart the outside of the capsule and re-enable it. It, it has a... A, redund a, a mode built into it, basically inert the entire launch again. escape system. Yeah, exactly. You don't <laughs> need that. You don't need that right. accidentally going off. Yeah, be right. Bad. So, so it only works when you when you when it can work, and otherwise it will disable mm -hmm. itself. They'll well, make we have a call some... to uh, to save the yep. capsule uh, after. I think it's um, before Dragon separates. I think I, I'd have to. We'd have to go. I mean, we'll we'll see it in a second. You know, sooner rather than later. But anyway, keep going. Sorry, I just want to thank some uh, some supporters here. We have a 4.99 super chat from once it comes up on screen here from RS, and this is a good one actually. Who makes those Pad Ninja uniforms, and where can I get one? I have a feeling that RS is getting ready for Halloween here in October. So uh, I, I'm, I'm <laughs> guessing you can't just buy these these suits anywhere, but I'm, I'm suppose you could probably make one if you know somebody that's into uh, cosplay or something. Alex, any thoughts on on those suits where we can get one? I really don't. Don't know. Uh, it, it is a great question because they look interesting, the least. Um, I will probably yeah. not be on one of them uh, on a regular day, especially in Florida. But they look interesting. <laughs> they they look nice because you see all those suits normally are white, but these ones are customized to be black, basically to to be on brand with all black and white uh, right. aesthetics of Crew Dragon and, and Falcon Nine. I, my favorite ninja is the guy that jumps off the boat to uh, to grab dragon when it uh, splashes down. That's that's a uh, that's a very ninja move, and they do People it every time. People in chat so. say that we that we need to make those on the store, and I don't think Adrian is up to do that, but we can check it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will I will pass it along to the management. I think if there's demand out there, because clearly RS wants one, and it's almost Halloween. You know, you never know. We'll see what we can uh, what we can put together. Um, also, I want to thank. Uh, I'm gonna put it up here. Molly Miriams, who gifted twenty. Red Team memberships. Thank you very much for your support, and we appreciate it as we are uh, counting down the launch here of Cruise 7. We are literally all over the world following uh, this uh, event tonight, and I am uh, here with a number of my uh, new NSF colleagues uh, down here at Kennedy Space Center. We're, we've got our little table set up here, and we've got a beautiful view on the, of the turning basin. And one of the things I brought up earlier is just uh, how amazing it is to, to basically look in my field of view and, th and see three rockets vertical on the pad. I've got um, uh, a Starlink mission to my right <laughs> over at uh, the other <laughs> SpaceX pad, uh, pad 40, I believe. On pad 41, we've got uh, Atlas V with a top secret military surveillance uh, whatever in there. They can't tell me what's in there, but it's it's sta Shh. standing up and it's ready to go. You're not and supposed to say that, Lunch. I'm not supposed to say it. Oh, sorry. Just, just and then say it's got... L107. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then we have um, uh, over at the uh, at the pad we're looking at tonight, 39A. We have the uh, Falcon 9 with now four crew members, uh, all uh, sealed in to Dragon as they are going through going through the rest of their checks here. And uh, we are getting uh, getting closer here. We're, we're looking at what about an hour and a half right now. So we're certainly a lot yep. closer than we were when I got here four and a half hours ago. <laughs> so. Things are getting exciting here. You start to feel a vibe. You know, uh, Alex, I hadn't talked to you yet about um, your launch experiences in the past. It, it definitely, there's an energy, I think, that happens as you get closer to uh, the uh, T0 mark. Um, how many launches have you been able to see? I know it's hard for you to come over this way to see them. Well, in, in person, none, but uh, man, from oh, my chair here at my desk, <laughs> a lot of them, a lot of Falcon 9s, uh, other rockets as well, Atlas V, uh, all of the... Oh, all of the ones that we've covered, basically, <laughs> uh, and more, and more of them, <laughs> even before we, we start covering launches as well. But yeah, speaking of which, we're going to cover those all of those launches, right? Because the starting is tomorrow, Atlas V is next week, I think, on Tuesday, I believe. So yeah, we'll be here Tuesday, yeah. covering that. Yeah, so it's, it's just amazing. I, I remember coming down here when you know when, when the uh, shuttle program was winding down, and there was some, you know a lot of it, it was not, not a lot going on as right? so we were waiting for that transition to take place. But but now it's a whole different a whole different ball game. So um, hey, I have, I have a question here. I don't know if either one of you can handle this one um, from 
This is from Goyle in our chat queue, and you can uh, at NASA spaceflight us and have your question show up in our, our little control panel here. Uh, Goyle wants to know, uh, can the astronauts all understand each other, right? We've got uh, astronauts from four different space agencies aboard this craft. We have Russia, Japan, a uh, member from the ESA, and of course an, an American astronaut. Um, how can we um, talk to each other? What, what language do they speak? Do they have to learn each other's languages? EJ, I know that the, the astronauts that train in, uh, in Kazakhstan for the Soyuz missions have to learn Russian a little bit and vice versa. Um, but what about the other languages? So usually you learn the language uh, of the space agency that's operating the capsule. So if a NASA astronaut flies on Soyuz, Russian is a requirement. I don't, I mean, I, that's just, you don't want to fly on a spaceship and have a language barrier. That's a really bad idea. Simultaneously, the international astronauts, the Russian cosmonauts that fly on Dragon and that previously have flown on shuttle, they can speak English and they can speak Russian. Now, it's, you know, I've seen people talking about this in chat. It's an international space station. You need international crews. That's so important. The U.S. operational segment is connected to the ISS mission or flight control center in Houston. And the ROS side of the station, the Russian one, is, is connected to Star City uh, in Korolev, Russia. That's outside of Moscow. And ha I don't think I need to say why it would be bad if you didn't have any Russians up there and something went wrong with the ROS side. Or vice versa, if you had all cosmonauts up there, if something went wrong with the USOS side, not having somebody that's a native speaker to speak English or Russian to the respective mission controls could, yeah, that could be a little bit of a problem. That's why it's important for this International Space Station to have international crews, because you it's just safeguarding, just in case something goes wrong, you have a native speaker that can speak to either mission control. You always have to have an American or a Russian up there. That's, that's just, that's not like some crazy treaty or something. That's just being smart. Yeah, exactly, because then it, that comes down to flight safety, right? At the end of the day, everyone has to understand and communicate, especially if there's, if there's an emergency in orbit that you have to address. People need to know how to talk to each other. So uh, very well uh, said there. So, yeah, it's, it's uh, and, you know, I think what's been great about what we've seen in space over the last almost, almost 30 years uh, is how much international cooperation has gone into the, the station, and it's still orbiting, and it's still operational. And, in fact, we had modules... Uh, added just recently um, to the station to keep it keep it going, and and so it's uh, it, it it gives you a, I think something I think what excites a lot of us about spaceflight is just the fact that this is about the future of humanity, and it's about us working together for a better future for everybody here on planet Earth, and maybe someday we'll uh, we'll all be living on Mars. I know some people want to send me to Mars, so um, <laughs> I'm happy to uh, oblige at some point. I don't know what spaceship they're going to take me on, but uh, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, I'll tell you what, though. If I ever paid to go on one of these rockets, I'd want to keep that spacesuit. Or the flight suit, at least. <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, that'd be nice, paid, right? I mean, I can, I can understand, like, the NASA astronauts not keeping them because, you know, there's a whole host of, of, of policies and ethics and whatever. But, you know, if I'm paying a billion or so to go uh, visit the uh, station, I think I'd want to keep that suit as a silver near. If not, maybe just the helmet. Maybe that'll... <laughs> I could wear it around the house or something like that. So, hey... Um, we're, we're, we're looking at just about an hour and a half. It, it kind of gets slow at this point, Alex, right? Because there's things going on that we're not hearing or seeing, but th there's a lot happening, but things get really cooking once that fueling starts, right? Yeah, there's definitely a lot of things going on right now behind the scenes where they're checking all of the systems, doing a last check of everything before they go into that uh, go, no go poll. Uh, it's actually multiple go, no go polls that they do uh, both at you know, Hawthorne, they also do it at Johnson Space Center with the ISS uh, Mission Control Center. They also do that at the Launch Control Center there at the Kennedy Space Center. And that's a different thing for this mission because uh, up to basically uh, Axiom 2 back in, in May of this year, SpaceX had been using the, the Fire Room 4, I believe it is, it is called, yep. as the Launch Control Center for the crew missions out uh, at the Kennedy Space Center. But apparently, uh, from what they said last month during the sort of overview uh, press conference for this mission, is that this mission is going to use Hangar X at Roberts Road. So SpaceX has that hangar there at Roberts Road facility. And they do booster refurbishment, they do fair refurbishment for flights, and they also have office, office spaces, including Launch Control Center, 
not only for Falcon Knight, for regular Falcon 9 missions, but also for these crewed missions as well. So that's, I, I believe the first customer mission was Falcon Heavy Echo Star 24 last month, uh, but they have already been used for basically for, for a few Starlink missions prior to that. So they've been using that place probably for, for two months easily. And this is the first crew mission that they're going to be supporting from there. So a lot of changes that we won't really see, but but are definitely big for SpaceX then to change kind of mm -hmm. how they support this mission. And uh, Yeah, because one of the... Oh, I, so, so I was just going to quickly mention that one of the good things of... Well, good things of having that for them is that they can have on the same on the same building booster refurbishment, fan refurbishment, launch control. It is everything under the same roof. They can have a lot of things under the same roof, which, no. frankly, it cuts the cost on lots of things. Yeah. Alex, don't they also, haven't they started doing integration in there? They put second stages on first stages mm -hmm. and then tow them to the to the hips from there, right? Yep. We That's see wild, them uh, rolling those uh, by our cameras on the Space Coast Live. Nice. And yeah, they, they rolled the boosters already with a second stage integrated and just put it on the, on the transport stand and, you know, on the transport director and just put the fairing on top or the crew drone capsule and up it goes. Crazy. Also, hey, there was a super chat in there for 200 kroner. Christian, thank you very much. Really appreciate oh, yeah, it, put, buddy. Let me put that. Let me put that up on our, our screen here. Yeah, and, do uh, it, Christian, man. Yes, thank, <laughs> thank you for your uh, super chat. And uh, Christian is wishing Crew Seven a safe flight. It is a historic day for Danish aerospace. And uh, also, thank you to the NSF team for the amazing coverage. And I am always amazed. By, by what this team does. And again, I'm the new guy around here and it's, uh, I'm just, uh, I've, I've been just following Das around all weekend, just looking at everything he does and everything you all do. It's just, uh, it's great to be a part of it. And I'm uh, looking forward to supporting the team uh, any way I can here, especially tonight, even though I'm getting eaten alive by mosquitoes. Um, <laughs> Westby the third uh, gifted five te uh, red team memberships. Thank you very much for that. And also want to thank, uh, real quick, Musical Wolves, a regular here on the Super Chat. Uh, $1.99, can we get another crew member to NSF Live soon? So uh, we should talk, I guess we can have somebody talk about that. I don't know, any, anybody can grab that one about NSF Live? Alex? Uh, well, sometimes we do have, uh, I believe we have had astronauts before, uh, retired and uh, current astronauts. I do remember uh, uh, an Intrepid Museum show where we had, I think it was Jessica Watkins. On, on NSF Live, which was really cool. That's awesome. And one of the things that I found when you hang around the press site here is that the astronauts often just kind of walk around and sometimes they have some PR people with them, you know, uh, or PAOs, I should say, uh, who want to make sure that, or say, hey, you want to interview somebody. And so uh, when you're covering things here at the press site, um, you can sometimes get some really neat opportunities to interview some folks. So I'll be on the lookout on my next uh, shift change here to see if I can see who's crawling around inside there. Maybe we'll grab somebody quick and, and have a chat if we can find somebody to talk to. So um, EJ, I want to ask you this question. Sure. Um, and maybe Alex can also chime in on this. What do the astronauts feel inside as far as the vibrations and stuff? This comes from Basic Trio YT. And I remember when they had the first demo flight, there was some discussion about how different Dragon felt than Shuttle, of course, and even yep. different than Soyuz. What, what do they feel in a Dragon that's different? So, if you know. <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, on Dragon, actually, compared to the shuttle, it's a pretty dang smooth ride. And the, the reason is, well, what kind of engines you have. Dragon is actually pretty dang smooth. Liquid fuel engines, I mean, don't get me wrong, they are rocking and rolling the entire time. I mean, if you guys watch the, the NSF static fire, the Booster 9 static fire from yesterday morning, uh, when that thing went, the cameras were shaking all over the place. Liquid fuel engines do pack a punch, but comparatively to like the shuttle with its solid rocket boosters the solid rocket boosters from the people that i've talked to that is just a violent ride those srbs just kind of the nature of well it's has to do with like nozzle design and combustion chamber geometry etc cetera, etc cetera. i won't nerd out too much here that they, <laughs> they give off crazy resonant vibrations like it is it is a violent ride up if i mean you can Go search around and look uh, for the shuttle onboards. You see the astronauts are shaking around, and then when the SRBs separate, the three shuttle engines, it's a nice smooth ride. But don't mm -hmm. get me wrong. I mean, liquid fuel engines do. <laughs> they do rock the house, too, but not like those solid rocket boosters do. Yeah, one of the interesting things yeah. that the astronauts tell is that 
The first stage flight of Falcon 9 is very smooth, and that is actually with the MVAC engine where it gets rough, and apparently it's because it's closer to them, because obviously the nine engines on the first stage are like, what, 60 meters away from them? Whereas the MVAC is mm -hmm. maybe 10, 15 meters maybe at most. So it's very close, and it's 100 tons of thrust. Uh, and so it, it, it's basically huffing and puffing all the way to orbit. Those six minutes that, that last the, the over Beautiful insertion burn. And I, I'm, I'm guessing the gimbling they probably feel also, especially as they continue accelerating, right, Alex? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the Gs go up. I think the limit at uh, 3.5 Gs to keep yep. you know the crew mm -hmm. okay and, and everything is, you, know, you don't want more Gs than that. I mean, that's part, to, that's part of the human rating certification that NASA gives to vehicles. To get a human rating certification, you need to be able to fly a flight trajectory that doesn't liquefy the people on board. That probably is not wanted. Just, I mean, I'm just putting it out there. You probably don't want that. Yeah, being liquefied is not, not doesn't sound enjoyable. <laughs> no, I don't, and, and Alex, I don't want to do that. And how do you manage the G-forces? And I guess the, the, the engines have to dynamically throttle according to the G-load? Yeah, they, they throttle down the engine very, very slowly as it, as it gradually builds up. Because as you burn all of that propellant, obviously you have less and less mass. But you, if you keep the thrust equal, then your acceleration goes up, right? Mm -hmm. So you need to throttle down that engine a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, until you basically you know, match that 3.5 Gs of acceleration. And I got a question here from the chat. Again, you can uh, add your question to the question queue by hitting at NASA Spaceflight. And as things start to pick up here, we're going to have to be looking at uh, events taking place. So if we don't get to your chat right away, we will do our best to uh, get there before uh, liftoff here. But um, this next question I thought would be a good one. I'm not going to actually read the entire question because it has the S word in it. Um, but, but what happened uh, last night that prevented the launch? Um, and this is from Khalid uh, Zubi. And maybe, Alex, you can take that one. Yeah, so uh, from what NASA mentioned, they apparently had um, not an issue with this uh, life support system, but in general with like uh, the certification uh, and, and approval and basically checking off that the, the life support system was okay. Because uh, for th this was actually the, something that they had talked on the Flight Readiness Review press conference that they had seen on previous Dragons sometimes there were a few valves here and there that did not work properly. So they have been checking thoroughly all of the valves inside of Dragon, including those on the life support system. And so they were still, by yesterday, uh, they were conducting uh, on the morning, so basically the morning before of the launch, they were performing that launch readiness review, which occurs after about T minus 24 hours. And it, and it basically went for so long and they still were looking through all the analysis doing all those decisions, that paper were remaining. So they didn't have enough time to go and prepare for the launch yesterday. And so right now, today, everything is cool and good and all is approved. And hopefully in one hour, 60 minutes and 50 seconds, we're going to see that launch of Crew-7. And EJ, last night's events really speak to the fact that you, you don't want to have that, uh, the, the, was it the GO syndrome <laughs> that you said? Go, um, go fever. Good example. Go fever. That was a good example of, of just, hey, you know what? We, we can take a breather here. And do you have any more on what, what you think happened last night? Well, from SpaceX official, they needed to close out some paperwork with the environmental control systems. Um, I was actually refilling my water. So, Alex, if you just said oh, this, please let me know. <laughs> yeah, um, the, for the life support system. Yep. Yeah, they, they wanted to. I mean. Like I could sit here and say the checking this part on the life support system, but I, I think it's pretty self-explanatory that you want to make sure your astronauts can breathe when they're up in space. That's yeah. 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 You, you probably want that. Yeah. I'd say so. That's, that's a mission requirement. I would say. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We so should we, do that. That's a good idea. We are now approaching the hour and 15 minute to launch mark. And Alex, what can we expect happening in the next few minutes here? Yeah, so um, pretty much waiting for those go no go pulls to happen in about 15 minutes. It's going to take about uh, 10 minutes. I don't think we're going to hear those. Those are sort of electronic go no go pulls that they have. And they're going to be pulling all the people, again, Mission Control Center at, Houston, uh, at Hawthorne. Uh, 
the Johnson Space Center Mission Control Center for um, for the ISS. They're also going to be doing the Launch Control Center here at, at Roberts Road, at Hangar X, at the Kennedy Space Center. And then... In the ten minutes or so that it takes, then they're gonna get, they're gonna go to the crew and say, "Hey, you you ready to go? You know, go no go poll with the crew as well." They're gonna poll go. Uh, hopefully, right? Uh, that's that's obviously something that we already expect to happen. And around T minus forty five minutes, that's when they start the procedure to retract the the crew access arm. So in about thirty minutes, we'll see that retraction of the crew's crew access arm and arming of the launch escape system. And, oh, so, so right, so that, that they arm the launch escape system, the crew access arm is away, so at that point, the only way they can get out is to have Dragon actually leave the Falcon 9, once we get to that point. Say that and again, Lon? So, so once that crew access arm swings away, so, so right now, it's, you know, we, we certainly don't want to have anything happen here, but uh, right now they have, uh, basically if something were to go wrong right now, they could basically exit the spacecraft, walk down the crew access arm, take those uh, zip lines down the, the pad mm -hmm. and get to safety. Yeah. Um, but of course, following the crew access arm, uh, moving away from, from, from Dragon, the only way to uh, have a, a crew escape system would be for Dragon to actually ignite its escape engines and, and leave the Falcon 9, is that right? Yeah, it depends on the abort contingency. Like, it really depends on what's called a failure mode. It depends on what's going wrong. Like, even in some types mm -hmm. of failure modes, you know, you would take the elevators back down or take the stairs on the fixed service structure over the slide wire baskets. The slide, the slide wire baskets are there in case there's a fire at the bottom of the pad somewhere. So, I mean, you obviously don't want to go down that way and it's on fire, so you should get away from it, right? So that's when you take the slide wire basket. It depends on the abort. If they, But if there's an off-nominal thing during fueling, they're not going to be like, nope, we're done, bye! You know, like, it really depends on <laughs> right. on the, like, what's going on. Like, w what constitutes failure mode criteria to, to trigger the launch escape system. But, yeah, I mean, in most cases, they probably just rotate the crew arm back in and be like, yeah, you should probably get out of there. But... Yeah, it really depends on what it is. And I, I know in, in shuttle, those crew access arms could, could basically just go right back into position very, very quickly. Is that the same system here with the SpaceX crew arm? Yeah. 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 The, yep. Alex, go, go for it, dude. Yeah, we've, we've seen that, especially when they have had an abort during the count, not mentioning, you know, like an abort of launch abort, but an abort of the countdown itself, that it stops the clock and they have to, because they have had some issue, technical issue or something, and they need uh, to detank the, the rocket, right? Uh, that, that, will, that will be what we call uh, a scrub in the count. And so when that happens, they need to basically put back the the crew access arm after they have detanked the the complete rocket and then they exit and everything they open the hatch they exit blah blah, blah all of that and so when it does that it does pretty much quickly it, it's not really that slow it, it it goes out uh to the to the capsule relatively quickly it's also put into like a standby position they don't fully move that mm -hmm. thing all the way back exactly right. and it's you know like the, really the strong back of the of the te as well yep Yep, yep. And you know what else can get get to you really, really quickly? Do you know? What? It's the amazing merchandise that you can find in the <laughs> NSF store. And we have all sorts of cool stuff, including patches. Um, we have these, these beautiful metal prints that you can get of various uh, space-related things. And I, I keep putting this on my wife's iPad in the morning in, in the hopes that she might uh, purchase one of these things. Look at that beautiful uh, uh, streak of a rocket launch here. Um, so a lot of those, those space pictures that you admire uh, on the NSF forums and on uh, all of our other social media, you can own these and own them more than just printing them out on paper, actually having a metallic print of them. Um, and there's a lot of other things in store for you on the store. And as I said, they get to you quickly. You know, they, they don't have to go to space to uh, deliver this to you. It'll come by, uh, you know, whatever, whatever shipping makes the most sense for your particular mm -hmm. location. And this uh, also helps the team out immensely here because uh, this is, there's a lot that goes into this effort. So, all of your support would be necess is necessary to keep this all up and running. And one of the best parts about the merch store is that um, in supporting the channel, you also get uh, some cool stuff, space-related, of course, as part of the deal. So really neat uh, uh, store to check out on NSF. I believe it's nasaspaceflight.com, I think, is where you can find the store. Shop. So Shop.nasaspaceflight.com. 
shop.nasaspaceflight.com. And that okay, is Lon, a, be real. How long did you have that segue ready, teed up and ready to go? Be real. Well, I, I, I was listening for the right opportunity. So <laughs> I, I practiced. I practice these in my in my sleep. So I <laughs> know uh, no, you did good. That was fine. It was great. So it's it's a lot of fun there. So, and we are awaiting now some of the the uh, last uh, bits of checklist items so we can get this uh, rocket fueled. We are M1D uh, and nearing. The fuel bleed has started. There's the fuel bleed. Oh, like Alex the fuel saying. bleed. There you go. Yep. And this is what you were talking about earlier. In other words, that we're we're basically priming the engines here for ignition so that is uh, a good step that means that we are continuing uh, working our way towards that uh, liftoff time which has to happen right on schedule alex right we don't have a second to spare here right mm -hmm. yeah 3 27 27 a.m eastern time and i guess it's not so much about trying to catch up with the space station as it is just trying to be where it's going to be is that is that a, a simple way to explain it it's more about launching into the ISS's orbital plane. Mm -hmm. The ISS is 51 degrees inclined, Lon. So, like, if you drew a map of the ISS's orbit on, like, a 2D image of the globe, the equator would be a straight line. The ISS would be a mm -hmm. squiggly line. It would be going up and down and up and down. The point where it crosses right. the equator, if you made that an angle, that's it would be 51.6 degrees. That's called, in orbital mechanics, that's called orbital inclination. So how, is, how inclined is your orbit relative to the celestial body that you're orbiting around? Now, because the Earth is spinning, you know, there's a spinning, well, kind of horizontally, I guess. I mean, we do have an axial tilt, right? But the ISS is tilted relative to the equator. Florida only crosses through the ISS's orbital path every once in a while. That is why we're all up here super late at night. I mean, for Alex, it's super it's super early. That's why we're all up right. here late at night, because you have to wait until it crosses the orbital path. The ISS doesn't necessarily have to be overhead. That would be the most ideal launch window. When it flies right yeah. over and then you, you launch into the orbital plane, you could catch right up with it. But it's more about getting into the orbital plane. Why? Yeah. Why is that a big deal? It's because, well... <sighs> It's hard to take turns in space. <laughs> Anytime you kind of maneuver tangent to the prograde velocity that you're going, if you try to take a left-hand turn in space, well, in space, orbital velocity is about 17,500 miles an hour, about 28,000 kph. Trying to turn when you're going that fast doesn't work very well. So it's better to accelerate the vehicle into that orbital plane right off the bat. It's more about the inclination than anything. Because if they wait even a second longer or five seconds before, you're not going to have enough fuel to get there and be safe for the mission to come back down later. So yeah. lots of precision here. and it's, We need uh, to do a video about that. Yeah. We can talk about yeah, this I've, I've for days, it. man. <laughs> hey, we have some super chatters to thank here. I want to thank uh, Man on Mars. Shout out to Master Sergeant Chewy of the United States Marine Corps on an incredible 24-year career. We appreciate you and everything you have done. Thank you very much for your support, Mans on Mars. And we also want to thank uh, the Sergeant for, five minutes. for for his service. So thank you very much for that. And we have a $10 super chat from Amber. I have another request for the management um, to add uh, pins to the shop. And thank you all for all you do. So thank you, Amber, for your support. And uh, I, will, uh, I will run this up the chain for you and see what we can do. Uh, to add more awesome items to shop.nasaspaceflight.com. So there you go. Great uh, supporters there. Thank you very much, everybody, for your support as we uh, sit out here late at night, although we're almost at an hour here, so it's great. I, I rolled in around this, the six-hour mark, and I said, boy, it's going to be a long night. And then, uh, you know, I sat down here and started talking to everybody, and it goes quick. So it's always fun to uh, have uh, some, some smart conversation around what we're we're looking at here. Anything different on this launch, Alex? Well, um, I, I'm not sure if there's anything different in that sense. Because I think you had said earlier you may, may, you may know something new, or something new was yeah, put the, here. Yeah, the launch, the launch control center, uh, it is oh, different that was a, that was for this point. time around. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right, because there was a, a launch control center that, um, as you saw, said, was in Cape Canaveral. And it was funny, I first visited that control center years and years ago when SpaceX was first getting started. At that time, it was just a launch center. And then I was yeah. there, over there today, and now it says launch and landing center. <laughs> so that's different. Yeah, um, that's the, the first one that they had. And then they got mm -hmm. uh, firing room four at the Kennedy Space Center. 
that was like a an old shuttle uh, launch control center that they had there, and they basically took it over and used it for these uh, dragon launches and also other other kinds of launches from LC thirty nine A. But now they have everything under the same roof, and so they have everything right now at Hangar X. I do believe they probably still use some of those launch control centers still like they are in that transition because they have many launches from the cape and sometimes they have like they, they may have one here and then there's another right there at slick 40 you, you can see mm -hmm. it from from you know in person right and so the, they basically can can support multiples of these launches at the same time with multiple launch centers Kind of like NSF here, we can support multiple launches at the same time. We're, we're, we're uh, very versatile. We're all over the place. And uh, yeah. I know uh, the whole team is working hard to, to, to support all of these. Hey, uh, EJ, you know, I'm curious too. I, you know, this is going to be a return to uh, landing site uh, okay. launch here, or yep. launch site, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, is, that, is that a usual occurrence for a space station mission? I seem to recall most of these ending up uh, on the drone ships. Well, I actually was talking to Alex about this before we started this stream up. This is the first crewed NASA mission that's going to do a return to launch site. Now, there has been crew land crew RTLS before, but not with NASA missions. That was during a commercial mission. Alex, that was Axiom 2, if I'm remembering right. Yeah. Yep. It was a cool shot of the of the return back. Uh, that was a daylight launch, though. Uh, this time around, it's going to be in darkness, but still exciting because it's like two Roman candles, uh, well, for the Falcon Heavy, it's two, but the, yeah. in this case, it's like one Roman candle like coming down from the from the air. It's it's super amazing. And this time, it is different because the entry burn is one engine and then the landing burn is one, three, one. And that means that they ignite the center engine, then two of the outer engines to slam on the brakes, sort of like really le last minute uh, slow down there on, on the booster uh, velocity, and then they shut down those two other engines and finish the landing with just a single center engine on Falcon 9, which is really cool. Because it, it looks like they're going to crash, and then suddenly it's like, one, three, one. And it, it slowly gets to the to the pad. The crazy thing about for... stepping on the brakes, Great. sorry, Lana, real quick, the crazy thing about yeah, stepping on the here. brakes like that, believe it or not, is that that is actually more efficient than doing a nice long landing mm -hmm. burn. The higher TWR you have when you're down in the atmosphere with your booster, the more delta V it's going to have. Very interesting. And yeah, because you don't have to, to. It is also fun to watch. Yeah, because you don't have to spend a lot of fuel on like going slowly, like is, is slowing down slowly. Basically, the acceleration is lower when you only have one engine. But if you have all three engines, it it it, it seems counterintuitive because you use more propellant, but the burn is shorter, so overall the propellant consumption is shorter as well. It, 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 it's more efficient. And what am I going to be able to see here, Alex? So I'm, I'm sitting here, it's dark out, right? Beautiful sky here, not a cloud to be seen. I see stars. I know when I watched Artemis lift off uh, earlier than now, <laughs> at two something in the morning, not three something in the morning, um, I could see quite a bit. I could see the SRB separations. I could, I could see a lot of, of of the mission kind of happening before my eyes. Uh, with this mission where I'm at, given the conditions, what do you think I'm gonna be able to see when, when uh, Falcon 9 lifts off and, and we have the uh, booster head back to the landing site? Well, hopefully you see a really, really clear uh, picture perfect launch. It should, he it should head out uh, northeast from the Cape and head out into basically hugging the, the, the east coast of the United States and that booster, it's probably going to perform the usual nebula, the Falcon Nebula, where the sort of the the exhaust from the MVAC engine and the exhaust from the boost back burn of the booster collide each other and create this beautiful spectacle in the sh in in the sky, where you know it's like fire meets fire, uh, kind of thing. It, it it is amazing. It's the Falcon Nebula, and hopefully, yeah, if, if you have clear skies, you can see the stars. You're going to have a really good show tonight. Or right, early morning, I guess. Yeah, so it's going to be worth the uh, the pain I will feel tomorrow as I <laughs> as I fly back <laughs> to my <laughs> to my home base here. So that's exciting. So I'm looking looking forward to it now. Hey, I've got another um, <clears throat> another merchandise request for the management here from Musical Wolves. Dollar ninety nine super chat. Um, Musical Wolves likes camping. How about an NSF sleeping bag? Well, I will pass that along. <laughs> you know, I, what I would think would be great out here would be some uh, NSF like you know those portable uh, hammocks you can get. You know, I could just be uh, watching the stars go by as we 
as we wait out the launch here. So that'd be kind of a cool thing too. So I'm going to get in a lot of trouble for all these ideas here. And I know uh, Crispy is uh, watching here <laughs> uh, on the chat with all my ideas that we uh, are taking from all of you. So keep them coming because you know what? If there's demand, we'll, uh, we'll see what we can do. Commencing orbit tank isolation valve cycle to equalize low flow pressure. Okay. All right. So what do we just hear there? So low flow sounds like slow feeling now. Um, I think Alex. I think it's really to the to the capsule. Yeah. Yep. Okay. But we are. We must be getting close to. So how long does it take to fuel this uh, this this whole spaceship here, Alex? Because we're we're about what an hour less than an hour now to uh, to the T zero mark. Uh, yeah. I'm guessing the fueling is pretty quick on this. Yeah, the, the fuel load will start at T minus 35 minutes. That's when the propellant load will start on Falcon 9. It is an automated launch countdown sequence. At that point, it, it runs pretty, pretty much all by computers. Um, they start loading both liquid oxygen and, and kerosene on the first stage and kerosene on the second stage. At about T minus 20 minutes, they start they, they basically stop the, the load of uh, kerosene on the second stage. It, it will have already wrapped up by then. We're going to see that famous T minus 20 minute vent as well as they chill down the propeller lines on the Stromback, yeah, the Dragon white structure deck. next. You are go for section five. Wind ready, report go for launch. Here we go. That's All right. one of the poles. Dragon copies, go for section five. Neat. And do we know so what yeah, section we're going to five see that, <laughs> Yeah, we're going to see first the kerosene for the second stage and then the liquid auction as well. Yeah, we're going to see all of that venting and everything. So no. just wait a Alex, little bit, you, few minutes. Yeah. yeah. You said that there's a 20 minute vent on the TE, but the whole loading takes 35 minutes. What, why, why would you have a 20 minute vent 35 minutes, 35 minutes in when they're already fill, flowing fuel and oxidizer? How, what, what's going on there? Yeah. So that is to chill down the liquid oxygen line onto the second stage because you have it right now at room temperature. And what will happen if you were to load uh, liquid oxygen at the full load that basically that, that you put through when you load the second stage is that you will basically have a, a really bad time. There will be a lot of liquid oxygen boiling off instantly and converting into, into gaseous oxygen at high pressure and everything. You will basically probably rupture your, your fuel lines. And so what you do is normally you cool down the, the lines previously with a little bit of liquid nitrogen. You flow just a little bit at low pressure, you let the line get cold enough for that liquid oxygen to flow later on. And they load that liquid, liquid oxygen at about T minus 16 minutes and 30 seconds. There you go. Right, so we're, we're, cool. That's on the we second are... stage though. The, the first stage gets the liquid oxygen at T minus 35 minutes. So they're tying, it sounds like they're trying to time it so first and second stage fill up at the exact same times right before you're ready to launch, right? Yeah, it is. It is a very, very carefully choreographed. Uh, Dragon, go for launch. All right, that's what we want to hear. Next copies. Crew seven go. is go for launch. Let's go. Let's go. Here All we right. go. The first of many goes. Let's hope. And and let me ask you too, as we're as we're waiting for fueling to begin here, um, Falcon Nine runs on kerosene essentially. Uh, as we saw with Artemis, they had a lot of struggle, struggles with fuel because it runs on liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. I'm guessing kerosene and liquid oxygen is a lot easier to work with? Yeah, it's a little bit more forgiving. Now, kerosene and liquid oxygen is a semi-cryogenic propellant. So basically, plain English way of saying that, your oxidizer is cold, your fuel is not. Because of that, it's very easy to work with, but there are some drawbacks. It's always a trade-off with engineering every single time. So with kerosene, you're gonna get a way more energetic reaction. Kerosene and liquid oxygen really like to blow up really, really well. They, like, they, they atomize really good and they combust really, really well. Uh, so with Carolox rockets, as you know, kerosene and liquid oxygen, with Carolox rockets, you usually get higher thrust. You get, you get a more energetic burn at the behest of efficiency. If you look at Falcon 9's engines, there's all this soot coming out. And if you see a reused mm -hmm. Falcon 9, well, that's not burn marks on the outside of the first stage. That's because it flew through its own exhaust. So it's not the most efficient thing, but you do gain a lot of power. That's why a lot of first stages on rockets, so like Atlas V and then going far back, um, uh, Saturn, Saturn V, you have Carolox first stages and then you have Hydrolox second stages. Now, 
Hydrogen is on countdown, propellant load, and launch go no pole. Oh. Go no go poles open at 55.80, procedure 1.160. Okay. Starting to prop load operation. Being open. Yep. Here you go. So with hydrogen, hydrogen is ultra efficient. It is about as efficient as you're going to get for a chemical propellant when you use liquid oxygen with it. Problem with hydrogen, it, it, this is a fully cryogenic propellant now. The problem with hydrogen is that, well, it leaks. It leaks very, very well. Why does it leak? Well, when you have hydrogen in its liquid state, it's pretty, it's pretty stable. I mean, you, you have to keep it at pressure and you have to keep it extremely cold. But the problem with hydrogen is that it exists as a liquid in maybe a nominal window of about 5 degrees Kelvin, which is not a lot. And that f 5 degrees Kelvin is, um, let's just say that's really, 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 really cold. So because you have such a small nominal window for hydrogen, it's very easy for hydrogen to turn to gas. Now, if it goes down to like near 0K, like I don't, you're probably not going to do that. <laughs> that. That gets into solid hydrogen, but that's, yeah, that's very unlikely. It, it's most likely going to heat up because 5 Kelvin is now it's almost nothing. That's almost the absent, complete absence of heat, right? So hydrogen likes to leak. If it turns to gas, if that, if it goes up even a little bit, 10 Kelvin, you have hydrogen gas. Hydrogen gas at a molecular level is extremely small. It's a very, 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 very tiny atom. And guess what? It goes through things. It'll leak. It goes through seals. It goes through pipes. And if you get gaseous hydrogen pooling, well... Yep, uh, that's what happened with Artemis over and over again. <laughs> yep. They, right. Well, it was the leak rates during fast fill on, on SLS. They, they couldn't get a nominal pressure in there to basically not have it, A, leak out either the core stage or leak out from the tail service mass carrier umbilical. But keep in mind, there are automated scavenging systems. Hydrogen is going to leak. You do not have a choice. It's going to leak. If you don't give it a way to go and then lead it to a purge flame, um, like on SLS, guess what? It's going to find a place to explode. It'll find a place to do it. If you don't give it a place to, to burn off, it'll do it itself. And then you get a Hindenburg. And that's not good. We do, that's <laughs> we not don't good. want that. So <laughs> right. with kerosene, you, you often you get more energy. There's more energy, but it's not very efficient. With hydrogen, it's ultra efficient, super efficient, about as efficient as you get. But it's really, 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 really hard to deal with. And, and so, therefore, the, the ease of, well, relative ease of, of kerosene here is probably why SpaceX opted for that. And briefly, uh, Alex, I know you, just, you just shared in our uh, chat here that, that the ISS is, is nearing Cape Canaveral right this minute, right? But we, we won't be able to see it here, given that we're in the middle of the night. Um, but uh, that's part of this, right? That, that, you, that the, the space station will be coming overhead around the same, or just after, or just before, I should say, the, or, sorry, let me start again. The space station will be going overhead. Uh, just before we launch here, and that's part of why we're, we're, we're launching at this, this late hour, right? Yeah, as EJ mentioned before, uh, these Dragon capsules, so basically when they launch to the ISS, they do not launch when the ISS is right overhead, but actually it's orbit. And so right now, the ISS is going near overhead, but not entirely. Its orbit mm -hmm. is still not in, in the right location either. They need to wait those 51 minutes and 45 seconds that are remaining to the launch to get that alignment correctly to launch into that plane. It's amazing how... how how much goes into those calculations and knock on wood how accurate they have been in uh, making all of these spacecraft on a very regular basis uh, cat, uh, match that orbit and uh, successfully uh, dock with the with the station overhead and you know, back to the fueling question um, you know one of the things I'm noticing here as I've been visiting uh, some various sites around the uh, Cape Canaveral area is that it seems like the whole industry is shifting away from kerosene and to methane to power their rockets, right? So the new Vulcan yep. rocket that uh, ULA is working on, methane, the uh, Starship, methane, and all, a few others are all methane, methane, methane. So what, why the shift, EJ? What, what's, what's the deal with methane? Why is everybody seeing this? Well, if we have a difficulty scale here for propellants with rockets to use, and kerosene is on the easier side, and hydrogen is on the harder side, Liquid methane and liquid oxygen is right in the center. It's not it's as efficient. Right. <laughs> it's yeah, exactly. It's it's not as efficient as hydrogen, but it's close. Methane is CH4. So you still have a lot of hydrogen, but you have a little bit of carbon to keep that hydrogen in line. So you don't have the problems that you have with hydrogen. 
but you also don't have the efficiency either. So now if you flip back over to kerosene, kerosene is a hydrocarbon, so it's HC, 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 and a long freaking chain of 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 um of atoms, right? Or mo molecules, excuse me. So over there, you're not going to get a fully complete burn. You're going to burn off some of it and some of that carbon soot and, how, you know, carbon emissions will come out the bottom and Falcon 9, when it's flying through its own exhaust cloud, when hopefully like what we see later with a landing, right? It's not really efficient, but it's super powerful. Methane represents basically right in the center. You get all the benefits of a fully cryogenic propellant and you get the energy of using a hydrocarbon, but it's not as hard to handle as hydrogen. That's that's a really important thing that it's funny because like, you know, we've had this explosion of the commercial launch industry, uh, not 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 actually that would be bad. We've had this crazy expansion, I should say, of the commercial mm -hmm. launch industry. Right. And right. it's you're starting to see industry metas change. So, mm -hmm. you know, you've had vehicles that have been around for a while, like Atlas five that have a Carolox first stage and a Hydrolox second stage with a Centaur. And e even that's going out in favor, like you said, of Vulcan. Now, it's important to understand that not everyone is using just methane. Not everybody's using just methyl oxygen. SpaceX uses methane in liquid oxygen. But, you know, Vulcan is going to use LNG. It's going to use liquid, nat liquefied natural gas and oxygen. That's a little bit different. Now, what's the difference between, you know, what's the difference between liquid methane and liquid natural gas? Well, it's the composition. LNG to... You can tweak liquefied natural gas. You can tweak it basically to, depending on what you're trying to do with a rocket motor. And what's the difference between LNG and methane? Well, LNG has butane and well, it has quality propane in it, boy. It has, <laughs> <laughs> it has propane in it too. And it's, it's a little bit of a mixture between butane, propane, and methane. That's what LNG is and that's the difference. And by using that propane or using putting the butane in there, you can, you can actually tweak the propellant to get exactly what you want in terms of efficiency or in terms of energy. So, and that, and there you go. So that's that's why we're looking at that as a as a, another fueling source for for rockets. And I guess if I play my cards right, get some liquid oxygen at my house, I could build one too with some <laughs> with some natural gas. So, um, hey, we got a bunch of super chats here. So let me uh, uh, acknowledge a few before things really start heating up here with the go no go poll, which we're expecting any minute now. Uh, I want to thank uh, first uh, Patrick Far Fargi, $5 Super Chat. Missed a motorcycle cruise with some friends on the tail of the dragon to be here tonight. Let's hope we got a good launch. Absolutely. And we have another Super Chat here from Andreas Christensen. Go Cruise 7. Go Andreas Morgan Mogensen, the first non-American pilot of a dragon from a very proud Dane. Thank you very much for your support. And we are uh, certainly proud, too, to be bringing this coverage to, to you all, all over the world. And although it's uh, 3 a.m. here, I think it's a little later <laughs> in the morning over there. So uh, hopefully you're all enjoying the coverage today and we appreciate your support greatly. And um, now I don't know about this one, everybody. I got I to gotta put this one up there because maybe one of you knows the answer. <clears throat> Justin Maters wants to know, are, are there rodents on the space station? And uh, Justin's wondering if there are uh, hamsters, I guess, on the space station. I hadn't heard if, if we have rodents up there, but is that the case? I know we've flown small animals to the station in the past. I don't know if any of you have the answer to that one. There are mousetronauts up there, yeah. I'm not sure about uh, hamsters, but there are mousetronauts okay. up there. You want to hear the weird part about that, Lon? They yes, brought I the mouses up. That They brought the mouses up into microgravity, and the, the mouses actually, or the meese, mouses, moose, moose? No, not mooses. But they, they actually learned to move around in zero-G. That's actually one of the oh, crazier really? things about it. You can go look no up this kidding. footage. It's on NASA. Yeah, the mouses learned to, you know, float around in space. At first, hmm. they were really confused, but then they figured it right. out. Crazy part about that, bees do the same thing. Bees can adapt to microgravity environments. That's actually an experiment that flew on the shuttle, well, a number of years ago now. But, yeah, they, they learned that the way bees, like, make nests, uh, make, like, a beehive in space is different. It actually ends up not being exactly hive-shaped because of gravity right so right. It, there are there are mouses up there absolutely and they use hmm. they use them for experiments but also the mouse mouse actually learn to move around just like a human would learn to adapt and move around uh, up on the iss really interesting stuff that is pretty amazing so i guess there are a lot of experiments going on up there and that's really what what the space station is 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 a yep. is a is an orbiting laboratory. That was the entire intention of it, to have a, a permanent place where you could, you could do long duration experiments 
unlike, you know, the shuttle was great, but you can only go up for a couple weeks at a time, if that. Um, so having something that is uh, constantly orbiting gives you the opportunity for a lot. And there's a lot of science going on up there. Uh, we have another super chat here. Uh, so thank you all for your support. We appreciate it as we are getting close to uh, an exciting period of, of the launch cycle here, which includes hopefully the launch itself. Uh, John Doctor uh, gave a $10 super chat. Just a quick thanks to you all. So thank you very much. I hope I, I did the y'all okay because I'm, I'm from New England. So, you know, we're not so good at saying y'all, but I <laughs> appreciate I your... Yeah, you, you can say y'all. There you go. So we appreciate your support and thank you very Lon. much as we... Yes? Wait a second. Lon. Try that again. Did you just try to say y'all and it was I, you all? Y'all? Y'all? Like, did you pronounce, I, I haven't spoken the entire stream, and that is I what was, I had to I turn on my microphone would get, for. This, this would get Doss speaking as if I had to do the y'all, so yes. <laughs> I heard you all, and I'm like, I don't think John said you all. I think you just said you all. How yeah, y'all doing? Trying. We're doing great. This is, a, this is an exciting night. How are you doing? Not too bad. I uh, got a notification on my phone. There was supposed to be a launch. I guess I should start paying attention, huh? Yeah, I think it's about time to uh, start getting ready because I think we're about 44 minutes away here. I, I know that we're expecting mm. the go, no-go poll any minute now. Um, so, yeah, we're going to have a lot happen in here in a pretty quick 45 minutes, I think. All right. Yeah. Good deal. I've, go I've been in the background. Go ahead. No, no, go, go, go ahead. Go ahead. No, as I was just saying, I've been in the background here listening to what y'all are uh, talking through. It's so good to hear so many different things that we can discuss while we wait. I know it's a long time. What do we do? Go live uh, four hours before the launch? And now we're down coming up on 40 minutes before the launch. But uh, I've just been listening in, uh, clicking together camera lenses upon camera lenses. Y'all have been seeing a camera I've been operating over here, but uh, I have not been talking. And just been listening in to y'all. Y'all are doing a great job tonight. Thanks, sir. I heard a couple of I heard a couple of y'alls there. Ah, a couple of y'alls. Y'all, <laughs> thank you. Lon. We can mute Lon, can't we? Like every time he tries to say that, can we like <laughs> like buzz him or something? I, I think we have <laughs> another uh, another pun token equivalent, so Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh no. No like what? A a, a y'all avoidance token or something? <laughs> a y'all correction? <laughs> something like that. You don't want this New England guy doing that. <laughs> Lon, I was, oh, was going to uh, say, just stick around DOS for a little while. I learned how to say y'all Go ahead, Dragon. Here we go. Uh, we didn't hear the poll for a prop load and launch readiness. We're just giving a call. Okay. Can you hey, sorry, Dragon. I just missed the last of your sentence there. Can you please repeat? Yeah, Attention uh, operators uh, on countdown. Polling is complete. The, the joint NASA and SpaceX teams have pulled go for LESR, propellant load, and launch. For all operators in MCCX and Hangar X, okay. both control rooms go into lockdown in T minus 45 minutes and will remain in that state until the launch cable system is disarmed. All operators are to remain at their console, maintain a stroke cockpit until MD confirms successful disarming the launch cable system following orbit insertion or propellant offload in the event of a scrub. For non-urgent, no-go conditions, brief the CE or LD, and they will approve aborting the countdown. For urgent issues affecting the safety of the operation, operators shall call hold, hold, hold on the countdown net. Launch control will abort the launch audio segments immediately and proceed into launch abort. At T minus 10 seconds, launch control will be hands off and relying on automated abort criteria for the remainder of the count. Operators advise the launch director whether structural breakup or fire is imminent or occurring per Dragon manual escape flight rules. Launch control at this time, you may proceed with arming the crew arm for movement. Copy, proceeding to arm, crew arm for movement. All right, so it looks like this is the time in which the crew arm will be begin moving away. Mm-hmm. Alex, this is a pretty critical moment now because this is when probably the riskiest crew access part arm of retraction the... started. Here we go. All right. Yeah, this is when it gets real and, you know, I, I'm already nervous. There we go. Crew-axis arm is retracting. Yeah. There it goes. CA retract, and you, you can see if they if they show the I guess onboard from the crew axis arm, you see why when they were retracting that curtain, why they were wearing harnesses. It's you know you retract that curtain, it's kind of a long way down. So when the pad ninjas were in there uh, an hour ago, we're pull, pulling back the curtain, right? For the crew axis arm retraction, it's that little kind of shroud that's around the uh, the end of the crew axis arm there. Yeah, they were wearing harnesses because, yep, that's a long way. That would that would. Yeah. 
it's a very yeah. long way. How, about how high is it uh, from, from there to the ground? Well, 60 meters, 65. I think yeah. to the top of the dragon is 65, so maybe 60. Yeah, about 220 feet. That's a long oh, good. way. I needed that calculation yep. there. Yeah, not only am I not good at yeah. my y'alls, I'm not good at my metric to, uh, to imperial conversions. <laughs> so so it, is a, it is a long way. Complete. There. there we go. CAA is right. in the standby position. Okay, so now... And Dragon, so Alex, you, you are out. go for Section 6, Closed Visors, and Arm Launch Escape System. Here we go. Okay, there we go. That's the arming. Got it. Dragon, Tappy's go for Section 6, Launch Escape System arming. So, what they're going to do now, arming the integrated launch escape system. As Alex was saying earlier, the ILES is using hypergolic propellants, nitrogen tetroxide and monomethyl hydrazine. The reason why you use these is because they're simple propellants. When they hit each other, they explode. So that affords you to make a less complicated rocket engine on the vehicle, which is already a complicated piece Dragon of equipment. Dragon visors closed, arming launch escape system. So what they're going to do now, there's a go for la arming Copy, launch escape go. system from, from the crew right there. What they're going to do now is they're going to open up helium tanks, helium COPVs on the vehicle. And those helium tanks are going to lead to the nitrogen tetroxide and monomethyl hydrazine tanks. Inside of these composite overwrap pressure vessels, there's a fuel bladder. And that's what the fuel and the oxidizer is inside. It's like an inflated balloon inside of the uh, inside of the, the pressure vessel, and the helium fills the gap between the balloon and the outside of the tank. And it basically, well, it squeezes it like a turkey baster. That's how they get their pressure, and that's going to pressurize the system that goes to the super dracos, which is in those four nacelles on the dragon up on the top. That that will indicate a good launch escape system prime when they get the helium to squeeze the fuel into the Super Dracos. And all, from there, if, a, if an abort does get triggered, you know, that would, we wouldn't want that. But if it does, all they got to right. do is open up the taps on the Super Dracos and psh! Yeah, Launch escape goes. system is verified <laughs> armed. There we go. All right. So now that it is armed, the fueling can begin. I'm just eager yep. for fueling here. I want to see that venting. <laughs> yeah. That should come up at about, in, in three minutes, they'll do the usual... Launch auto sequence has started call out, and that means the automated countdown sequence for loading the propellants will begin. And again, as I mentioned before, it's going to be first, uh, basically the first stage is going to be loaded both with liquid oxygen and kerosene. And the second stage is going to be loaded first only with kerosene, and at about T-20 minus minutes, that'll wrap up, and liquid oxygen load on the second stage will begin at T-60 minus minutes and 30 seconds. So that it's sort of how it goes. And we spoke earlier about the, the second stage and, and the G-forces, the astronauts experience. When SpaceX is doing a you know, cargo launch, um, are they as concerned about G-forces? And, and can they get more performance out of the vehicle because they don't have to think about those things? Um, well, it, it really depends on what experiments are moving up there. F-9 tanks uh, venting for prop load in 10 seconds. Expect loud venting. Okay. Right, expect loud venting. They're going to open up the... Uh, the the uh, ullage vents on Falcon 9 to prep for fueling. So, and, so they're, uh, and they're gonna and they're gonna hear that by the way inside inside of Dragon. So that's probably why they're giving yep. them that warning, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, Lon, what was your what was your question again? Sorry, that's a, I'm looking oh, I'm looking yep. at the picture and I'm looking for fueling. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, we, we were talking earlier about. I have these random questions that pop in my head as we as we talk about things. But we were talking earlier about how you know the 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 G forces on on the, the the second stage essentially are you know they try to limit it to about three and a half Gs give or take. Um, mm -hmm. So certainly there's um, uh, you know a yep. uh, uh, some throttling of the engine that has to take place, which of course impacts your performance. I'm guessing for some of these these non crewed missions that the the G forces are not as much of a concern, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I gotcha. Picked it up. So it really depends on the experiments that you're moving. Some experience, some experiments that they might run on the ISS in those rack canisters that I was telling you about, they might be sensitive to vibration. So trajectory is optimized around what's in it. I mean, obviously, if you're moving up, uh, you're moving up like some packages of water and some snacks, right? Maybe for Jeb Kerman, some snacks. You know, it. I don't think the food is gonna really care that it's being accelerated at you know right. that speed. But if you have right. like a sensitive, a piece of an experiment that has a, a sensitive sensor, sensitive sensor, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, well, yeah. sensitive <laughs> instrumentation on it. It's yeah, you, right. you really have to kind of optimize your trajectory around payload. 
every every rocket's trajectory is optimized around what it's launching. I mean, don't get me wrong. There are parameters with a rocket that, you know, your payload has to constrict to, but the payload is the primary mission. So you're kind of working around that. Got it. And, uh, you know, uh, Sawyer and our, 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 uh, our Sawyer uh, was reminding us also that during dress rehearsals, because we just heard that call out about the, uh, the venting that was taking place, um, they pipe in audio to simulate the noises that they're hearing now so that they can know not to, to panic, I guess, when, when they hear a, a loud venting sound. Propellant right. load has started. Here we go. There we go. Prop load began on time, Alex. It's right at 35 minutes. All right, and we've got a couple of super chats, and I'll, we'll be obviously uh, jumping in and out as we hear the call-outs from uh, Mission Control here, but I want to thank uh, Mans on Mars again. Um, he says, I fly a U-Haul, you all, to the space station. So, <laughs> you know, this, to some degree, there are some, some space U-Hauls that, <laughs> that bring cargo back and forth. Um, certainly the, uh, the Dragons being reusable, both in their crew and cargo form, uh, could, could probably pass for a, a uh, truck of some kind, a very expensive one. And we also have a new Pad Rat member, Richard Quirk. Thank you very much for your support. I think Mans was just trying to get you to say y'all again. Probably. I'm gonna. I, I'm sure there's a fine that will have to be paid to DOS directly after. <laughs> after the <laughs> season token. is over with. And maybe even Ian's token. token too. Exactly. Exactly. I used to be on my local Rotary Club. We would find each other for all sorts of things like that. So. Um, oh dear. So. So what's happening, uh, so Alex, what's happening now? We have, we, we have fuel going into the rocket. What fuels are, did both the liquid oxygen and the uh, kerosene go in simultaneously? Do they stagger the two? How does it go? Yeah, for the first stage right now, it is both. But for the second stage, it's only the kerosene. So you're going to see in about three or four minutes, uh, you're going to see condensation coming off from the booster. It's going to get frosty. And you're going to see all of these you know, venting around the, the tanks. It's actually not the rocket venting itself. It'll vent as it as it gets loaded, but it's most like the 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 humidity in the atmosphere, all of that water gets uh, frosty and, and condenses against the walls of the of the tank. And yeah, so you won't see that on the on the second stage just yet. You'll have to wait about another sixteen minutes or so until that happens. And yeah, we're pretty much just right now on the moment where it's like a really delicate moment because now it is when the Falcon 9 becomes active. It is right before the launch and it is also when they are loading propellants. That's a very active situation where you have highly explosive material, let's be honest, right? Mm -hmm. And yep. very being, being loaded very actively onto the vehicle and it is that... It, it, it is a very risky situation. That's why they arm the launch escape system. And when we talk about the uh, the, the venting and, and the condensation that we're about to see, certainly we're, we're in Florida, and I have a, a water bottle here next to me on the table that was in the refrigerator earlier, and it's uh, soaking wet. And I guess it's pretty similar to what we'll, we'll see on the outside of the rocket, right? Although it's be, it'll be freezing <laughs> due to the, the temperatures involved. Yeah, I mean, but it's the same. It's the same concept. You know, if, if it's a you know, nice warm day and you, you go into the fridge, you get a cold snack out of there, it starts sweating. It's the same idea. Only Falcon 9's a little bit colder. Don't lick it. it not, not good <laughs> stuff is going to happen. Don't do that. What if you double dog, Drink, dare, me, do, double dog dare me to I do mean, it? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. You want a Red Rider or not? <laughs> Look, I'm just going to say, if you're close enough to lick it, they're going to scrub the launch. So let's not do that. Oh, don't say yeah, that. Right. Oh, why'd you say that? Oh, you, nope, yep. that's not a thing. You you can't be there right now. <laughs> Years ago, um, back, uh, right, I think it was actually either uh, during the 130, SDS 134 or 135 launch, SpaceX um, was inviting members of the media into their facility uh, that they have over at Cape Canaveral, where there was a Falcon 9 um, horizontal uh, vertical, I'm sorry, horizontal. Um, it's getting late. <laughs> my my sense of space is is slowly uh, you know erasing itself. Um, but uh, they allow us to kind of crawl under it, and they said you can crawl under it. You can do whatever you want. Just don't Stage take pictures. Stage one cryo helium loading has started. And don't touch the flight hardware. So cryo helium, 
EJ, was that what you were referring to on the escape stage, or that's something else that they use helium for? No, that's the for Falcon 9. Yeah, exactly. The, the cryo helium is for Falcon 9. They, um, yeah. they use helium for tank ullage, Alex, right? It's for, it's, they use it for tank ullage. So basically yeah, getting the right Yeah, to pressurize the tanks. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the cryo helium here, uh, the reason why they call it cryo helium um, and not just helium, it's because it is actually helium at very cold temperatures. And it is the one being stored on the liquid oxygen tank on both stages. And so they have also COPVs, uh, composite over wrap pressure vessels, on the kerosene tank. But those store helium at um, an ambient pressure. And uh, excuse me, not ambient pressure, at ambient temperature. So mm -hmm. it is not at it is not cryo helium. That that's why they add that cryo uh, to the to the word because it it sort of differentiates between one type of helium and the other that they load onto the vehicle. Yeah, the important thing to understand is that helium can, it, it is really difficult to get helium to exist as a liquid. You can do it, but helium, mm. believe it or not, on the periodic table of elements is hydrogen's distant cousin. It is also very, very hard to keep and stay as a liquid before it just wants to turn back into a gas. So, I mean, helium is similar, similar, pro similar properties for like solidification and liquefaction. It, it's similar to hydrogen. They're distant cousins. Yeah, and one of the reasons why they have that cryohelium is because, especially for the first stage, uh, and they have it on, on inside of the liquid oxygen tank, is because it's very cold, and the colder that you load it, the more you can pack on the same volume, because it gets denser, right? And the, the good thing of that is that it is very useful for pressurization, mainly because the amount of, of gas that you need to load onto the, the tank to keep it pressurized, the, the tank is very, very, like, it's it's big it's enormous right so you need a lot of a lot of helium to be loaded and the less bottles that you use to keep that helium the better so if you load it cryo you load it uh, cold it is denser and so you need less bottles of those and so that's why they are inside of the liquid oxygen tank now they do have as i mentioned before some of those on the on the rp1 tank because sometimes you do need helium at ambient temperature, namely for the startup sequence of the Merlin engines, for example, you need to spin up the pumps and for, for relight for when the booster comes back, for example, or for the MVAC engine when it is up in space. And so it pretty much needs that uh, at ambient pr uh, temperatures so that it doesn't you know, do any, any, any sort of nasty stuff on, on your rocket. We don't want nasty stuff on our rocket at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Certainly yep. has on, on its way uh, to orbit here. And this is a, a new booster. Is there anything, um, obviously they don't have to go through all the refurbishment because this one hasn't flown yet before, Alex, but uh, what does a new booster mean for the Space, SpaceX's Falcon 9 program? Is there, is there uncertainties involved with new boosters or are they just as reliable as the, the flight proven models that they have? They actually, um, because these new boosters are basically built with all of the knowledge gained from the pr flight proven boosters, they pretty much take these new boosters already as if they were flight proven. They actually test them at McGregor uh, pretty thoroughly, so they pretty much run already of, uh, a lot of tests to make sure that they are okay. But for crew missions in particular, they really make sure that they are like, they, they don't take any chances, right? For a cargo mission, such as, you know, CRS. SpaceX, go for Dragon. Okay, Dragon, we wanted to give you an update. We saw a transient hit on one of a gas detector inside the crew arm. This is one of two sensors in the white room. The other sensor, however, did not register this detection. We took a look at the history of the sensor over the last day, as well as the flight history for all the sensors, and have not seen this transient condition before. Right now, teams are scrubbing their systems and camera views just to verify that all systems are nominal. At this time, we're proceeding with the count. Expect an update from us at around T minus 17 minutes. I'll copy. SpaceX, go for Dragon copies a hit, a transient hit on one of two sensors on the arm and that you're taking a look at it and we'll expect an update at T minus 17, one seven minutes. Good read back. So what was the concern there that we just heard, EJ? Um, they had has gas detection inside of this, the crew access arm. Hazardous gases are, well, it's, it's a good, 
The name's kind of self-explanatory. Okay, so um, and, and what kind of sensor was it? Yeah, here, listen. And Dragon, it was a detection of NTO. Yep. Hazardous gas. Alex, what is NTO? Stage yeah. two cryo So that's some of the hypergolic propellants from the launch escape system and Dragon's reaction control uh, systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have double redundant gauges inside of the crew axis arm, but one of them got a trace of NTO, which could potentially indicate a leak. Or it could be a result from the from Dragon pressurization. The mission director said he's going to look into it, basically. Yeah, and, uh, it, it could also be uh, a false alarm. That's why they checked the other sensor. And that's why sort of they they looked yep. into it. They have other measures to make sure that doesn't that is not a false positive or anything like it. So they're gonna give that update at ten minutes seventeen minutes. So hopefully everything will be okay by then. Yeah, I mean about you have double redundant sensors. Part of the thing is that you can't really verify if you know you're not there. You're not gonna have somebody in the crew access arm going, "Oh, is there NTL? Let me go sniff around for it." No. You, sometimes you have to verify that your telemetry is good, and they do that with two sensors. They, there's double redundancy mm. in in it. Yeah, because you don't want to be to be fooled, right? Exactly. Uh, a, a bad sensor can make you do really bad decisions. So you normally have multiple of them. Uh, normally, also independent, like they are not connected to the same uh, tree of of faults or anything like that. They're independent sensors and independent ways of identifying the same kind of issues uh, if, you know, if, if you have multiple things there, that is a very good thing to have. And that is precisely what they're doing here. And yeah, the, the I, I will say the correct thing to do. They're really I mean, professionals. You, yeah, exactly. You don't want to mess around when there's people on board. Mm -hmm. Don't don't even take the chance. But uh, it, Alex, if I heard that right, the MD is going to check it against prior uh, positives of N NTO traces from other missions. So mm. what they're basically doing with that is verifying if this has happened before. If it's happened before, you know, I mean, Alex, you said that with the new Falcon 9, they built it based off of all the stuff that they know. You have a lot of flight proven data here and a lot of past missions to uh, as a basically a gigantic knowledge base for how to operate Falcon 9. I'm, I'm pretty sure I heard the mission director say that they're going to check it against other crew missions to see if this has happened, which is the right move. That's the right, that's, that's the right thing to do. And as we wait here, they're still keeping the countdown clock going. The fuel is still going in. So we will uh, hopefully hope that it's just a bad sensor and we can keep on, on trucking here up into orbit in a few minutes. I do want to give a shout out. Uh, Chris B is with the NSF watching crowd at Rotary Riverside Park. He's got a lot of people there, which is awesome. Um, hey. so, so thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Hope I'm, I, I, We can't see or hear you, but I'm sure you're cheering right now. So thank you very much for... Uh, tuning in to the uh, NSF live stream, we did see a picture of it in the uh, in our chat room here of, uh, of inflatable projection screen and everything else. Looks like a lot of fun, and I bet you there's less mosquitoes there than there are out out here right now. So, um, so we are. Oh, he, Chris is not there, but uh, other people are. So good. There's a good crowd watching, and uh, we are appreciative of that. Well, we're waiting on the status of this sensor issue. And the gas they detected is really the gas you don't want to have anywhere near where people are going to be, right, Alex? Yeah. And on another note, we should be about 20, uh, uh, excuse me, two minutes and less than, basically less than, than two minutes from that uh, T minus 20 minute event, uh, which will signify the, the end of kerosene load on the second stage and the chill down of the liquid oxygen lines on the transport reactor. You can already see some of that venting from that line. Uh, that is sort of a pre-chill kind of thing that they do, and then they they start the chill down process in more like more, more higher f uh, flow. And you can see some again. You can see a little bit of venting from the strum back, that white structure next next to the rocket. That is the one that supplies propellants to the second stage. It is there to hold the the, the rocket vertical, like from horizontal to vertical. It also has a bunch of other communications lines to the to the spacecraft. Um, perch lines for the for the uh, for the first stage, but yeah, we we'll, we should see that vent in about twenty seconds or so usually, t minus twenty and twenty. 
All right, almost there. So we'll keep an eye on the pad right now. I bet you I could probably see it from where I'm sitting. Oh yeah, you can see, you'll, you'll see it. Yeah. I may need some glasses, but maybe it'll be big enough that I can. <laughs> that looks like it is right There's there. The there it goes. Event. Yep. 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 And I can confirm that I'm seeing it. Oh, thank you. Somebody just handed me some uh, binoculars here. And uh, yep, sure enough. It's got quite a cloud there, doesn't it? Yep. And that's, that's all of that humidity in the air this evening. Stage two, RP1 load the complete. There you go. Stage two, RP1 load is complete. So when that 20 minute, the 20 minute vent stops, they're going to start cryo loading on the second stage, right, Alex? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but before that, we should, we should hear that update at 10 minutes, 17 minutes from the launch director and see what happens with that, with that sensor that they saw um, on the crew access arm. Because he, he said that they were going to do an update at 10 minutes, 17 minutes. The look at auction load is at about 17 minutes before launch. So it's. First, it's going to come that update, and we'll see what happens. But so far, they are continuing that countdown. And one of the challenges in spaceflight is that, you know, you, you, you can think about all the different things that could go wrong, and then you have something like this happen that you may not have been prepared for. Obviously, they're going back in their records to see if they've seen something like this before. Uh, if they haven't, what do they do? Well, if this is behavior that hasn't been seen before, you might want to err on the side of the side of caution. Mm. Um, you don't know if this is a failure mode. You don't know if the capsule's leaking. You don't know if priming the launch escape system broke something. Uh, if it's if it's not previously seen behavior, you should probably be careful. Uh, one of the things that I try to teach people about Lon, and this is one of the most important things with rockets is to understand what you what 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 the vehicle is doing understand what it is and what it's supposed to do and i know that kind of sounds like well it's a rocket it's supposed to go up and it goes up into space ej like it, we know what it does well yeah but you can have potentially anomalous behavior that leads to failure modes and still get into space you don't want that you you have to understand what it's doing if you don't understand what it's doing and it goes into a mode that you're unfamiliar with that can create problems down the road you can create uh, failure mode and failure modes usually lead to a rapid unplanned disassembly. Now I would never want that to happen and nobody would ever want that to happen, but you know, the dominoes can start falling really quick if you're not careful. All right. Those are hard lessons that yeah. we've learned. And I think we're going to be hearing an update in just a couple of seconds here about that NTO sensor issue. Yeah. And then we we'll have be a better hearing idea. that soon. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny, I'm looking on, on the uh, camera angles here. So what I'm seeing is basically the, the vent is coming right at me. So I see a big cloudy, <laughs> big cloud on the pad uh, where I'm <laughs> uh, facing. But, but we'll wait and hear what, uh, yeah. what they want Normally to say. Yeah, normally they tend to err on the, on the side of caution if they see it's mm -hmm. something real that is actually there. And so we'll stand by and see what they, what they say. Alex, have you ever you follow these a lot of these missions? Have you ever heard this this issue come up before? And Dragon SpaceX, stand by for an update on the sensor. Teams are still discussing and looking for our path forward. Mm -hmm. So they're, it sounds, Alex, like they're really. They seem to be taking a little bit more time, apparently. Yeah. That's okay. They, you know, if they need to take their time. Mm -hmm. They can take it. Safety is, is the primary thing. Yeah, like I said, Absolutely. don't mess around. If, if it's mm -hmm. doing something that you don't understand, stop. Just stop. You can launch tomorrow. You can launch in a Start week. Start at stage two, lock there's, loading. There's no undo button if you screw up here. Now, so we just heard uh, stage two, locks loading. So that's the liquid oxygen going into the second stage. Yeah, and you should have seen already that T minus two minute event going out, uh, as mm -hmm. seen disappearing, and that is precisely yeah. that indication of the start of the liquid oxygen load. This is something that we also talk about. Uh, it's something that we already see, for example, at a starbase when we have these starbase uh, live streams, like we did uh, earlier today, or I guess yesterday for me. Um, we saw that you know that loading. It's very similar where you have those perch lines that that. Basically, you flow a little bit of liquid nitrogen through the through the pipes. You chill down the pipes. 
And when you don't see that vent, it's because something is going through the pipes, right? Because if you have the vent open, something is going out and not going into the vehicle, or, or rather, you know, either into the vehicle or out of the vehicle. They use the same lines to load and also drain the propellants. So if you see that vent, it's because that line is pretty much open to the air, and there's not going to be anything going to or from the vehicle if you see it stop that is when it's going to the vehicle and so that's the the kind of thing that we also see uh just to draw a little bit of connection because obviously they're rockets at the end of the day right and they are right. spacex rockets so it's a very similar procedure uh for starship as well all right we're still waiting for the results of their decision on the nto sensor issue and NTO, again, is the fuel that uh, powers the escape system on the Dragon spacecraft. It is highly toxic, and so you don't want any of that around the area where the crew might have to egress, right? So th this is really a concern about um, safety of the crew. Um, and I know when, when Dragon returns to Earth, they often do a, a sensor check, or they always do a sensor check of, for that same material, that same chemical, uh, before they allow the crew to exit, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do those sniffing tests, as they call it, colloquially, where they have mm -hmm. those sort of uh, detectors that they put around the, the, the capsule to be able to make sure to that the concentrations of these hazardous gases are low and they can safely approach and exit the capsule. So while we wait for the results of this uh, analysis on the sensor issue, uh, the countdown still continues, fueling is still continuing, and you know, they're going to continue th with moving forward, and, and you know, then they, they still have time to make the decision here. So there's, I'm sure there's a lot going on right now in mission control as they try to, or launch control as they try to figure out what to do about this issue. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you guys, but my, my heart's starting to beat fast here. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as we get close to, to the end. And you know, it's funny, you, you watch these over and over again, and it, it never gets old, does it? Yeah. Uh, I've, even to this day, Lon, I've, I can count the amount of Falcon 9 launches that I've missed with my hands, and they've mm -hmm. launched, what, 250 times? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, this never gets old for me. I, I, yeah. I love it every, every time. It's so freaking cool. And we're still just standing by, waiting for that uh, that call. And I would I can't even imagine what the crew is thinking right now because you know we're so close. They get word of the sensor issue, and I would imagine if I was sitting in that seat, like, come on, let's go, <laughs> give me the answer, because um, they're pretty much going to hear the answer the same time we do. Yep. Okay. Right now it's, I don't know, I don't know you guys, but I'm sort of in a, in a position where I really want to know what's going on with that, with that sensor, you know, gave that, that launch director giving the update mm -hmm. and clear things out. Boy, <laughs> my heart well, is racing right now. Well, I mean, Alex, let's think about it logically. If this is taking more than that 17 minute update, that I would say that strongly suggests that this is behavior that they have not seen before. What's likely going on at MCCX here is they're discussing what this is, why it's there, and how it got there. Now, we have an instantaneous launch window, so you do not have a lot and of time Dragon here. Physics. We are oh. still continuing to assess that sensor and Ooh. proceeding with the count. <laughs> okay. Hey. <laughs> Dragon copies continuing with the count while the seeds are fast. Jaws acknowledges uh, control there. Yep, and I could sense the tension in her, her voice there in her, her response. Um, and so, and, and really, I mean, they have not all the time in the world, but they certainly have a, a good portion of the remainder of this countdown to, to spend as much time as possible to decide whether this is a risk worth pursuing. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess it's not just SpaceX's decision, right? Does NASA have some say in, in this? I mean, this is obviously an issue that we haven't heard of before. Um, what happens? Who, who has the final say? I would imagine it's... They both have to, both NASA and SpaceX have to agree, or does SpaceX yeah. have kind of control over over this? Yeah, normally that... it is something that. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I can go then. Um, it is something that normally both have to agree on. Yep. 
Yep, you're reading my mind, dude. Yeah, it's... I mean, NASA's been briefed on the failure modes. This is what... I mean, Alex, you were talking about this earlier. This is what flight readiness reviews are. So, Lon, mm-hmm. like, before this, you have a FRR, uh, you know, a flight readiness review to make sure that, you know, that's what Na- all the people from NASA and all the people from SpaceX and the astronauts for the crew, they all come together and they discuss the issues. If anybody has any problems, you sit there and you discuss it until it's resolved. This is why we had a scrub yesterday, because they were still figuring out some stuff with the life support, Right. So during these launch operations, SpaceX is probably trying to sit there and figure out what's going on, but they are absolutely communicating with NASA. NASA is in on the loop. They absolutely are. Got it. And Dragon SpaceX, stand by for display configuration. Yeah, that is the normal T-minus 20. Right. Yeah, that that is a normal call out, uh, T-minus 10 minutes or thereabouts. They start configuring the, the displays for launch. Right, and that and that whole thing shifts right to to, to a launch position inside the dragon. Yeah, they, so they all of the displays inside, all of the information that is displayed <laughs> to the to the crew mm-hmm. changes to display all of the very informa- the, the very important information for that launch. So they are, they are aware of the status of the vehicle. And Alex, as we wait here for the, the call on the sensor, what, what risk is there if, the, if this gas is indeed there at a level that's concerning? Is it just I, mostly uh, for crew safety? I mean, all is crew safety, but I mean, is it, is it, yeah. is it crew safety from a health and, and safety standpoint if, if they have to walk back through that, that gantry? It is. It, it all comes down to, to whatever data they're seeing. I, I'm obviously not mm-hmm. an engineer, um, and I don't have the data in front of me either, mm-hmm. but right. it is difficult. Because you're also calling off a crew launch to an international space station, and so you need to make sure that you are seeing it's not something false, right? Because mm-hmm. then you call off the launch, you go back to the to the crew access arm, and then you don't see anything. You're like, yes, the sensor was was off, and you call off the launch, right? And mm-hmm. it poses a toll not only on the crew but also the launch control teams. And so while you also need to to make sure that you know ensure the crew the, the crew's safety you also have the crew uh you know being exposed to multiple attempts that plays down onto the sort of the stamina the 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 animosity of of the people both that support the launch and also the crew themselves and so at the end of the day the safety is important but you also need to make sure that you're not being fooled and that you make sure that things are actually correct because calling off a launch is not easy Trust right would verify Right, there's a lot of things that, that you know. Obviously, getting the crew off off of uh, Dragon and defuel, you know, defueling the, the spacecraft has its own set of risks, right? And you have to weigh which is which is riskier. So, well, we are going to continue to monitor the countdown here, and I do. Uh, we're going to get to some super chats after we get uh, past liftoff here because we've got a lot going on right now, and uh, we do see a bunch coming in. We appreciate your support, and we definitely will. Uh, be acknowledging everybody in a little bit here. We just want to keep an eye on this uh, sensor issue and hopefully uh, it will be an okay problem that they can push through. I'm, I'm, I'm always optimistic. Yes. So and what, the, the one, just, just once again, sorry, Lon, I just wanted to reiterate the mm-hmm. problem that they found guys is in that crew access arm. It's that gantry that they use to get into the capsule. There's a couple of sensors in there. Engine chill and one of started. The, there's the call for engine chill they are going through the count but one of the sensors inside of that crew access arm you can see it on the it's that thing with the the oval windows at the very top behind falcon 9 they detected gas that is a trace gas or what's called a has gas in in rocketry a hazardous gas stand by for final go but please confirm crew displays are configured for launch Okay, they detected it That's in the promising. crew access arm. Yeah. <laughs> and it crew displays are configured for launch. And that gas that they detected, one shouldn't be gas, two should be inside the rocket, and three should be a liquid inside of the rocket. If they got a Stage trace one, detection, one load is complete. Here we go. Okay, they're going right. through the count. If they yeah. found that as trace gas inside of the crew access arm, that that potentially means that there could be a leak of hypergolic propellants. And that's what SpaceX is trying to figure out, that that is not what's going on. Right. And you can't send somebody up there to do a, do a check with a handheld sensor or something. So you really have to rely on what you have in there to, to take that reading. And that's the problem. They have two sensors that are disagreeing with each other. 
Yep. And real quick, Lon, uh, I'm still here. I'm I'm watching the clock. Like I'm watching the clock, continuing to count like a hawk over here. Mm-hmm. But it, it's mm-hmm. two it's two really important things, right? One, if you have to get out of the rocket, you don't want to be exposed to that gas. But also, that is important. It's liquid. Um, that is very important to the operation of the rocket. So if there's some yep. system that may be leaking that isn't going to have the right pressure or the right flow, and that causes another system to not work as expected, uh, that would be very important as well. So uh, they're watching it. It happens a lot of the times where they have like multiple sensors that are watching for the same things, and one of them goes off and the other one doesn't, and they don't agree, and which one do you trust, and, and what do you do in that situation? We see that a lot. But yep. the fact that it was that NCO... Dragon is configured for terminal that, count and Dragon's on internal power. Oh, here we go. Falcon, I can immediately stop. Mr. Trump, back, recheck. I'm not going to talk over him. <laughs> I can immediately yeah. be quiet whenever I hear them do an update. But uh, anyways, it, it's an important, the, the specific thing that they detected, it's not like they said, oh, no, there's too much nitrogen here, right? Okay, nitrogen is a totally different animal. Um, I don't even know if they have nitrogen sensors. But anyways, <laughs> uh, the clock is still going. Four minutes, 30 seconds here at the Cape, Trying and we're standing by to see what the no. final call is right. going to be. It's and I'm going to... Uh, turn- Oh, sorry. So I'm going to turn the con. I'm going to turn. I'm sorry. I was going to turn the con over to uh, Ryan, who's going to take over hosting and calling the rest of the launch here. It's going to get pretty noisy around me. I've got a lot of folks uh, ready to see a launch, so we're going to pass the baton and uh, we'll continue coverage. Thanks, Lon. Thank nice. you, everybody. <laughs> Welcome back, Ryan. Real quick. Yeah. Hey, Ryan. How's it going? Go on, Das. Talk. And just, I, me talk? You need me to talk? I apologize for oh, the I thought you were going to talk. <laughs> I, I can talk some. Uh, that was me remembering to press record on my camera, which is why we had a small earthquake on the camera you're looking at right now. I am operating that camera from the press site. So clock is still counting. I see three minutes and 38 seconds, Ryan. We're going to listen in and hear what we get from this uh, update. Yeah, so... Fingers crossed we get that go from the launch director pretty soon. There's nothing on the timeline SpaceX has provided for the, uh, the next uh, just over a minute here. Um, Venting continues. What I, what, I was, what I was saying, Ryan, before you pop back in is that sometimes even though there's a failure mode in a scrub condition, they still do go through the count and then they just say nah at the last second just to get some data yeah. Page on. one lock flooding is complete. Uh, on you know on fueling operations, so I mean I don't know three three minutes out we'll see what happens. Mm-hmm. Just as, just ticked as, under three minutes here. Yep, as we heard, LOX loading's wrapped up. Uh, Dragon transition to internal power at T minus five minutes, but of course we are still waiting for word from the launch director uh, on that sensor. Dragon is in terminal count. Yeah, right. In terminal count. Go. Coming up on T minus two minutes and thirty seconds to go. Next should be stage two log load complete, and that will wrap up propellant load on the whole rocket. Right now, the booster is fully loaded. Just a few more seconds for the second stage to wrap up log load. We are keeping our eyes open for anything from the launch director over the countdown net as we approach 120 seconds till launch. I'm listening. I'm watching the clock uh, just get ready to pass two minutes here. Yep. It's very interesting that we haven't heard the explanation. Now oh, we've got these sensors. Here's what we're going to do. It's really interesting that we haven't heard that come over the net. It's possible it was communicated Stage and not two, actually uh, is complete. sent to us. I was going to say they may have done idle. it on a back channel. The vehicle's uh, continuing to uh, hiss and burp, shall I say, as venting continues. And locks load wraps up. Next up in Next a minute. Yeah, closeout has started. Expect live venting. Okay. To you vent. There you go. That's loud venting. So they're getting all the oxidizer that they use to fill up the second stage. They're getting it out of the fuel lines on the transporter erector because you don't want it there because it could set it on fire. Probably not a good idea. So that's what that vent is, everybody. They're just venting out, purging out the oxidizer to make sure that no reactive propellants are inside of the pad. And we're into terminal camp with Dragon. Here we go. 50 seconds to go. Ryan, we'll leave it with you. I'm going to mute my mic, yep. and I will see y'all after we get to zero here. 
Godspeed, Crew 7. Dragon, SpaceX. Good luck, everybody. Go for launch. We are go for launch with Dragon. 40 Dragon, seconds to go. Launch. And Dragon copies that we are go to launch at T minus 35 seconds. T minus 30 seconds. Twenty seconds to go, ladies and gents. T minus fifteen. T minus ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Engine full power and lift off. Go Falcon. Go Dragon. Go Crew Seven. Copy, one alpha cool, switching down range. Stage one propulsion is nominal. Power and telemetry. Stage one throttle down. Stage one, throttle up. One Copy, one Bravo. MVAC chill is underway. The vacuum Merlin on the second stage has started its chill down. Beautiful shot here from the Cape. You can really see the power of those nine Merlin engines on the first stage doing their job, sending Jasmine, Andreas, Satoshi and Constantine to the ISS. As, oh, just look at the plume expansion. Absolutely incredible. Stage one, throttle down. Main engine cut off. Here comes deploy. Stage separation confirmed. There we Copy, go. Copy, two alpha. CS one should be coming up. MVAC ignition. And here we go, ignition of the second stage from that onboard shot there. And just look at the boost back. It looks absolutely incredible. So this is the plume interaction between the second stage and the first as the first now set its target on landing zone one, boosting back towards the Cape. The second stage has its target set on the International Space Station as it sends Falcon Crew Dragon Nebula. Endurance. Falcon, yes, Falcon Nebula just looks absolutely beautiful with all of the propagand interactions above Florida in the night sky. boost back burn is uh, estimated to wrap up in about five seconds. For now though, we'll stick with the second stage as it continues its burn up to its parking orbit with Crew Dragon Endurance. Yeah, that's staging there. They called 2 Alpha, the abort mode contingency for a crewed flight. Uh, that happened Dragon right on Space time at staging. Trajectory nominal. And there you go, the net confirming that the trajectory <laughs> is nominal. And yeah, and we, shall hear, and we shall hear that call out normally coming up every one minute or so to confirm every minute that they are on, on track to get into the desired trajectory. Mm -hmm.
And here we go. This is from the ground. What a shot. From the, uh, this is from the VAB roof. In terms of the first stage, the uh, entry burn should start up at uh, about 26 uh, minutes and 21 seconds after T0. That should be coming up in just about 90 seconds time. Dragon SpaceX, trajectory nominal. See, another minute later, trajectory nominal. Hopefully we see, we hear that again in a minute. Acquisition of signal, Marina. They have AOS through the Bermuda ground tracking station. And in terms for the second stage, this burn is expected to continue up until T plus 8 minutes and 48 seconds. So we should be able to cover all of the first stage entry and landing before this uh, current burn from the second stage wraps up. Near the end really of the second. Really crew. Yep. Right Passing now the booster should be already... <laughs> Look at that. So I was saying towards the end of the towards second stage engine cutoff one, Seco one in this in this flight, you're gonna hear an abort contingency called Shannon. Dragon SpaceX, trajectory nominal. When they call mode Shannon, that means that it, in, the, in the event of an abort they can land near Shannon, Ireland, across the pond. Interburn should be imminently. So the entry here burn is my, my favorite part here. I don't know about you guys, but the entry burn is the best part for me because I, you know, oh, that was real, real fast. That was a real fast burn. A lot of plasma accumulation on those grid fins. Dragon SpaceX, trajectory nominal. Usually the entry burn is a little bit longer than that, Dragon fellas. Copy. But yeah. it could be just the, the RTLS trajectory with crew. It could be it may have not needed to fire that long. She's coming in very, very fast. Basically, dead center top of the screen, guys, is the landing site. It's those lights mm -hmm. that up at the, like, dead center top. That's where the landing zone is. And I believe we have ignition now. Okay. Stage two, FTS has saved. And there was the sonic boom. Wow. That thing came in real fast. That was impressive. Most impressive. Man. And it looks as if the booster has made it back to landing zone one. Just past eight minutes into flight, the second stage burn should be wrapping up in just a few seconds here, in about half a minute. Stage two in terminal guidance. We'll be close to orbital insertion and MVAC shutdown. Copy, Shannon. There's, there it is. There's the call for Shannon. Last part of the abort contingency corridor. MVAC shut down. Okay. There it is. And there we go. Second stage, engine is shutting down. In about three minutes time, Stick around because that dragon, dragon should be separating orbit insertion. Got from the second for, stage. For orbit insertion, dragon. there you go. Dragon copy, nominal orbital insertion. 
Dragon Space X launches the system disarmed. There's the LES disarm. Jasmine sounded okay, very happy to be in a nominal orbit. And uh, I believe that's our zero G indicator there. There it is. Uh, Constantine on the left is also very happy. Uh, I'm trying to figure out what that is. It kind of looks like a sloth kind of plushy Koala, thing. Koala, yeah, p possibly. I don't know. And, it's uh, facing uh, away from us. <laughs> handshakes all around from the crew there on board Crew Dragon Endurance. Um, <laughs> we're still trying to figure out what the zero G indicator is. Acquisition signal, New Finland. They got an AOS through New Finland. Should have a loss of signal through Bermuda here momentarily. So the right shot there is looking up the, the back end of Dragon. During separation, we'll be able to see it float away. Ryan, I think you're right. I think that's a sloth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look at that thing. That's so cool. It's just... <laughs> and down it goes again. There we go. Bouncing around. There's proof that the vehicle is now in zero... G, or that rather the crew is experiencing zero G. Cape stage two. So I, I mean to, mission control. Yeah, I don't mean to state the obvious here, but I think they got that NTO thing figured out. Pr pretty sure at this point. Yeah, would uh, they wouldn't have launched if there was a if there was a serious outstanding issue. <laughs> yeah, uh, that could have uh, uh, that could have <laughs> been that could have proved an issue. So. Yeah. yeah, it seems as if they got that figured out. And here's uh, Das's favourite view on, on a launch day. An empty pad with a strong back retracted and a Falcon 9 booster um, doing a point-to-point -point flight a, a few miles south and a second stage and crew Dragon currently in orbit. That's what we and, want uh, to see. Ryan, that's actually my camera. I pointed Dragon the camera confirmed. at the empty pad today. Except that's confirmed. Awesome. Crew 7, on behalf of the Falcon Endurance. team, I'd like to welcome you to orbit, and we hope you enjoyed the ride on Falcon 9. Space travel is really? difficult, even though you make it look easy, so thank you for trusting us to get you up there. It's not a bad way to spend a day in the office. Stand by for words from the launch director. Hello, Crew 7. This is launch director here on Countdown. On behalf of the entire SpaceX launch and recovery team, I'm honored to welcome Dragon's first ever all-international crew to orbit. Shisleva Puti, Gotor Iterashai. Godspeed, Crew 7. Cheers. SpaceX, uh, thanks for the ride. It was awesome. On behalf of Andy, Satoshi, Koshi, and I, we'd like to thank the multitude of people who brought us to this unique me. moment. We may have four crew members on board from four different nations, Denmark, Japan, Russia, and the USA, but we're a united team with a common mission. Uh, we hope the work we do serves to benefit our beautiful home planet and those on it. As you said, human spaceflight requires an unparalleled level of vigilance and rigor, and we thank all those who prepared not only us, but also this truly impressive spacecraft for flight. Finally, to our families, we carry the brave, greater burden of our choice to explore. Thank you. Go Crew 7. Awesome ride. It's just the way it Wonderful should be. Words, uh... Yeah, yep. absolutely wonderful words there from, uh, I believe that was Core, then the launch director, and then uh, uh, Commander Jasmine McBelly aboard yep. Dragon Endurance there on behalf of all of the crew. So there we go. It seems as if Crew Dragon Endurance is now very well on its way to the International Space Station. 
uh, docking is planned for uh, the 27th uh, at about uh, just after Dragon midday UTC. Call, nominal dehumidifier activation and service section Draco checkouts. Yeah, 1239 UTC. So we've got a little while to wait until docking. We won't be live throughout to docking, don't worry. Um, but yeah, everything seemed... But from launch to, to, to orbit insertion, that seemed like a pretty smooth ride, considering the, they were they were working an issue up until the final points of the count. Uh, I do have to say that the entry burn on the first stage seemed uh, a, a little bit shorter than we were expecting, but it made its way back to uh, landing zone one, and it is standing mm. upright. So the, the booster has done its job, even if it wasn't uh, what we were expecting. Perhaps that was just a, a, a few numbers that were in the wrong place from the, uh, uh, from the timeline end, uh, but, you know... Maybe we confirm that. Maybe we can't. Uh, but anyways, everything everything yeah. seems to have gone to plan. So I don't think th I don't think there should be any complaints here. I mean that that entry burn was very very quick. So this is I mean this is the first time we've seen a NASA crew RTLS. So they may have been trying a little bit of a different trajectory for propellant optimization or or something. I mean, well, but that entry burn was fast. Yeah, the tam the timeline that they have on their on their website said it was going to be an 11 second entry burn, which is already short compared to other entry burns. But this is an RTLS, and so it doesn't really go that fast through through entry, and so it doesn't need the entry burn to run for that long. I'm not sure if maybe the booster itself changed its own plans. Like, hey, I'm going already slow, and I can save a little bit more fuel. I'm not sure if there, that's in any of the logic of the computers or anything like it. But it definitely seems that regardless of, you know, whether it was long or short, the, the booster just landed, you know, normally on the landing pad as it was planned to, to do. So look, at the end of the day, things turn out to be great, right? So we'll see. Yeah. yeah. Alex, and... uh, I think I'm still here, right? Yeah, I'm still here. I can yeah. talk again, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, I, uh, I can hear you. No, I've I've tracked a lot of entry burns, and uh, you know it's it's always, especially at night, a dark sky. You can't see the rocket coming down, and you look for the flash in every entry burn I've ever pointed a camera at. You have time to get the camera on it, and then okay, there's the entry hmm. burn, right? This time it was almost just like a flash in the sky from my perspective. The time that I saw the flash, I couldn't even tilt the camera up to point at it, and I it was in my frame for a split yeah. second. Just the loss of signal there. Um, and then it, it went out. And I was surprised. I've, I've tracked more than one entry burns, and that was a very, very short entry burn. And then from there on out, I, I couldn't see anymore. In the dark sky like this, you just can't reacquire it. But uh, how did this uh, new experiment I was running look today? Looked great to me. Looked Which good, experiment was it? Uh, the camera, the tracking camera we were running. I'll yeah, have to go back and no, look. I'm, I'm not sure which was used at what time, but uh, one of those tracking shots should have been mine, I think. Oh? Well, let me put it to you like this. It seemed pretty seamless with the other tracking shots, so I think I think that's uh, a testament to its success. Hey, we'll see. I'll, I'll go back and uh, review the footage afterwards. We'll see if we don't have something we can toss out to the members who've joined the member program or something. Hey, awesome. Alex... I got a question. You were talking about timelines. Yes. They were calling the, the the mission timeline called for a nine second entry burn, right? Uh I will have to check it out. I think it was. They got AOS. I think it was eleven seconds. Let me look. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was. It was a short one. I mean, that thing was three set, three four seconds at best. I don't know if. Yeah, eleven. Like, like uh, yeah. Mm. The timeline they have on their website had uh, entry burn starts. At six minutes twenty-one seconds, I believe. Looking back, that's pretty much what happened. It started up around that time. The the uh, yeah, it was about twenty-one. Yeah, I see. Start up at around six twenty-four, and then it shuts down at six twenty-six. It was like two seconds. Whereas here, it has eleven seconds from six twenty-one to six thirty-two. Again, sometimes these times they're not entirely exact. It sometimes varies a little bit. Yeah, um, it was too short. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of plasma buildup on those grid fins, but I mean, mm -hmm. hey, it landed, so. I yeah, mean, maybe right now we're seeing. Right now, what we're seeing here is the opening of the nose cone on Dragon Endurance, because 
that's sort of one of the key things here as they, once they get into orbit, it's not yet done. They need to get to the International Space Station and to do that, they need to use the Draco thrusters. They have 12 thrusters on the, what is called the service module section, the bottom aft end of the of the capsule side of the of the spacecraft. But then on the forward end, they have four thrusters. They are called the bulkhead thrusters that they are used for the major maneuvers of Dragon. And so those are the important ones because you know those are the ones that, are, that move the, the Dragon from one orbit to the other. Those are the ones that are used for like those major maneuvers, like increase the up G, lower the per G, whatever you want to do, right? Mm -hmm. So without those and without the nose cone uh, being deployed, you don't have a way to get to the International Space Station. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. They do have a way to eject the Noscon, though. If it if it fails the latching mechanism or anything like that, they do have a way to eject it. So, they always have a fail-safe. Yep. Uh, actually, a note. Oh, go ahead. Good, Ryan. I was just going to say, we've just gone past 20 minutes into flight, and uh, Dragon is already just south of Shannon Island. Um <laughs> So if you, if you want to think about that in aviation terms, this is a, probably about a nine-hour flight being condensed down to 20 yeah. minutes if you fly on Crew Dragon. Meanwhile, oh, the wish. ISS has just gone past New Zealand and is now heading back up towards Mexico. So, um, yeah, Dragon launches uh, kind of... Uh, depending which way you look at it, Dragon either launches ahead or behind the space station, but it will spend the next day or so catching up um, to the space station uh, in order to make sure it's on the, the exact same inclination at the exact same point at the exact same time so it can then rendezvous and dock. Yep. I was actually going to say, Ari, the nose cone. I mean, the nose cone is covering up those bulkhead thrusters like you were saying, Alex, but actually, you, you know, the, the way they secure the nose cone is the... I mean, the nose cone's also covering the forward docking port, right? Mm -hmm. The way they actually secure that nose cone is the docking port actually latches to it, which I always thought was really cool. The docking port hooks will hook into the nose cone and keep the nose cone steady. They'll unhook. They'll uh, you know move the nose cone up, and then the docking port you know will eventually get up to the um, to the IDSS or the international docking adapters at the uh, one of them at the at the space station. But yeah, the the docking port's actually holding that nose cone in place, which I always thought that was really neat. And Dragon SpaceX, we saw a nominal nose cone opening, TCS, and forward bulkhead Draco checkouts. Additionally, at this time, there's approximately three minutes left in this current ground station pass, and you are welcome to introduce your zero-G indicator. <laughs> SpaceX, Dragon Cappy's all. I'll hand it over to Andy. Well, I'd like to introduce our zero-G indicator, which was selected by my three children, Emily, Frederick, and Jacob. Guten Tag, Emily, Frederick, and Jacob. Ja, elsker jer, og jeg glæder mig. Again, somehow. Children picked a three-toed sloth as our zero-g indicator. It's a three-toed sloth, not a two-toed sloth, and that's an important detail I'll get to later. Uh, they chose the sloth because it's one of their favorite animals. Uh, we were very fortunate on our last vacation to Costa Rica to see sloths in the wild, uh, especially one memorable occasion. One day we were at the beach when a sloth a very young sloth appeared in the trees above us and hung out um, the rest of the day with us. And it was a very special moment for us as a family. Additionally, sloth is also what my children like to call me with uh, strong encouragement from my wife. They say I'm always uh, the last to leave the house whenever we're going anywhere. Personally, I think it's with good reason. Uh, but they say I'm the slowest person alive. Uh, which is also why it's a three-toed sloth, not a two-toed sloth, because apparently that would be too fast for me. So, welcome to space, Sasha and the sloth. And Dragon, we appreciate the introduction to the or zero-g indicator and noting that that is uh, probably officially now the fastest sloth uh, ever. It, it, this is Satoshi. Uh, it's nice to be in space, and uh, I'm very glad to see happy faces. So, 
Yes, I'm very excited. First of all, a few words in Russian, then in English. Всем большое спасибо огромное в восхищении тем, как мы прокатились с этим в космосе. Невероятно. Полет в космос это результат действий скоординированных тысяч людей, которые работают в разных странах. Всем большое спасибо. Большое спасибо. Роскосмос, НАСА, ПИСА, Джекс, SpaceX. Моим друзьям и семье большое спасибо. Thank you very much for all your hard work. SpaceX, Roscosmos, NASA, ESA, JAXA, and all the partners involved in manned space flight. That's a proud example of how much we can achieve working together in harmony. Let's continue. Cool. Thanks a lot to everyone, to my family as well. Thanks. SpaceX copies all. Thank you for the kind words. And JAWS, when you, if you are ready to copy, I do have some upcoming words on the phase burn. Expect a loss of signal. Good, Hilly. Sex Dragon is ready to copy. Okay, wanted to give you an update that uh, we are going to be losing Tedris for voice comms for about 15, that's approximately one five minutes, which is going to include that upcoming phase burn per year displays. We do have a ground station pass during that burn prep, so you will actually be able to call us in the blind. However, you will be LOS during the burn. There's no concerns, but we'll pick you back up at 0819 Zulu, which will be right after the burn, and we'll confirm that burn performance. How copy? SpaceX Dragon copies all. We'll leave, lose you on Tedris uh, for the phase burn, but we can make calls via the ground station in the blind, and we'll catch you on the backside at 0819. Good readback. There you go. That was just uh, some very nice words from the crew, and then the, uh, I believe that was the core, just confirming uh, with uh, uh, Jasmine uh, the uh, specific details of a phase burn that's coming up with different uh, loss of signals and such. So, we're nearly half an hour into flight. That looked pretty good uh, from uh, my point of view, at least. It's very enjoyable to watch. I just want to quickly go through some of the different bits of support we've been getting. Uh, it's important to thank the people, but obviously we don't want to do it whilst there's a Crew Dragon launching. Molly, thanks very much for gifting Red Team memberships. Uh, uh, Holt Grapes, thanks for the uh, $5 super chat. And uh, Tracy, uh, very common name, thank you for gifting five Red Team memberships. And um, RC Horseman has also gifted five Red Team memberships. If you received any of them, make sure to thank them in chat. Um, because, you know, it, not only does it support us, but it also gives many different people who may not be able to afford a membership, it gives them access to the membership program, which is which is just, we, we love having all of our members, but and all of our viewers, of course. And uh, uh, Mercon, thanks uh, very much for the, uh, the uh, Canadian super chat there. And uh, China, thanks very much for the uh, $10 super chat. And uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Paternus. Uh, sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly, uh, for the uh, $2 Australian. So, um, Alex, I'll throw it to you uh, briefly. Um, oh. I look pretty good. <laughs> uh, when was the uh, docking scheduled for again? Yeah, it is a schedule for tomorrow at 8.39 a.m. Eastern Time, 12.39 Universal Coordinated Time. So, UTC, basically. So, I think that's about... Oh, boy. Now having to do the, the math, it's but yeah, it's more than twenty four hours. <laughs> it, it's complicated yes. to do the math at this time of day. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, agreed. I it's tried to, but a, it didn't came. Yeah, it's a lot longer than a soy speed run, just because of the way the orbits and the laws of physics work. But you know, it's not it's not like a um a, a um transatlantic voyage on a cruise liner. You know, it's not several days. It's just a approximately just over twenty four hours. So um yeah, and then fingers yeah. crossed we'll get a good dock to the ISS. I just want to go around and uh, thank some people. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks, Alex, for coming on. E uh, also, EJ, thank you for coming on. How did you find that? It was fun, man. You did a great job hosting. You and, and Lon. It's great. This is this is really fun, and I, I appreciate you, you having me here. It's a privilege to be on here, and uh, I do appreciate it. I had a great time. How about you? You good? 
I had a very wonderful time calling the launch. It was very fun to do. Also, I want to give a big thank you uh, to uh, Lon, who was hosting uh, for a little bit there, and also uh, reporting from the field. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Sawyer, who has been taking photos and reporting from the field. Uh, das, who's been reporting from the field and uh, operating a, um, a, a very zoomed-in tracking camera there as well. Uh, Kevin's also been helping out behind the scenes in the field. And um, I also want to... Uh, give a big shout out to Patrick who's been uh, uh, producing this stream for the last few hours or so uh, every bit of help that we get from the team is very much appreciated it all goes into helping make this stuff possible and it's more than just one person running the show I see often I see comments like uh, it just tends to thank the host but it's not just the hosts that make this happen we have people behind the scenes operating cameras pushing buttons making things work getting sending stuff to YouTube there's a whole team of people that help to produce all of this content and put it all together uh, so I just want to give a shout out to everyone who was helping with that and uh, and, and all of that on there as well and uh, hey. just before we wrap up this is a picture from Sawyer who I just uh, oh. who I just mentioned wow Sawyer out there, uh, one of the uh, photographers alongside Max Evans. Just a beautiful shot there from Sawyer. It just looks absolutely... Uh, the, 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 the. So in case you uh, are unsure, this is the... Uh, Alex, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe this is the plume interaction that we get when a Falcon first stage uh, boosts back and then the second mm -hmm. stage ignites. You can see them. Uh, you can see the propellants bouncing off each other and they just kind of reflect into this beautiful kind of nebula-looking formation here and it's just you get such pretty images and uh sawyer uh once again taking a marvelous image here uh of the second stage and uh boost back ignitions uh pushing against each other i'm sure that'll make its way onto a uh, onto twitter at some point uh, but of course uh, i'll also do a quick pimp for our memberships we get loads of uh, uh of our behind the scenes photos and send them to different member levels and things like that so if you want to see even more photos uh that's a that's an option for you as well We'll leave you with LC39A for now if you want to continue watching the uh, post-launch ops at the Kennedy Space Center. Space Coast Live is a great option, uh, but from myself and all of the team working this Crew 7 broadcast for NSF, thank you everybody for watching. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. And here we go. The chamber pressure looks good. Following up.